Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 5 of what if I was reincarnated in the One Piece world as a Skypean. Let the tale begin. Chapter 102 We should have been passive. The three world nobles soon reached Heaven's Gate. Today, only Gonfall was guarding the gate since the chief was busy. It took Gonfall a while to recognize them, but when he saw the marine fleet behind them, he didn't have any doubt left. This is a bad situation. That's what Gonfall thought the moment he recognized them. He has heard about the world nobles from Roger for the first time. After that, as Skypea became more open to the outside world and even got affiliated with the world government, he learned more and more about their heinous behaviors. He could guess the reason why they were here wasn't just sightseeing. However, he couldn't stop them based on just his assumption alone. Besides, he didn't have enough courage to stop them anyway. Big brother, look, he has wings. Should we make him a slave? The fat noble, Brasiado nudged the older sibling. These people. Gonfall became slightly enraged hearing them. Even though he is just a humble man, even he felt humiliated hearing they wanted to make him a slave. However, after hearing them, a thing was clear to him. This really is bad. Surprisingly, the world nobles didn't take Gonfall, and after talking with them for a while, Gonfall was forced to give them a free entry. At first, after witnessing Gonfall's wings, the world nobles wanted to collect him as a slave. But the older brother, Ainsworth stopped them from doing so, saying that there was no need for an old man when they can get better ones. As they left, Gonfall stared at their backs. After frowning for a few seconds, he quickly took out a tone dial and typed chief's number. Ring, ring, ring. But the call wasn't picked. The chief was too caught in the celebration. In frustration, he tried some more numbers, but none was picked up. He even tried Wiper's number, but even that was not picked. They probably are in a busy atmosphere and can't hear the dial ringing. Clinching the dial hard, Gonfall's eyes went dark. This is the type of frustration that he hadn't felt in a long time. Wait. As if Goss sent, he recalled Amon's number. It was a hopeless dream. Let's try it. Maybe Mother Luck is on our side. Thinking that maybe, just maybe today is the day he is returning, Gonfall quickly dialed the number. Ring, ring, ring. It ringed, so it was on the range. It kept ringing and was about to cut automatically. Kacha. Holy. It's picked up. At the last moment, the call was picked from the other side. Gonfall felt his adrenaline rise. With cold sweat falling down his head, Gonfall clenched the dial tighter. Hello? Amon? He asked, his voice full of excitement and nervousness. However, I'm not him. Sorry. You must be Gonfall. A woman's voice answered his call. This voice, no, please. I'm his assistant, Miss All Sunday. He left the dial with me since it's useless with him without any tower there. Gonfall felt betrayed, he felt tricked. He didn't face the need of contacting Amon in the past four years since he supposedly went to a place where the network can't reach. Gonfall controlled himself and decided to open his lips. Ha. Huh. Listen, Loss. This is an emergency. Just now, three celestial dragons passed through the gate. As Gonfall explained more, what words the celestial dragons used when they met him, especially when he talked about the ten marine ships, Robin went silent. Her expression froze. The seed of fear inside her, which had died a long time ago, chirped silently. No. While people were enjoying the busy atmosphere around her, Robin shook her head. She clenched her hand on her chest. As she started to contemplate, in her mind, she won't falter now, not when her most important person's home was in danger. Tell me more. World Noble, Bersiado POV. We were walking through the disgusting-looking giant trees. Actually, us three siblings were riding our slaves while the other guys were walking. Ugh, why is this place like this? Hey, someone cut these trees. I ordered the filthy vice admirals following us. Instantly, one of them jumped ahead and slashed forward. Slash? In an instant. Damn, ten giant trees fell down. Whoa, you are strong. You're Vice Admiral Kamal, right? Are you interested in being my slave? It seems Sister Bimrit is interested in him. She even knows his name. But why is she asking him for permission? If you want him, take him. Besides, why Vice Admiral? If she really wants it, go after an Admiral. Speaking of which, that guy isn't here yet. Daddy said he is fast, so he can come here any time. Hmm, I guess these Vice Admirals are good enough already. Anyway, we continued to walk forward. The trees which we didn't like were cut in seconds. At least these bunch of filthy humans have some use. We walked a little more. Finally, a golden light entered our eyes. 
Countless chatters entered my ears, hundreds of people eating and fighting entered my eyes. Hey, give me the marshmallow. Ah, that juice is mine. I then said, come on, I ain't gonna wait till you're old enough. Ha ha, she made a disgusted face. There were filthy humans in front of me. But, that wasn't what attracted me, and all of us the most. Behind them, a golden city stood. I felt my eyes widen and not even blinking for minutes. How fascinating. This place is beautiful. Suddenly, I had a thought. I had a desire. I want this place. How nice it would be. Living in gold while a bunch of women massages my body. Ah. Uh, I quickly ran forward, attracted their attention, and prepared myself to scream at the top of my lungs. You all. A few minutes ago. At the top of Giant Jack, a few people were gathered around the small observatory. One of them was Wiper. He opened his mouth. Isa, do you see it? At the observatory, Braham and Isa were standing side by side, looking at the forest area. Un. I think that's them, world nobles. There are ten other people behind them. The world nobles are calling them vice admirals. Isa said lightly as Wiper nodded. Although Braham is good at seeing things from afar, the eleven-year-old Isa is not bad either. Thinking this, he looked at Robin. Miss Robin. Hearing him, Robin nodded. She then proceeded to think. M.M. Robin frowned lightly. She touched her chin and bit her lips. Ten vice admirals. I heard they brought their fleets as well. They are waiting outside. So it's literally a buster call. Robin got flashbacks from that particular day as her determination strengthened. She won't let the same thing happen here. This might be dangerous. Wiper stayed silent. Dangerous? Then, what do you think we should do? I'm not good at these tactics and Amon isn't here. You are a mastermind here. Beside that brat. By that brat, he meant ISA's other child, Karna. He was a born tactician. He was what people would call a genius. Though it was only because of the medicine Amon injected in him for years, and later what Yona has been doing in his stead. Yona's loyalty towards God far outweighs her morals. I still won't trust a four-year-old in such a serious issue, so tell us, Miss Robin. Wiper lightly said as Robin made a thinking position. From what we see, there isn't an admiral. As long as there aren't any admirals, we should be fine. Ten vice admirals are strong, but we have far more powerful people than that. However, she raised her head, everyone gathered around her, listening to her words carefully. I don't have enough courage to say, let's attack them right now. It would be ridiculous. In cases like this when the main character is missing, we need to act passively. As she said this, she got shivers in her spine. She felt the mon might do something that she won't like if messes up here. Let's observe quietly. If they act out of place, we will think of something then. We can't harm them. If we do, our end is inevitable. The world nobles were the world's sweet spot. If they are hurt, all of the government will come after them. That might not be a big deal for a pirate, but for a kingdom which can't just run away from marines, it's a death sentence. What we can do is pray, just pray, that they won't be like most world nobles. As she finished her words, she bit her lips again. She was wrong. She can't do anything without Amon on her side even now. She might be stronger than before, but that meant nothing in the long run. Wiper gripped his spear strongly. I don't care. If they make a move on my people, their heads will go flying. I'm not good with emotions. I will receive my punishment from Amon later if needed. He turned around and walked away. Isa clasped her hand together and prayed to God, her big brother. It was then, the world went slow. Everyone's ear perked up. You all. This place is mine now. Wahahaha. <laughs> In the slowed down world, only the world noble's scream resounded, which everyone at the jack heard with their enhanced hearing ability. Everyone here is my slave. Why aren't you all bowing to your master? Kahahaha. <laughs> Below the jack, everyone stopped eating, playing, chattering. They stopped doing whatever they were doing. With their veins pronounced, everyone down at the Golden City turned their head. The atmosphere was similar atop of the jack as well. Wiper clenched his jaws as a devilish grin slowly took over his face. Cuckoo. He said the wrong line. That fat bastard said the wrong line. Wiper screamed loudly and smashed his spear end on the floor. Boom boom. Wiper's skin tone became fiery reddish. He jumped up and flew forward like a human torch. Robin just stayed silent and stared ahead as Wiper jumped from atop, flying towards the filthy world noble that just shouted. She knew she couldn't stop this guy. This guy is a crazy bastard. Nobody. I mean, nobody says that about my kingdom. Chapter 103 The War of the Liberated Tribe. Perseido POV.
while being blinded by golden light, I stared ahead. In front of me were people with wings on their backs. They were as beautiful as the angels from the stories. As gods, we celestial dragons indeed need angels under us, so I have already decided which ones I would pick. I even decided on some beautiful females for daddy. But there was a particular one that I won't share at all. That redhead. Her expression is like a lifeless teddy bear. I want her. I want her. I want her. Thinking this, I raised my hand and pointed towards her. It seemed my previous words already caught their attention, so along with her, everyone was already looking at me. You redhead, I order you to come here. Lick my boots, come on. Seeing that she wasn't moving, I stomped on the ground hard. Can't you hear me? Come here, I said. Seeing that she was unfazed by it, I started to walk forward. Or more accurately, I pulled the lash of the slave I was riding on. Fush. Eh? What's this light? However, before I could reach her, the place became brighter than it already was. I feel hot. Fire Fist. General POV. Among the crowd under Jack, there was a certain blue-haired princess. Vivi looked ahead, her eyes wide as Wiper was going towards the celestial dragon from the air. Wiper was fast, his lower body had turned into the fire and was creating explosions to boost his already astonishing speed. Fire Fist. Screaming that on top of his lungs, Wiper punched towards the world noble named Brasiado. The man's eyes grew up while his suit was about to get engulfed in the fire alongside the slave he was riding on. However, bam, Wiper's fist had hit something but it wasn't the face of the filthy noble that he wanted to. Cook, you are strong, is that the Miramaranomi? To block his punch, a vice admiral had jumped forward in front of the noble. He blocked Wiper's fiery punch with full force. He was Vice Admiral Cooler. Cool. Do we call this a perfect match? While Wiper was pushing forward with his eyes red in anger, he felt his hands going. Cold. For the first time in six years after he ate the fruit, he felt the feeling of cold. As if knowing what was going on, the Marine officer chuckled. I'm Vice Admiral Cooler. I have eaten the cold, cold fruit. Your natural encounter. Thousand degrees Celsius, fire fist. Wiper didn't listen to him at all and increased the heat of his fire and again punched forward. My natural encounter? Don't make me laugh. Bam. This time, the punch hit Cooler in his face as he was thrown a few meters away. He rolled on the ground a few meters away as Wiper shifted his attention to the noble. Why you stay back? Stay back, I said. I'm a celestial dragon. I'm a god. The noble was on top of his slave who had a large body, riding him like a horse. He pulled the chain collar of the slave, but the slave didn't seem to move. You bastard, move. Move, damn it. He ordered the slave, but the slave just smirked. He didn't say anything, but Wiper understood what he meant. Grinning, Wiper heated his palms to 1,000 degrees and tried to grab the noble by the neck. However, he was interrupted again. For swords were instantly pointed at his neck, clad in armament. Don't move, withdraw your hand, or you will die. Wiper was cornered by four vice admirals who used swords. His hands were in the air, pointing at the world noble who had a nervous smile seeing the vice admirals coming to help. Wiper didn't seem to care, he stayed silent. Haha, uh -huh. look at this filthy bastard's face. You can't even show any emotions in fear, right? The world noble lightly slapped Wiper's cheeks to mock him. A few seconds passed, Wiper lightly chuckled. Kakik, how fascinating. Suddenly, his whole body started to become fiery red just like his hair. The surrounding atmosphere started to heat up and everyone started to feel the heat instantly, making them sweat. He spat on the bubble helmet of the world noble. You foolish, fat, idiotic bastard. Wiper's body heated up again. He grinned. Human torch. Explosion. In a second, Wiper's body exploded as a small part of the island got covered in smoke. Everyone from the tribe had evacuated before the explosion. Besides, they are strong enough to endure it. My people, at least. Mumbling to himself, Wiper sucked the fire around the place to not burn down the forest right now. The smoke subsided soon enough. Cook. How infuriating. Your fire is hotter than I thought. In front of Wiper, Cooler was back on his feet. He had the slave the noble was riding on his hand and used him as a meat shield after freezing his body, which blocked Wiper's explosion from reaching the noble. By now, the noble was evacuated a few meters back and Wiper was surrounded by seven vice admirals. Meanwhile, the three leftovers were protecting the three nobles. By now, the marines from the fleet around the island had come here as well. Wiper grinned like a devil. It was Amon's fault that he was so late, besides he permitted him to do anything in his absence anyway. 
so he didn't mind fucking world government in his stead. He could tell, if Amon was here he would have done the same, he would rather have killed the nobles already. Looks like this is going to be a cheerful day. Wiper's body again heated up, his body got covered in fire. Human Torch It was Human Torch again, but this time it wasn't an explosion. Transformation It was a transformation. Meanwhile, the three nobles on the back were backing off and were chattering among themselves. What is happening? Aren't we supposed to be invincible? Why are they attacking us? W. We need to get out of here. The woman named Bimrit was freaking out. She felt more scared than the other two. Except for the other noble, the older sibling, Ainsworth was quite scared as well. His body was literally shaking. Meanwhile, the only person fine, Perseido, was on his phone. Even though he witnessed his life almost end, he was fine. You bastard. Where are you? We are being attacked here. Why aren't you coming yet? Father said you were fast, but I can't quite see the proof anywhere. He was talking to a Din Din Mushy. The person behind didn't say much. Oh well. I see. Pardon. I will be there in a flash. Beep. Perseido threw the snail on the ground and stepped on it, squishing its life out. Daddy was right. This is a situation like God Valley. Just you wait. You yellow monkey admiral, I will report you to daddy. Perseido said it while gritting his teeth. It was then. You heretics. A sweet female's voice entered their ears and a dazzling girl caught their eyes. Perseido's eyes grew up looking forward. You, you are that red-haired bitch. I ordered you to come to me, didn't I? It was the red-haired priestess, Yona. She seemed unfazed by his red and anger face. You heretic, you asked me to lick your boots. She took out a sword from her waist. I don't mind licking boots if that is my lord's. However, a heretic won't get such a treatment. She screamed on top of her lungs. How dare you order me around? Beside her, Yurij was standing. You said you were God? How blasphemous. There is only one God, and that is our Lord. Beside him, Sumi was standing with her sword. It has been passed on to her family from generation to generation. It was an unnamed grade sword. My, I'm not into fat pigs even if they are rich. What a waste of wealth. The three nobles' hands shook. All the three of them kept looking ahead while the three vice admirals raised their guard. Ainsworth smiled. You, three, attack them. I want that brown-haired woman. I want the man. He looks strong. The redhead is mine. The three noble commanded as if this was their father's property. The vice admirals gritted their teeth hearing their words. This was a life and death situation and they were still playing around. Yona's eyes went cold. Her purple pupil glimmered red for a second as she dashed forward. I certainly don't know how strong the rank of vice admiral is, but that won't stop me from punishing those who stand in the way of heavenly judgment. That man disrespected the name of God, he shall pay. This was a situation that would have happened to Amon if he didn't have enough evidence of being the thunder god. Of course, it didn't happen. Amon didn't let it happen. Setting her target, Yona gripped her sword tightly. She wasn't as good as Tsumi at swordsmanship. She wasn't as strong as Yurij in the physical department either. But she had a special ability. H. Hey, I can't read her movements. Same with me. It's almost as if a harmless child is running. She had the power to hide her presence, in a level which Amon would need another ten years to reach. She was a natural-born killer, an assassin. Not only would people not be able to sense her presence, but even if she is in front of someone, preparing an attack, they would hesitate to regulate. They would question themselves, is she really dangerous to me? At the play of luck, even if they realize she is attacking them, they won't have a way to block her. They just simply can't read where she would be attacking next. Even if she had her arms raised to cut from above, they won't be able to tell if she won't change her attack midway. And indeed, she had the flexibility to change her attack midway as well. Only a person with a future vision would be able to fight against the monster named Yona. I'm my lord's best soldier. Yona was strong. It was lucky Amon didn't have to fight her back then. Because one of them would have died, and that one would have most likely would have been Amon. And now, six years later, she was stronger than ever. Why? Simai Kicken. Hair Hazard. It's because she knew Simai Kicken's actual use. Amon left notes for her before leaving. Her hairs raised in the air and became sharp needle blades. Indeed, the three vice admiral couldn't read her movements because, in their caught off guard state, Yona penetrated all of their hearts with her hair. Though the blood's color couldn't outmatch her hair's deep red color. As the three bodies of vice admirals slowly fell on the floor, unbeknownst to the seven other vice admirals who were fighting Wiper and the other personal guards, Yona coldly stared at the three celestial dragons. W-Witch. It's a witch. 
The older brother who had maintained an indifferent outlook up until now had finally broken into a sweat. Looking at Yona whose face was covered in blood, the man took a step back in fear of this monster. Yona did something she didn't do in a long time, she laughed. Her eyes were shaking, her heartbeat was fast. Ha 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 ha, look at you. You heretics who dared use Cammy's name. She stopped abruptly. I if I don't punish you, people, now we will receive heaven's judgment. As her face went cold, her hands kept shaking more. With a psychopathic smile on her face, she looked around her. It seems while chasing them, and while the vice admirals were protecting the nobles, they had fallen back deep in the forest side. The main fight was at least two kilometers away from here. Here, only the dead body of the three vice admiral, a few more marines who were accompanying them, the three world mobile, and the three priests existed. Yona's face became expressionless. A quiet spot. I would have loved to judge you in the open, but this is fine too. Suddenly laughing again, Yona then dashed forward again, slashing her right hand, which had the sword at the world noble Brasiado's neck. However, stop. A blue-haired girl stepped forward, standing in front of the world noble. I said stop, Yona. This is dangerous. As Yona's sword was about to penetrate the intruder, Vivi's head, she controlled her adrenaline and used her left hand to slap her right hand in the elbow as it bent in a way it shouldn't. She stopped her feet as well while grabbing her right hand which was hanging on her shoulder. Goddess, why are you taking the side of the heretics? H, have you decided to betray the god? Yona's eyes went blank. She's been calling her goddess since she is the future wife of Amon. If she decided to take the side of heretics then things might change. Stop it. Stop this foolish act. What god? What goddess? You are delusional. Come out of your fantasy. Yona's body shook hearing her each word. You can't touch these people. They are dangerous. If you harm them, you will be inevitably killed. Vivi made a sad face seeing Yona's shocked face. She just bit her lips. Yona, please I enjoyed my time with you. Don't do this. The blue-haired girl, Vivi's, tears started to fall while she stood in front of the world noble with her arms spread, stopping any of the three priests from attacking. Chapter 104 Raise your head. A few minutes ago. Kill him. Burn him alive. Kaya, my child. Don't go. Mother, I will fight for my land. Below the giant jack, everyone was fighting. The marines who were on the ships until now came to the island after hearing the commotion. They were currently in a fight of life and death with the sky people. The 3,000 Birkins, 1,000 gods militia, and four personal guards versus 4,500 marine soldiers. Each ship held 450 marines, and there were 10 ships. However, even with their advantage in numbers, the Skypea side people were on the winning side at first, at least until the pirates who came to steal the gold joint. The strongest Birkins after the high priest and the personal guards went after the vice admirals. So the thousands of marines and pirates didn't have anyone to stop them other than weak ones. Now, it was looking bad for the Skypea. Part of it was because many Scipian civilians were also attending this party and were being taken as hostages constantly. Among them, Robin was rescuing children and women who don't know how to fight. While rescuing hostages, she was also taking down pirates left and right. Flurs. Robin cracked the neck of 50 pirates at once. It was then. Hina recognized you correctly, Nico Robin. A rough female voice entered Robin's ears as she looked back. This is Black Cage Hina. Hina had a suspicion the miss all Sunday from the guild is none other than the devil child, Nico Robin. Marine Commodore. Black Cage Hina said while chewing on a piece of gum. Hina should focus on a threat like you first. Hina rushed towards Robin, as Robin smiled softly. Meanwhile, a large sum of militia was protecting the guests from Alabasta. Vivi, stay here. Father, look people are dying. I need to stop this war. What would you do if Alabasta was in this state? Vivi and Cobra were having a debate among themselves. They treated us like gods the days we spent here. We can't let them die, please. No means no. Why don't you understand, Vivi? Shut up. But. Cobra raised his hands to slap Vivi, but stopped midway. He had never hit her even once. He doesn't want to do it ever as well. With a shocked expression, Vivi turned around. She ran away from there. Some tried to stop her, but she didn't let anyone touch her and ran forward. Wait. On her way, she saw Yona and her party rushing towards the forest, going after the world nobles. No, they need to stop. There are still ways to fix things after this. This kingdom can still be a part of WG if father and that man talks with the elders, but if they harm a world noble, then this will be the end. 
During the past four years, she was very interested in worldly political affairs. Her interest almost felt surreal. It's as if someone hypnotized her, though they were just her thoughts. But for that, she studied these subjects thoroughly. About kingdoms, about crimes, about forgiveness of the said crime. And also, about world nobles. There was an unwritten rule. If you touch a celestial dragon, your end is inevitable. Unfortunately, amidst all this chaos, this exact thing was about to happen. I have to stop them from harming those people. Vivi, while barely evading the skirmish, and while the Shandin who recognized her took damage for her, ran forward and finally entered the forest. But she was maybe too late because she saw Yona kill the vice admirals as if taking Bird's life. She couldn't recognize Yona, the same girl who was calling her goddess and treating her like one. But she knew one thing, she needs to stop them from harming the world nobles. This place is filled with nice people, I don't want it to be destroyed. She ran forward. At this moment, Vivi was in front of the world noble, her arms spread in the air. Yona. Nobody noticed the hand that was behind Vivi. Yona, you can't harm them? Suddenly, Vivi felt a hand grabbing her from behind and a cold metal pipe touching her skill. Kahiki, I found such a nice rat. It was the noble Brasiado who had a gun touching Vivi's head. You aren't bad as well, but you look like royalty. I will take you as my concubine if we survive this together, kahaha. He said while pressing his hands around Vivi's waist. Now, now, you red-headed bitch. Don't you dare move, or this girl's skull will go boom. Yona, whose eyes were wide and had her left hand pressing her right hand, was out of any thought. The other two Birkin caught up to her, but seeing the scene in front, they stopped. RG goddess. Yurij felt anger rising within his body. He wanted to bash the skull of the noble, but seeing the gun on Vivi's head, he had to force himself from not moving. He also noticed Yona's hand was disgustingly broken, bone revealing and blood dripping down like tears. The man ahead ordered, You bitch, come here and lick my boots. Yona stared in front with a dazed look. Her lips agape a little and her eyes dizzy. Don't you hear me? Do it. Lick my boot. Bam. Yona's body jerked as the man slammed Vivi's head with his gun, making blood drip. Stop. Don't hurt the goddess. She recalled the words Amon said after returning from Fishman Island five years ago. He showed Yona the picture of Vivi and talked that they were engaged. Hearing that much, Yona concluded Vivi is a literal goddess chosen by God. Currently, looking at Vivi, she could only sense positive emotion from her. She was thinking about Yona's safety. This means she stopped me from attacking the heretic to stop me from coming in harm's way. The noble's eyes became red in anger. Huh? Did you just scream at me? Bam! How dare you? Quickly do what I'm saying. Yona felt rage build up in her forehead. She wanted to crack this man's head right now. There were thousands of ways she could end this man right now. After all, the man won't even realize that she has the will to attack. But, I will do it. Don't hurt her. Her goddess was in danger. She can't take the chance. Vivi was struggling, but the hit from the gun made her calm down a little. Her body started to shake as she started to think about what she did wrong. She saved the man's life and this is how he is treating her? Is that how every world noble acts? I saved you. Yet you were acting like this. Vivi's tears fell down. Kahey, that's why I offered you to become my concubine. Vivi bit her lips. She understood how humans, or precisely how celestial dragons are. She just stared at Yona who slumped on the ground and directed her mouth towards the man's shoe. Yes, yes lick it. Do it, ha ha ha. Soon you'll lose your life too. Yona closed her eyes in shame and moved her tongue. She would have killed him but there must be a reason her goddess stepped forward and saved the heretic. She chose to believe in her goddess than herself this time. Was there a reason the sky became dark particularly at this moment? Forgive me, my lord. I'm having to lower my head to someone else other than you. Forgive me. Or was there a reason why the wind was blowing faster? Yona got flashbacks with Amon. Her time that she spent with him that night. He didn't even touch her, as the graceful god he is. But today, his most devoted believer is lowering her head in front of a heretic. Or, was there a reason why the rain was falling and thunder was crackling? It's because I wasn't strong enough. Yona moved her head with her tongue out and it was about to touch the shoe. It was then. Z z z z, z z z t. A pair of large hands stopped her by the shoulders. Red dragoness, raise your head, you did a fine job. The soothing voice forced Yona to open her eyes large. As she slowly raised her, Lines of tears started to fall, her lips quivered. And my lord. The man, Amon smiled lightly at her as his wings soared up, blinding the whole area in a flashy light. Chapter 105
Among the people fighting under the giant beanstalk, Robin and Hina's fight was one of the most intense ones out of them. Bam! Hina hit Robin's face using a cage's end. She was a second late from capturing her in a cage, but she didn't give up. Wiping blood from her swollen lips, Robin stared ahead with her eyes calculating the next course of action. She was never good at fighting, but she was giving her best. Finding an opening, she crossed her arms and spawned hands on Hina's neck. But Robin's hands weren't able to touch her head as a cage had been created around Hina's head, thus blocking Robin's hand from reaching her. You rely too much on your clutching powers. Commenting such, Hina again rushed towards Robin. This time, Robin was forced to choose and fight hand to hand. She recalled a generic technique Amon suggested once. I should try that. Robin crossed her arms and closed her eyes. The next second, she opened her eyes with a sharp glint. Fleur, six arms. Robin spawned four extra arms on her body, thus coming to possess six usable arms. Four is better than two, and six is better than four. She recalled Amon's words and rushed forward. But if you can't control them properly, then it's better to have only one. Robin knew what he meant. Control. She did have control over her six arms, that's why she summoned them in this intense battle. Robin then drove her legs forward, rushing towards Hina. Hina tried to stop her by using her cages, but Robin was fast and agile enough to evade them swiftly. Getting close to Hina, she punched towards different parts of her body. Her head, her shoulder, her stomach, her rib cage, and finally her two kidneys. Crushing force. With a shocked face, Hina blocked her four hands barely, but the other two hands slipped through her defense and hit her in the kidneys. Hina's eyes grew in a matter of seconds. Gah! She puked saliva and clutched the side of her belly strongly. She stood there for a few seconds, but was still able to evade most of Robin's attacks. Ha! Huh. Looks like Hina underestimated you. Spitting out a tooth, Hina stood still on her feet. That you did, but the realization won't help you now. Saying this, Robin calculated her next attack. But... Crack. The weather suddenly changed significantly. Rumble. The clouds above started to darken and the sky started to roar. Clear drops of water started to pour from the sky, and as if the thunder had life, it started to dance in the sky. Robin stared at this scene blankly for a second before releasing a relieved sigh. He got the signal. He indeed did get the signal Robin sent. Amon's arrival wasn't just luck-based, after all. The tower on top of Giant Jack wasn't just used as a cell phone tower, it had other uses. Robin used the tower to send radio waves towards space as Amon ordered her to do if there were ever any emergencies. Robin did exactly that just when she was let known about the arrival of the Celestial Dragons. The satellite dish on the moon captured it and let Amon know about the emergency. After that, everything happened at lightning speed. It took him around an hour to arrive here from the moon. He's always on time. Releasing another relieved sigh, Robin dashed towards the caught-off guard Hina. Kami-sama. Kwae. Robin didn't see, but behind the dark clouds, a spherical bowl-type object was flying coming towards this place. The sky was dark. The intensity of wind was the highest in the forest area because of the trees. Amidst the blowing wind, Amon's shoulder-length hair was fluttering beautifully. Amon was wearing only trousers and a leather chest vest, proving his unexpected arrival. While rain was falling on his body, he was holding Yona in his strong arms. His sudden teleportation made the three nobles stop in their spot in surprise. Who is this guy? The female noble asked in her mind, she suddenly got interested in this potential slave. In front of the noblewoman, Amon was completely standing still, ignoring her gaze completely. He was rather looking at the face of the woman in his arms. Are you all right? Never mind. The handbroken Yona had blurry eyes because of all the tears. She was still thinking the man who was carrying her was just her hallucination. My Kami, is that really you? The man, Amon, stared at her silently as if he was reading her mind. Amon POV. I looked at her almost severed arm silently. Close your eyes, it won't hurt. I said and streamed a little bit of electricity through Yona's brain and forced her body to shut down. I glanced at Sumi who was standing behind me. Staring at her for a second, I handed Yona to her. I moved my lips. Go back, take her to the infirmary. And Yurij, go and help our people in the fight. Yurij instantly nodded. Yes, my lord. Saying this, Yurij instantly rushed backward but Sumi seemed to hesitate about something. Lord, the war is still going on. We are not sure in what state the infirmary is. With all due respect, is it a good idea to bring the injured archpriestess to that place? I stared at her for a brief moment before lifting the corners of my lips upwards. She is surprisingly behaving. 
I nodded my head. It's fine, by the time you reach there. The war would have already come to an end. Thunder cracked in the sky, as if to support my words. With red cheeks and giving a last look at my face, Sumi also rushed backward. How long will it take for her to reach two kilometers away from here, from this packed forest full of trees? Will the war really stop before then? She didn't know, but she ran with all her might. Yona's bleeding arm might get lost forever if not treated at once. Looking at the light far, the light of Wiper's fire, Sumi increased her speed. General POV. On the other side, Wiper was busy fighting the three vice admirals who were in front of him. Fire machine gun. Wiper pointed his fingers ahead and started to fire, fire bullets from them. Pew 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 pew. They were very fast, going towards the 300 marines around him. Most of them got hit and fell on the ground, struggling to extinguish the fire. It didn't take long for the fire to subside because of the rain. Among the 300 marines, two vice admiral blocked the attacks with their sword, and another vice admiral, Cooler, blocked it by turning the air into ice. Cook, why is this bastard so strong? Even though it's raining. Indeed, Wiper was fighting 300 marines and three vice admirals toe to toe. He alone was enough for them. In reality, Wiper would have one if this was a clean field and not a forest. If he uses his full power here, the forest will burn, and it would be bad since this is his own forest. Besides, it was raining. Things weren't looking bad for Wiper, at least not until another vice admiral joined the fight. A bulky man walked and stood with the three other vice admirals, his height a little higher than others. I have cleared the other part. I brought a sea stone lance as well, so let's take him on together. All of them nodded hearing this and rushed towards Wiper. Cooler snatched the lance and rushed ahead of everyone. Wiper tried to oppose them using his fire spear, but Cooler jabbed the sea prism lance forward, towards Wiper's heart. Fuck, the sea prism is erasing my fire. In this rain, it's weakening me. Wiper moved his hands forward to stop the lance with his palm. This would hurt a lot as it would even penetrate his palm too, but this was the only way. Because he was out of stamina, barely moving, he was about to fall on his knees. Ugh, fuck this damned rain. Before the lance could hit him though, a feminine hand smaller than his stopped the lance using his palm. The lance didn't penetrate her ink-black palm, rather it just shattered. It's alright, Wiper. A long familiar female voice whispered in his ears as Wiper's body finally gave up. Take a rest, dumbass. Before going unconscious, his face bloomed a soft smile. The female smiled softly. You did a great job. As Wiper fell to the ground, she looked around. Every marine in front was wary of her. Shattering a sea prism weapon meant she isn't a devil fruit user. The female didn't talk, rather just smiled. No, she grinned. Stupid fucks. I will chop your heads off. As her voice subsided, 60% of the people on the island lost their consciousness, except for the strong people like the marine officers and all people with wings. Even Robin, who was injured, and the guest from Alabasta also lost their consciousness. Fuck, I wanted to enjoy myself a little. No, it wasn't the females doing. I'm on POV. As Tsumi left, I released a burst of Conqueror's hockey towards a specific target, non-winged beings. The burst reached the main battle two kilometers away in a matter of seconds. The rest will be taken care of by Riki. I stared at Tsumi's back while feeling the world nobles finally regaining their composure. I turned around. Vivi was still in the hands of the noble. She just stared in front of her towards me, with wide eyes. It seems her memories are fuzzy, though she still recognized me. Looking at my face, Vivi was lost for a second. However, why you? When did you come here? Who are you to let my slave run away? Unbeknownst to Vivi's state of mind, the noble, Bersiado who noticed Sumi yelled in surprise and confusion. In response, I laughed lightly, albeit my face didn't seem like that of someone who's joking. My eyes were sharp, looking at the noble who was holding Vivi. My gaze was as if burning the soul of the noble, Bersiado. Should I kill him? I have a better plan. W, why are you laughing? Bersiado felt his blood freeze. I stayed silent, staring at him, planning what I really should do with him. W, who are you glaring at? I looked at his eyes as Bersiado felt his legs go numb. It was his instinct warning him. But how will a person who never fought in his life understand his own instinct? He tried to push harder. Why, you want this girl dead? At this line, Vivi also regained her fuzzy mind. The noble raised his hand holding the gun, preparing to hit Vivi again as he jabbed his hand towards her face. However, crack. Before he could do so, his hand just bent in a way it shouldn't, seemingly, by themselves. Ah, uh, 
It took a while for the noble's pain receptor to react, as he screamed in agony. Ah! Holding his right hand using his left, the noble dropped his gun and fell on his knees. He never felt this much pain in his life, his bone was revealed, coming out of his suit. Vivi, on the other hand, had wide shocked eyes, she didn't see what happened, but she guessed it was me who broke his arm, and she was right. I had a thought as I looked at her. Honestly, the one who deserves to receive a broken hand is you, not this guy. Vivi felt her forehead turn cold, but I ignored that and directed my hand towards her. In her shocked state, I yanked her towards me by her waist. Her face hit my chest as she stayed in that position, not daring to look at my eyes. She realizes, even though she had good intentions, her actions would have not only humiliated Yona but also killed her and the other two priests. Meanwhile, one of the nobles was already kneeling, while the other two were too caught in the situation to move. Seeing their siblings like this surely made them infuriate, but what I could feel from their heart was fear. I just pointed my fingers forward and ZZZT. Ah. All three of them started to scream. This is torture. I'm shocking them to their limit. If I increase the power a little more, they will die. They peed themselves while their body was shaking, through its skins becoming charred. Their inner thoughts were like this, Sid. Monster. Monster. Daddy help. Kill me. Kill me. Ubwas. Quite interesting thoughts. I stopped. Or they will die. Death will be too easy for them. ZZZZT. As minutes passed in silence with the only sound present being the raindrops landing on the trees and ground, I then used one of the many techniques I mastered in the past four years. Thud. H. Ah. What's happening? Both of them fell on their knees, just like their kneeling sibling. Clean my boots with your tongue. I want it to shine. They were surprised, but their bodies moved by themselves. Their bodies aren't in their control anymore. While they slowly directed their faces towards my and Vivi's shoe, in less than a second, I teleported and brought a camera dial here. I also popped their bubble helmet using a bit of heat. Let us stream this video to all the corners of the world. All the large monitors of wingless Valkyrie will play this video. It would be interesting, right? I then glanced at the female. You. Yes, you. Keep licking and strip. Take your clothes off. The female started to strip, just like what I said. This was being streamed around the world. Marines will come after the wingless Valkyrie in Skypea. But this isn't enough. I recall, she wanted to make me her slave. I then teleported from there and returned after a few seconds with two horses. Patting the horses back, I ordered them to go forward towards the female. Do a good job, all right? Kahiki. I took the horses and the female a little far from here. I don't want Vivi to see what will happen to the woman. After that, I returned after placing a camera with the woman there. It won't be streamed to the world. I will use it as a blackmail material. I'm sure this would be enough for me to play the world government silly. Looking at the two men licking my and Vivi's boots, while this was being streamed live, I had one thought. This would be dangerously crazy. The world government will be infuriated. They would want me dead. They will use all their power to capture me. But, do I care? If they come after me, that's all according to my plan. It's been enough hiding like a rat. Fuck plot. Fuck the will of D. Fuck the world government. As of now. I don't care at all. In sync with my thoughts. The sky roared. General POV. Meanwhile, the nobles were cleaning Amon's shoes, still in a daze wondering what was happening. In reality, their bodies were not theirs to control. The human body moves using electrical signals traveling through their brain, the neurons. Then what if a person who has great control over electricity tries to fool the brain by sending fabricated signals? Neuron control. Using this technique, Amon sends electrical waves into one's brain and orders it to perform any movement. The electricity fools the brain thinking the host is the one ordering it. So I'm basically a hacker, but I'm not hacking a computer, I'm hacking a brain. Killing them right now, in this dark would be too small of payment for all the problems they cost. Amon came here in a hurry, in the middle of an important battle. First, I should make them lick our foot and stream it throughout the world. Hey, bro. Suddenly, a female voice entered Amon's ear as he looked back. Stop hugging her. Bitch was the reason Yona is in that state, right? I want to kill her, so get away. It was Riki. She rushed towards Amon, specifically towards Vivi who was hugging Amon tightly. General POV. Ah. Yona's forearm was barely clinging to the elbow. It was connected to a high-tech machine. Do not worry. It will be fine. I, Automata Shore Motor guarantee it. The folk riding the spherical vehicle that Rob and Mist had come down now. 
They were helping all the winged people on the battlefield. The war had already ended. A burst of conqueror's hockey from Amon had knocked them unconscious. Now, the many automata who came here riding the spaceship were helping all the winged people and the ones they were previously notified of, like Robin, Cricket, and the Alabastan people. Meanwhile, Amon and Riki were having a skirmish. Bro, get away. I will kill her. Amon glared at her. Shut the fuck up. This is an emergency. Don't act childish here. Bro, ah. Though their moment couldn't hold for much longer. Riki covered her eyes. The reason was a blinding yellow light. A certain someone had teleported in the air. Awa. A bored voice sounded from the sky as Amon looked at the sky. So I wasn't so late, huh? Amon just stared at him for a second. Riki's face went full serious. It's that guy brother told me about, Admiral Kazaru, Borsalino. The flying man, Kazaru, looked at the three celestial dragons licking Amon, Riki, and Vivi's shoes. Riki was arguing with Amon while standing on her feet, Vivi behind Amon. The two celestial dragons were uncontrollably licking the shoes of the three while the camera was capturing everything and streaming it throughout the world. Kazara couldn't find the female around here. Well, hearing Kazara's voice and looking at his half-closed eyes, Riki quickly touched her sword. Is this some kind of joke? Kazara said in his usual tone. I guess I was a little late. Riki instantly jumped in the air, her swords going towards Kazara's neck. Chapter 106 Flash A light flashed in the dark sky of the upper yard as the silhouette of a tall man appeared. Ow oh, wow, so I was late. Kazaru, the marine admiral in a yellow suit gazed down after teleporting in the air. On the ground, there were five people, but only three of them were looking at him. The other two, the two world nobles, were busy licking the boots of the other three. Oh. Ignoring the nobles, Kazara glanced at the other three people. A girl with blue hair, a male with black hair, and another female with long black hair reaching her waist, tied in a ponytail. Instantly, Kazari noticed the girl with a ponytail looking at him with a serious face. Before the admiral could think of anything else, the girl jumped towards him with her hands which were holding two swords. Kazara made a bored face looking at her sluggish jump. Even though, in reality, Riki was moving around 120 kilometers per hour. Looking at Riki's sword coming towards his neck, Kazara opened his lips lightly. Would you like to experience a kick at the speed of light? Although he seemingly asked a question, he didn't wait for an answer. Kazari moved his legs. His legs had already started glowing by then, going towards Riki's face. Oh shit. Riki's eyes widened as she realized she was too slow. Bam. His legs hit something, but that something sure wasn't Riki. ZZZ. The man who was on the ground just now was between Riki and Kazaru, blocking Kazara's kick with his wings. The man, Amon, was blocking Kazara's attack with his wing. Speed of light? Pfft. Should I laugh? Amon stared at Kazara's surprised eyes. Blinking twice, Kazara formed a smile. Interesting. Meanwhile, in the golden city where the war had ended and the automata were busy helping the injured, a certain albatros man was taking pictures of everything. Click. Click. The sounds of the camera clicking were overlapping the chirping of people all around him. Nobody stopped him surprisingly. Just a while ago he got permission from Nico Robin to perform his act here. Enthusiastically, he was taking pictures. Tomorrow, there will be news. Big news. Written by none other than Big News Morgan. Huff. Suddenly, the albatros, Morgan noticed someone running from inside the forest. She had the Princess of Alabasta in her hands. Bitch. Only because brother said to retreat and keep you safe. The girl said while roughly pulling Vivi by her collar, pulling her through the ground. Be grateful. Behind her, two celestial dragons were following them while crawling like dogs. Amon POV. I was floating in the air. My hand was holding my sword. Meanwhile, my wings were blocking Kazara's kick. Kazara didn't mind it and took back his leg. We exchanged a few more blows after I sent Riki back. That was quite interesting. It was then. Though I don't really like dark places, let's lighten this up, shall we? Kazara snapped his fingers as countless beams of light came out of his body and went towards the sky. Suddenly, the dark sky started to clear up and the sunlight started to fall on the glittering grass on the ground. While I glanced at the beautiful scenery below, Kazara called. I assume you were Lucifer? Even a bored admiral such as Kazara recognized me, the winged man who was considered angel by some and devil by the others. These four years, my name was rarely written in the newspaper, but my organization did have countless mentions now and then. But I'm sure that didn't interest Kazaro. Kazara stayed silent, but I could sense, 
He was simulating my movement from a second ago. There was a reason why he knew about me, and it's not merely because of my fame. It's because of the rumor among the higher-ranking marines, Lucifer has eaten the Garo Garo Nomi. As for why I know about this, that's for a later day. Kazari moved his lips. I see that the suspicion was true. Not only that, you were a Scipion all along, but the wings are still something to look up for. Hmm. I chuckled hearing him. People in my previous world used to call Kazaru unworthy to have his fruit because they said he isn't quick-witted. Now, would you look at this? I decided to mock the WG for a moment. Oh, the government found out after so long? They are quite disappointing, unlike their reputed informant, Cypherpaul. Kazara didn't respond and moved from his spot. TSK, don't talk in a battle. I would like to see how fast the Goro Garo Nomi user actually is. His legs rushed towards my chest. This time they weren't glowing. Z z z z. I streamed electricity through my brain and boosted my thinking speed. In the slowed down world, I stared at Kazaru's leg. It was very fast compared to the normal movements in this slowed down world. However, it's slow. There is no way this is the speed of light. Not even close. General POV. Morgan looked at the celestial dragons with wide eyes. They are crawling? In his life, he never thought he would see this day. His eyes teared up as he felt his heart throb faster. This is going to the big news as well. He quickly started to take pictures. Just behind him, on the wall of a destroyed building, and I was open, looking at Morgan. The owner of the eye, Robin smirked seeing this. As Lucy had wanted, things are moving smoothly. But there was another fact. I'm still a little scared. It's my trauma after all. Robin then noticed Ricky who was roughly pulling Vivi. A small smile bloomed on her face seeing Ricky. She has grown as well, only physically. Amon POV. Why wasn't Kazaru's kick as fast as they should have? There are three answers to this. 1. Kazaru isn't actually as fast as light. He's lying. 2. Kazaru is as fast as light, but the light in One Piece world is actually slow. 3. Kazaru's body stops himself from achieving the speed. He can only reach light speed, or at least around it, after he goes through elemental transformation. The number one is a fact. Kazaru isn't as fast as light. If he was, a light speed kick would have destroyed the world. Literally. The number two is something highly unlikely. Because if Oda tried to balance things this way, my Garo Garo speed would have been slowed down as well. The number three is the most possible answer, as I myself also suffer through it. I can't use lightning speed without transforming. At least not at full capacity. So in conclusion, Kazaro isn't as fast as light. But even if he is, he needs to transform into his element to achieve that feat since to move that fast he needs to be completely massless. In his human form, he definitely has mass since his kick had force behind it. So if I consider my own case, without transforming, he's using the fruit's base speed. My base speed is speed of sound, 0.343 kilometers per second. Let's talk about me. To surpass my base, I need to transform, or at least partially transform by flowing extreme electricity through my body. Kazaru's case should be the same since every time he used his light speed kick, his legs started to glow. So. If my base is 0.343 kilometers per second, what is Kazaru's? I dodged another of Kazaru's attacks. I barely dodged this one. Whoa. As I have guessed, you're fast. I should get serious. Of course, he wasn't serious. And here I was using my base's top speed. Thus proves his base is faster than mine. It's because light is three times faster than lightning. It's a fact even in this world. So Kazaru's base should be 1.029 kilometers per second. This would make sense why Rayleigh was able to match his speed. After all, I refuse to believe even a monster like Rayleigh is as fast as light. I was brought out of my thoughts by a blinding light. Would you like a kick at the speed of light? Kazara said as his legs started to glow. I wondered how fast his legs would be this time. Z z z z. To analyze, I streamed electricity through my brain. I could think at a speed that far surpassed the sound barrier, which is enough to make Kazara's kick seem sluggish. Indeed. By making his leg glow, meaning by making his legs partially transform, he reaches a speed that is very fast. But even that very fast is slower than full lightning speed. Slow. Though I thought that, the kick did hit me in the jaws, making me fly upwards. This kick wasn't light speed, but it sure was something I couldn't dodge, at least, not in this form. Z z z z. As I started to fly up, 
I teleported 16 kilometers away, then repeated that action thus teleporting me 32 kilometers away from my initial position. Kazara will take a while to reach me since there are some clouds covering his way. His teleportation isn't as fast and versatile as mine after all. He needs an open area to teleport, meaning he can't teleport to the other side of a wall. I ignored the stray thoughts. I then took out a ball of gold from my bag, then threw my sword and bag in the solid island cloud far below. Zzz. This time, I didn't flow electricity through my body. Rather, I transformed into a bolt of lightning. After transforming, I started to manipulate the bolt to take the form of a 150 centimeters young man. In this form, I'm not only as fast as lightning, I'm flexible as well. Now the gold ball. This should be enough, right? General POV. Above the white white sea and a few chunks of clouds that were floating freely in the open sky, something bright was floating. Far above a large cloud, a bolt of lightning in the form of a young man was standing. Meanwhile, both of his fists were wearing knuckle dusters made of gold, but the dusters were roughly made, as if it had just melted after heating up and in that short time, the young man had worn it. The next second, a man in a yellow suit, Kizaru, flew towards the young man, Amon, at an astonishing speed. For a second, Kizaru was surprised seeing Amon like that, but he nonetheless kicked towards him at full speed. I should get serious. This time, Kizaru's whole leg started to glow. This is a kick at one-tenth speed of light, my highest speed without fully transforming. It far surpassed the 1.029k slash m kick that I landed on him last time. Kazara thought this at an astonishing speed. Although he can't think light fast, his fruit does give him a boost at thinking. Fwoosh. The kick went towards Amon's face. However, Zesesti, he dodged it by moving to the side. By moving at the speed of lightning, 100,000 kilometers per second. Slug. Kazara's eyes grew up instantly. Just now, he couldn't follow his movements. This form heightens my instincts and boosts them to an unimaginable level. Not only that, there is an invisible circular dome of electricity surrounding my body, 10 meters around it to be precise. The moment something enters this dome, Amon's body will dodge it involuntarily. This was literally ultra instinct. However, that wasn't enough. After all, Amon won't be satisfied with just dodging. While Kazara tried to attack Amon again and again, sweats formed on his forehead. He kicked at Amon's chest, punched at Amon's rib, shot beams of light at his head, but none of them hit him. This was speed. Sheer speed that Kazara wasn't able to follow. His brain wasn't fast since he can't let electricity flow through it. There was a way he would be faster than Amon if he uses elemental transformation, but then Amon didn't let Kazara think further as he moved behind his back and swung his arm backward. Charging the knuckle duster, Amon punched forward. He moved his arms very slowly, but to Kazara it was very fast. The knuckle duster started to glow blue, but the glowing stopped as Amon covered it with hockey. Amon curled up his lips upwards. He grinned. Less than 700 million volts, rail gone. Amon's fist just went through Kazara's body as if he was made of tofu. The golden duster just turned into dust, and the dust started to collide with each other at molecular level. Each dust started to release a blinding light, as if an explosion would occur. Kazara stared at his chest with wide eyes for a while as his body started to glow yellow. He was doing his elemental transformation, but before he could do so, Amon moved his lips. Hakai. B O O O M. An explosion at the level of a nuclear bomb occurred, engulfing the whole sky. This was the power of Railgun. Luckily, it happened kilometers above the upper yard. Chapter 107 Aftermath. Amon POV. As the massive explosion was about to take place, I took back my hand from Kazara's body and started to teleport miles away from the spot. The explosion then happened, engulfing the whole sky. Albeit its devastating outlook, it looked beautiful nonetheless. I immediately boosted my observation to the highest degree. My current range mixed with Garo Garo is 300 kilometers radius. It was to solely sense any trace of Kazara. I dare say, I have the highest range of observation in the world. Before I could praise myself some more, I felt a presence coming towards me at a speed out of my league. Ya, yeah, ta, no, KG, me. I couldn't even follow his voice, he was that fast. The presence didn't touch me, he just passed by my side, going towards the blue sea below. Though going by my side wasn't a good idea, I would say. I looked below, a trail of light was quickly passing through the world. It passed my 300 kilometers range in less than a second. I was speechless. As expected, Kazara had ways to run. 
but he didn't have ways to fight. Kazaru, as I found after reading his mind, can't think at the speed of light. His thinking process ends at his base, 1.029 kilometers per second. Yes, even in elemental form, he still can't think that fast. Not only him, but even my Goro Garo Nomi doesn't allow me to think as fast as lightning, not at all, or the canon Enel would have been Oprah than he was shown. I can only think fast since I've modern world knowledge which Enel didn't have. Human thinking speed is based on our brain neurons' data traveling speed. And since neurons use electricity to do everything, I can boost it by using my own electricity. However, that isn't the case for Kazaro. This time, when he just went past me, I could feel that he wasn't able to see or think anything. He was just going forward. Like this, he will probably hit the sea somewhere in the blues. With a restriction like that, fighting in his base is better than transforming. Not only that, after he transforms into light, he would start reflecting on every surface around him, losing control and eventually dying. Unfortunately, he seemed to have trained quite a lot to at least control the reflecting problem to a degree. That's the reason he was able to choose to go towards the sea surface. Man. Sigh. I tried to finish the fight as fast as possible, but Kazara was able to survive the explosion. It should be because of his body being light itself. That's why in his fight with Z, he survived a similarly massive island explosion. I have some single-person attacks rather than this AV explosion, but Kazaru is too fast for me to try them on him. I just wanted to kill him as fast as possible. It seems I failed. However, ha, huh, ha, ha. I laughed. I failed to kill him, but I didn't fail to injure him to a terrible degree. I raised my hand, and my hand, there was a bloodied arm. A severed arm wearing the sleeves of a yellow suit. It was a mistake to think I would sit still while you just go past me like that. Even in his fast state, I grabbed his light body and snatched his arm with hockey. He was too fast for his own bad. He lost his arm like nothing. Well, I guess this is it. He survived by pure luck. But that hole in his chest is 100% real. Let's see how long he survives. Though I'm sure, he probably has a healing factor too. Sad. General POV. Cough. TSK. That bastard. On an isolated island, at the destroyed shore, a bloodied man was sitting against a tree. He was wearing a yellow suit and only had one hand. He was Kazara. Kazara was about to hit the sea, but he was barely able to control himself to land on this island. Though in response, the island was mostly destroyed. Currently, Kazara had his only hand touching his chest. His chest was glowing. It will take a while for me to heal. Indeed, he can increase his healing speed as well, gaining a pseudo-healing factor. Kazara made an angry face, something which is rarely done by him. This will eat up a lot of my life force, around 10 years. His eyes glowed. I will definitely get back for this. Kazara's frown deepened. Tisk. Clicking his tongue again, Kazara looked for a din din mushy in his pockets, but there weren't any. It seems the snails got caught in the explosion. Clicking his tongue again, Kazara kept lying down. He decided to rest until the wound heals completely. It will take a few days. It's a fatal wound after all. Though even with his healing factor, he won't be able to get his hand back. He was one step away from being completely donut-ed. In the upper yard, the Alabasta guest was in a highly guarded room. Cobra was in the room, sitting beside Vivi. Vivi, why the long face? You are fine now, aren't you? He said. I will complain to Lucifer about that girl, so don't worry, all right? Vivi had her head down, her eyes dull. Don't, father. It's my fault. She even saved my life. She whispered. I don't have any shame left to demand anything. Please leave me alone for a while. She said while her hands were clutching the bedsheet. Cobra refused to leave her alone, but a presence appeared there. It's fine, father-in-law. I will look after her. You can go outside. It was Amon, whose voice rang inside Vivi's ears. His previous words about her arm chirped in her mind. Vivi hesitated to ask Cobra to stay, but it was too late. By then, Cobra was already talking with Amon. Son-in-law, you are here. Vivi was lowering her head, avoiding Amon's gaze who was staring at her face. A few minutes passed like that. Sigh. Amon sighed. Listen, girl, you must not remember our previous encounters. You were young. But listen here, I will warn you this once. Amon grabbed Vivi by her jaws and made her look into his eyes. If something like this ever happens and if for you, my people get hurt. You will definitely pay. Gulp Vivi gulped while her eyes shook looking at the bloody eyes of Amon. She pulled some strength towards her throat. Let dash asterisk slap. Asterisk. Amon cut her by slapping her in the right cheek. Slap. 
Amon slapped her again in the left cheek. Slap. Amon slapped her in the right cheek. Vivi was having wide eyes. Slap. Slapping for the last time. Amon stopped as Vivi fell silent with her cheeks red. Tears were falling. Her body was shaking. She almost wet herself. She was too scared of things. Like that a few minutes passed. Amon was still grabbing Vivi by her mouth. Vivi looked down, avoiding eye contact. Her eyes were still shaking a little. I understand. I won't do anything stupid anymore. This was the first time anyone slapped her. Although she did fight and received punches, slaps were new to her. So she was easily subdued. Amon nodded. It's nice seeing you understand. Don't expect me to treat you like how your father does. That said, he quickly freed her. Things might change if you act like a good girl. I might start loving you. Our relationship will progress brightly. A child in the future. Then one day they will be married and we will be grandparents. The kingdom of Alabasta will progress along with us. And thus we might become actual soul partners. When that happens, I will care about you the most. My people will come second. You will come first. I'm not saying if. I'm saying when. After saying all that with a straight face, Amon glanced at the surprised Vivi before getting up from the bed. Don't worry too much about what you did. I know you did it for the Skypea's sake. He nodded towards her. I would be grateful to you, but please be careful. Vivi was a little surprised seeing his sudden change, but she was too scared to question anything. Yes, I will be careful. Vivi whispered while averting her gaze. Amon just walked away, ignoring her. While walking, he stated one last time. I will talk with the king to proceed with the marriage soon. Though I'm not sure if he will agree after what happened to the celestial dragons. Amon walked away while his hand was resting on the sword on his waist. Meanwhile, then, what should we do with them? In the upper yard, the pirates and marines were all captured, shackled with sea stone handcuffs. Most of the marines died in battle, but the pirates survived mostly. The Shandians would have normally killed the people who tried to harm their own, but Amon seemingly didn't want this to happen like an automata had stated. ISA was among the people surrounding the invaders. Her gaze was cold. Killing them would be fine. After all, they did attack us first. They killed 50 of our people, ISA said with a shaky voice while some of the people behind nodded. Beside her, a child was standing. He seemed to make a sad face because of his mother's words. Meanwhile, Riki was standing just there, leaning against a wall. Don't do anything yet. She yawned. Brother is coming soon. Just as she said this, something flashed in the bright sky. Z z z z. Amon teleported in front of everyone, walking towards them. He raised his left hand. Yo, it's been a while, everyone. Oh, it's Kami-sama. Everyone seemed ecstatic seeing him. They knew the cause of the explosion was him. After all, who could make such a big explosion other than him? Meanwhile, Amon's right hand had the severed arm of the Yellow Admiral. He kept this in the sky while meeting Vivi. Instantly, the first to run towards him was the priest Sumi. My lord. She stopped in front of Amon. Why are you carrying that thing? Give that to me, I will throw it away. Amon stared at her for a second before shaking his head in his mind. Normally, the one to run would have been Yona, but she was unconscious so Tsumi was taking the chance. Nonetheless, he gave her the hand. Don't throw it, it's precious. Sumi's eyes widened. Uh, why yes? She bowed and backed away. Amon then kept walking forward, towards Isa. Smiling at her, he stood beside her. It's been a while, auntie. Did you miss me? Sigh. Isa sighed and inspected his body looking for any injury. You were fine even though there was that explosion? Amon chuckled. What do you think? He took a glance at everyone. I'm strong. Such a puny explosion won't harm me. Well, I'm not surprised. The hidden worry within her eyes vanished. Take some rest. You must be exhausted. The talking can be done later. While they were talking, every marine was looking at Kazara's hand. They had one thought, impossible. The severed hand must mean Kazara died in the explosion. Isa's son, Karna POV. I'm strong. Such a puny explosion won't harm me. This is the man who left when I was a newborn. I remember it because of my photographic memory. People around said he's God, but I used to believe otherwise since gods are supposed to be just myths. But after seeing the things that happened today, after seeing the war take a complete turn after this single dude arrived, I don't have any doubts. It may be that he isn't the God from the myths, but he surely has the power to bear that title for fun. How interesting living beings are. Ah, I wonder how it would feel like to dissect him? Rats and animals aren't fun. I need to dissect a human. He would be purr. Just now, I felt a heavy glare on my back as I abruptly looked. 
It was that woman named Riki. Her eyes were seemingly glowing. Oh, ISA. Suddenly, the man called for my mother. Can I spend some time with Karna later? I would like to play with my brother a little. I have a bad feeling about this. Amon POV. I glanced at the little shit with a smile. I would like to wash up his memory of me, haha. I would feel sad if he can't recall me. ISA punched my arms lightly. Fine, do whatever you want. You just talked with me for a minute and already want to go after him? Yuani only deserves one minute of your busy time. I laughed a little hearing her. Fine, I will have a chat with you for a while more. As I said this, I can see the little shit sighing. I have hypnotized him to obey me and see me as his master from a young age. But the effect wore off since I looked different than before and also the fact that it's been quite a long time. Nonetheless, it will take a single attempt to help him regain who he really is and who is where he stands. But I have to say, the medicines had quite the effect on him. He is that passion of a mad scientist. As I started to chuckle, I felt a hand on my shoulders. The scent of flowers was strong from her hand. Lucy, let's talk. It was Robin. She is making a surprisingly serious face. I shrugged. Wheel. Fine. General POV. MM. Robin was hugging Amon tightly while he was stroking her hair. Is there anything, Robin? Amon asked while enjoying her soft body. It's nothing. Robin stated while her face was resting on his chest. I missed you. As a few seconds passed, Amon smirked. You were too soft for me, love. I know. Minutes passed like that, as the dim light of the room shined on their body. Finally, Robin canceled the hug. Ahem. This wasn't the thing I wanted to tab out. It really is something serious. She said. Amon whispered in her ears. Ask me anything, I will answer. Saying this, he jumped on the soft bed and kept lying on his back. The fight was quite tiring, and then there was his talk with Vivi. It is about the prisoners. Robin also sat on the bed. What plans do you have for them? Robin knew this is a sensitive topic, that's why she brought him on here. Let's not kill them. Robin frowned in suspicion. Taking lies is meaningless when the war has already ended. Humans are such confused creatures. I'm sure the pirates will turn a new leaf if we let them go. Quite yapping. This is a serious topic. Don't joke. Amon crackled up seeing Robin interrupting him. But he was telling the truth. No, I'm serious. I won't kill them. I have plans. He turned around in the bed and placed his head in Robin's lap. Killing them is useless. I gain nothing. Looking down at his clear eyes, Robin frowned. Yes, but if you keep them alive they might hold a grudge. She said. After all, many of their comrades were killed by us. Amon glanced at Robin for a moment. She has grown perfectly. He opened his lips. Indeed, that's the case. But I have ways. If controlling someone's neuron is possible, brainwashing them and making them a loyal pawn is also possible. He kept looking at Robin as a smile bloomed on his face. Bring me the woman named Hina in this room, I will show you what I'm talking about. Robin just looked at him with a given up face. She soon left to get Hina. Chapter 108 My Heart's a Stereo? Many marine and pirates were currently in the upper yard kneeling with their hands shackled by sea stone. Among the many captives, a certain pink hair marine officer was also shackled. It was Hina. Hina kept looking around, trying to find a way out. In the war, many marines had died. Most of the vice admirals were killed. Things changed after Raki had arrived on the battlefield. She was an army of her own. Amidst the shock, Hina was defeated and captured by Robin. She was also knocked out so she didn't witness the explosion and only heard about it. Hina needs to think a way out. It's difficult to hope for a miracle so Hina should prepare for the worst. Even though Hina was thinking tough, she knew getting out of this would be impossible. Hina heard that man, Lucifer, arrived here. Hina was on a different corner, so she didn't see him on arrive with her own eyes. This makes things clear. The fact that warlord Lucifer himself is the king of Skypea. Hina had this suspicion for a while now. She also saw the two world nobles being taken inside a room with two muscular pirate hostages forced to follow them. Hina didn't want to imagine what was happening to the two nobels. Hina bit her lips. If only I was a bit stronger. If only I had stronger hockey. Suddenly, Hina saw the shadow of a person falling over her. Miss Hina, raise your head. It was the voice of Robin. Can I have a bit of your time? She asked while smiling beautifully. Meanwhile, knock knock. I'm coming in. At the shrine, Raki knocked on Amon's door and went inside without waiting for a response. Bro, did you fuck Robin just now? Amon, who was lying on his back glanced at her face with a WTF face. 
You think my stamina is so low to finish so fast? Besides, you think I'm a sex maniac? Why do you talk about fucking every time you see me with a girl? Amon shrugged. For all you know, we can be doing important business. Rakib burst out. Important business my ass. Sex maniac? Yep, you are one. You fucked those bitches from those elemental races, you even had a threesome with the Fire Queen and Fire Princess, didn't you? Why are you silent? I know everything. You even fucked the Fire Queen and Water Queen together, even though they are like natural enemies. Riki stomped on the floor hard. Hey, Riki, don't make it seem like I just passed the four years away like that. All that was to distract me from the training. Amon opposed her instantly. You know how many days are in four years? It's around 1,500 days. Meanwhile, I only had sex 20 times these years. And why are you bringing up all that? No, why do you know about these to begin with? Riki's eyes twitched. I, as Short Motor told me, Amon blinked. You threatened that robot bastard again, didn't you? T that, Riki gulped her words. Forget that. Let me get you straight. You are fucking too many girls at once. Be loyal to one, or at least some, or I will start stealing your girls. Amon sat up and tilted his head. Steal my girls. Yeah, don't underestimate me. I, Riki, guarantee that I will steal your girl. Riki was only halfway done as Amon jumped up from the bed and walked towards her. His face was dark, his eyes cold. Riki's eyes widened as she gulped and took steps back. Soon, she hit a wall. Riki gulped again as he walked towards her and placed his hand on the wall as well, pinning her against it. He leaned his face towards her ears. Riki closed her eyes in fear. If you steal my girls, then I will steal you, sis. His lips formed a grin. You haven't seen enough of me yet. That's the only thing he said but Riki felt her head starting to spin. A stupid brother. Don't talk nonsense. She pushed Amon back and ran through the door. On her way, she met Robin. Amon glanced at her back with an empty face. She is the easiest girl, that's why I haven't touched her yet. Keeping her like this, hungry, would be best for now. Meanwhile, Robin glanced as Riki ran past her with a red face. What happened to her? Deciding to ignore this for a second, she pulled the shackles of the person behind her. Walk faster, he must be tired of waiting. Tisk. The person, Hina, clicked her tongue and spat on the ground. Not long after, they reached the room where Amon was. Amon was reading a book while humming. Whom my heart's a stereo. Listening to his happy tone, Hina's brows furrowed. That voice. It's really him. He changed quite a lot over the years. She felt strange for a while before the strange feeling had taken the form of anger. A criminal such as him should be captured immediately. She knew about the dirty works of wingless Valkyries, but her rank isn't high enough to do anything against him, a warlord. But, it beats for you so listen close. Lucifer, your end is near. Hina interrupted Amon. The marine reinforcements will come here soon enough. It is a bad move for you to keep us alive. You defeated one admiral, it certainly is a feat, but you must be tired enough to fight another. Hina didn't know much about Amon versus Kazaru, about how Amon completely won one-sidedly. So she was acting like this. After a brief silence, Amon again started to sing as he closed his book and looked at Hina. My heart's a stereo. It beats for you so listen close. Amon started to hum lightly as Hina kept frowning. It's been a long time, Hina-chan. Amon missed you a lot. My heart's a stereo. It beats for you so listen close. Hina felt her heart clutch itself for a second. It was like meeting your first love after a long time. Yet, he treats you the same he used to. Hina bit her lips while Amon kept singing. Holding grudge against love is an ancient artifact? Meanwhile, in a corner of the building, Riki was standing against the wall, her breathing fast and a smile on her face. Then, should I steal one of his girls? Her eyes shined, but she soon covered her face. So embarrassing. Though, soon she recalled something particular from four years ago. Dash, sister, can we talk about Big Brother a little? That day, Isa called her and talked about. Amon. Talked a lot about him. Riki even slapped Isa saying she talked too much. Riki's smile gradually disappeared as she looked down. Let's not. Think about that. She can always be wrong. Riki felt her heart tighten greatly. My heart's a stereo. Shut up. Don't sing. Hina yelled as Amon went silent. Soon enough, a smile bloomed on his face. You are so refreshing, Hina-chan. You are the same as you were eight years ago. Amon smiled with his teeth revealing. Man, now that I look back. It's been a long time. Amon glanced at Robin for a while who was deeply frowning. Sis, can you leave us alone for a moment? 
After making a hesitating face, Robin nodded with a sigh. Not long after, only Amon and Hina were in the room. What do you want? Hina asked, still frowning. M.M., guess. Amon was sitting on the bed while his chin was resting on his hand. Maybe I will do something special if you successfully guess. A few seconds passed as Hina opened her lips. You want to take? Hina's chastity? Amon chuckled hearing her. Although I'd love to, I'm sure you won't allow it. Surprisingly, I'm not into rape. Hina was silent hearing him. She thought of some other possibilities. Then is it? M.H.H. You had one chance. You can't try anymore. Amon interrupted her. Amon laughed hearing her. Hina, I have memories with you. Memory is what makes a human, so I will be honest with it and give you a chance. Amon stared right into her eyes. It's an offer. Join me against the Marines. No. Amon got up and walked towards her. Hina didn't move from her spot like Riki. Walking closer, Amon then placed his hands on her head. Hina seemed to hate his hand on her head, though Amon didn't care at all. It's sad you didn't accept my offer. I have to try the hard way then. Hina clenched her jaws. Try what? Amon didn't answer. He rather closed his eyes. Thunder eyes. He inserted electricity in her brain, connecting to her nerves. Hina's eyes grew up. She felt her body lose control to an otherworldly force. Meanwhile, Amon was inside her mind, one step away from reading her memories. It will take me a few more months, or maybe years to gain enough control to read memories using this technique. Though for now, it wasn't a problem. Amon wasn't here to read her mind. After all, there is no need to. She will tell everything by herself. The first thing Amon did was take out a pocket watch and move it in front of her eyes, thus making her go into sleep. Her bright eyes soon became dull. Before going to sleep, Hina's mind had one line ringing. Her body was now completely under Amon's control. He glanced at Hina's face for a second. The next process is quite flawed. It will erase Hina from existence. Her body will be here. Her body will be alive. She will be able to move, talk, and even think. But in the end, she won't be Hina anymore. It will be more like an empty robot doing roleplay using the memories provided to it. Goodbye, Hina, Chan, Z, 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 Z. As Amon increased the flow of electricity and directed the electricity through specific neurons using his thunder eyes, Hina's body jolted a few times before, completely stopping her movement. Thud. Hina fell on her, but Amon pushed his hand down along with her. Amon destroyed a few specific neurons which used to make Hina, Hina. These memories used to make her different from other humans. They were the root of personality. He also damaged the neurons which let one process emotion. Amon also set her brain to obey all commands made by him after he uses a secret code using his hypnotic abilities. Amon then slowly averted his gaze from within her brain to her face. He has killed people before, he killed many, but this certain action made even him feel a little strange. Though he quickly shook his head, minutes passed in silence as Amon sighed and ordered her. Wake up, Hina. Stand up. Hina's dull eyes returned to normal. She stood up as well, but she just stared ahead with the emotionless face. Who are you? Hina's lips widened. I am. Marine Commodore Hina. Chapter 109, basically. I am. Marine Commodore Hina. I stared at the eyes of the woman, Hina. I've spent almost 20 years in this world. From the point where all these people were fictional to me, to this point. Standing in front of the person I overlapped with a blank page. Actually. Rather than thinking it like this, the clearer way to explain Hina's condition would be to call it a software update, a massive update for the software called Hina. In the update, the software, Hina, was changed but the hardware was still the same. In reality, Hina isn't the only specimen, I have some spies like her among the Marines. They were exactly the people who let me know about the WG's suspiciousness about me. Achieving this goal was easier than I had initially thought. But there is a problem with this. I can accidentally kill a person while using this technique, so I refrained from doing so most of the time. I necessarily didn't care about Hina, so I tried it on her. That doesn't mean I can use this on Shirahoshi or Boa Hancock. Sad. I loosened my lips. Hina. Hina's eyes focused on me. You are not supposed to say, I, get it? She would be very suspicious if she talks like that. Use the third person to refer to yourself. Don't miss these important details. Use your memory. I don't want to correct you another time. Hina slowly opened her lips, but her words only came out a few seconds after that. Hina understands. I patted her shoulders. Good. Start simulating your memory to not mess up like this again. 
or you will be punished severely. Although I did say the word punish very lightly, she made a heavy face. Her gulping sound didn't take long until it reached my ears. Hina can't feel any emotion, though. In specific situations, she would imitate the reaction that she should have as a normal person. But either way, she isn't completely emotionless because as long as she's around me, she would feel the emotion fear, though only for me. Meanwhile, while she is not in with me, she is a fearless beast. A killing machine who would attack without caring about her life. Though she is ordered to not act like that always, and only activate that mode in critical situations. I again patted her shoulders. Anyway, Hina, someone will be coming through the door. You have to greet her respectively, all right? Instantly, Hina nodded lightly. Then looking at the door, I called out. Robin, I'm done. Come inside. Just as I said this, Robin pushed the door and walked inside. Instantly, Hina about a 90 degrees bow to Robin. Welcome, master's sister. I see. She caught on the word sis when I referred to Robin last time. The human brain is indeed interesting. Robin flinched seeing Hina bow like that. First, she glanced at my smiling face before she shuddered. What happened to her? She seems a little different. I stayed silent while looking at her. I did say I have plans on the captives. Robin seemed to frown hearing me. Her questioning eyes were screaming. What happened? I just made a stern face. There was no reason to act childish with her. Hey, I can't reveal all the cards to you. I paused. Look at it like this. What if someone kidnaps you? Let's an emperor capture you, and then use a devil fruit to read your mind? That would be devastating, correct? Robin seemed to make a dejected face. Rolling my eyes inwardly, I walked behind her and hugged her tightly, as I bit her ears lightly. Try to understand, okay? Robin's body jerked on my teeth which had electricity flowing through. She seemed to enjoy everything I did to her now. She then removed my hands and looked away. We will continue this later. First, let's finish the job here. Robin pushed Amon away and patted her jacket. This woman did say reinforcements will come here. Indeed, Hina did mention that. I then looked at her. Hina, tell me more about what you know about the reinforcements. Basically, basically, when Marines on the ship learned that the Sky People were attacking the nobles, they let the news out to HQ and asked for reinforcements. In response, the fleet admiral permitted a buster call, though he didn't say anything about sending another admiral. However, since there were no other reports from this side, the reinforcements would most likely be more than what was asked at first. Nonetheless, even then, for the marines to leave the HQ and go to the West Blue, then reach the summit of the West, it will take at least three days to finally reach Skypea. Three days. So we had that many days to prepare for the fight, this time the casualties would be smaller than before as well. However, I don't want to fight anymore. There is no gain from any of the new fights. I gained everything that I wanted, and all that was free real estate since I never thought all this would happen after the chief pulled the shitty ceremony. That's right, I need to have a chat with the chief later. Anyway, rather than preparing for another battle, I should think about how to avoid this. Looking at Hina's eyes while my head was resting on Robin's lap, I opened my lips. Listen here, Hina. We will make a plan. You will try your best to free Marines and run away with them. That way, the fleet admiral would ask you many questions. You have to say everything I teach you. Is that clear? My personal zero two nodded. Yes. I grinned. Through Robin's clear blue eyes, I could see it wasn't a pleasant one. Fuck it. It was finally time to stop playing the game as a warlord. I will pull a black beard on those bastards. General POV. Whoa. Stop them. Shoot. The Shandians were busy hunting the marines who were somehow freed and currently running towards their ship. Don't worry, we already destroyed their ships. Wait, one of our ships is missing. Shit, one of them stole it. But how? Up until an hour ago, marines were being taken inside the shrine, confusing everyone. When about 20% of the marines were taken, a break happened and they started to run from the shrine. Not only that, the other marines were magically freed as well. It seemed like the work of a devil fruit. It was quite confusing how they were able to run from Amon's presence, but assuming that the previous battle tired him down, the winged people were now trying to stop the break themselves. The pirates weren't freed, though they were looking expectantly at the marines who just ignored them and ran. Bang. Bang. The sky sharpshooters started to shoot towards the jailbreakers, thus killing some and missing some, though the mobs made it possible for the high rankers to reach the stolen ship successfully. Damn, they're getting away. Our people are recovering, so we didn't even have our full force. Talk less, shoot more. Bang, bang. 
While they kept shooting, the Marines were able to barely run away. The reason was that the Shandia was on the recovering side and didn't expect an outbreak like this. After all, their lord is omniscient, he should have seen this coming. Unfortunately, their lord was the one behind the outbreak, to begin with. This will make sense to the fleet admiral more than, the ruler of Skypea was kind, so they let us go. Through today's action, Amon had many spies inside the Marine HQ. He would be under their nose, while they would never ever even think of this case. This was particularly easy. However, there was a rule, if you want to fool the enemy, fool your ally first. That's why he didn't reveal all this to the Shandians. After all, the thing he said to Robin about getting her mind read can actually happen to any of the people here. Amon looked down from the air for a while before starting to fly around the forest. He was looking for something in the forest where he has planted thousands of different fruit trees over the years. A perfect spot for devil fruit spawning. Meanwhile, Ina was in the ship which had gone far from here already. See, Commodore, we should let the HQ know of this quickly. All the vice admirals were killed. Now you need to lead us from here. Hina was breathing heavily from the chase. Huff, huff. Hina gets it, call them. Hina will talk. Gasping for breath, Hina answered while lying on the ship with her arms spread on the floor. Nobody would ever doubt her. She was like a program under a computer from whom she can't disobey any order. Not long after, the marine soldier connected to the HQ through a din din mushy, and soon after ringing for a while, the call was picked. Hello, Sangoku speaking. In the Marine HQ, Marine Ford, two old men were sitting in the Fleet Admiral's office. Hello, Sangoku speaking. One of them was the Fleet Admiral himself, Sangoku who was speaking to a snail. It's Commodore Hina. The person on the other side said. Meanwhile, Hey, Sangoku, it's that brat Hina. She said she had something to talk about with me after she returns from this mission. Besides Sangoku, another old man, Marine Hirogarp was sitting when eating crackers. But then there was the world noble humiliation stream from Skypea. I wonder what she reports she will make this time, crunch. Garp seemed chill even after he heard the news. In fact, he was happy. He would have liked to see the face of the man who did all of this. Sangoku controlled himself from screaming. All this will come in his shoulders. He rather focused on Hina's report. Commodore, speak. The situation is terrible here. We were defeated. We were captured and kept as hostages for a while. Garp stopped eating. Defeating a marine amounting to a buster call will need some power, but that's impossible when an admiral intervenes. Just around an hour ago, Hina was able to escape with a few surviving marines. Hina proposes the reinforcements should stop, or their condition would be similar to ours. Sengoku slammed the table. What about Kazara? Don't tell me you didn't reach the sky yet. The stream ended before Kazara reached the sky. Garp frowned while Sengoku was shouting. He didn't believe Kazara would be late. Even if it's him, he won't procrastinate so much. There must be some other reason. And his question was answered by Hina the next moment. Admiral Kazaro was defeated and most probably killed as well. Garp and Sengoku's eyes arched up. Garp was about to choke on his food. Cough. Sengoku, ask her about the details. This is a serious situation. The death of an admiral isn't something to take lightly. I know, I know. Now shut up. My head is itching. Hina, tell us everything in detail. Don't leave anything, Sangoku asked, already expecting to hear the intervention of an emperor. Things started like this. Are you actually saying that Lucifer killed Kazaro? No emperors were interfering? If that's the case, if Lucifer really was emperor level, then he will have to call back the buster call. Hina is only guessing from the massive explosion. Hina also saw Admiral's severed arm in that man's hand. Sangoku stayed silent for a while before opening his mouth. We will talk more after you reach the HQ. For now, rest. I will still send reinforcements. They will give you the medical support needed. Hina understands. Beep. The call ended as heavy silence fell upon the room. Just the Garo Garo Nomi should be enough to grant him a 500 million bounty. But he is a master of six powers as well. And even his wing fighting style is dangerous. Sengoku started to label out everything written under Amon's name. He should be equal or more dangerous than my hawk. So 500 million is too measly. After all, he is definitely faster than Kazara to have injured him to that extent, and he did all that to those nobles. Garp frowned as he placed his snacks on the table. The noble might even ask for a 10 billion bounty, but that would break the balance. We need to be careful with the bounty. Garp was right. If a young emperor suddenly had bounties surpassing the old ones, they will definitely target him. Although this might seem like a wait, isn't that better? Plan. It's like summoning the devil. 
They assumed, after Amon would have gotten defeated, the emperors might ally or start a war among themselves. Either way, it would have been a bad decision. Then are you saying we should rate him above 2 billion as his first bounty? If that really happens, then he would be instantly classified as an emperor because of his alliance and influence throughout the world. Garp has a few occasional meetups with Amon, and they had a favorable relationship as well. But a criminal is a criminal. Sengoku got up from his seat. That's all for later. The first thing we need to do is to get back the nobles from there. I heard he still has them in his hands. Garp yawned. Yes, it's a bad move to keep them hostage. I know it better than anyone. If he doesn't let them go, the old dogs will probably send me or you there. Sengoku nodded silently. That's what I'm saying. The government will do anything to get the nobles back. But if they are dead, Sengoku shook his head. Anyway, Garp, I will notify the elders quickly. Though I believe they will send us anyway after that lift stream. Sengoku sighed and nodded and left the room. Gap sighed in disappointment. Kid, what you did is a bad move. This world is too harsh for a brat like you. Shaking his head, he picked up his snacks. But I won't go easy on you. Meanwhile, in the upper yard, the Alabasta guests were preparing to leave. Cobra was shaking his hands with Amon. Lucifer, it's sad that such a celebration was ruined like that. But we need to leave now. We would have stayed for a few more days. But after what happened, but the Marines might come to Alabasta since we are allied. Anon nodded. He, along with a few other people, were on the shore, bidding farewell to Cobra and Vivi. It's fine, father-in-law. I would have loved to talk about Vivi and my marriage, but this is a bad situation. Amon stated, Though I'm eager to know what you would do about this marriage after this incident. You are aware, we will be targeted by the world government and many other problems will also occur. Cobra made a hesitating face. I know. I need some time to think. Cobra knew that Alabasta might not be spared from this as well, so he wasn't instantly rejecting the offer. If things look bad, it's better to be together. After witnessing Amon's devastating powers, he won't mind taking his side if Marines do decide to target them as well. Amon smiled reassuringly. Do not worry, I will make sure to make the government go after you guys as well. It all depends on the political games. Then, we will take our leave. Behind Cobra, Vivi peeked at Amon's face with red cheeks. Though she again hid behind Cobra after Raki glared at her. Let's see what happens. Contact me if you want to meet me, father-in-law. I will instantly be there. Cobra nodded lightly and took back his hand. Not long after, they left by the third royal ship. Amon stared at the ship as it finally left the range of normal eyes. By now, the old elders would be decking to launch Garp or Sengoku here. Let's give Mariehua a visit, shall we? Amon glanced at the people behind him. Riki, look after the sky. I will be back in a few hours. Z z z z. Amon teleported under everyone's eyes, but... Z z z. Oh, also, Amon re-teleported here. Ask Motor Gang to fix my baby, bike. It's terribly injured since I went overboard to reach here as soon as possible. Amon didn't wait for them to answer and teleported again. He had a bag on his side, a few camera dial on them. Chapter 110. Bounty. Silence. In a hall room situated in the Mariehua, the five elders were sitting opposite to the Navy Fleet Admiral with a table in the middle. It was a silent and heavy atmosphere. This is a grave situation. The first to break the silence was an elder. He was bald. He seemed enraged as even his old face full of wrinkles looked reddish. A world noble was humiliated in front of the whole world. A hey. world noble. It is simply unforgivable. Sengoku has let the elders know about the information Hina provided. Even then, the Baldi didn't even care about the fact that an admiral was killed. This was a more serious situation to him and to the world. Sengoku, the Baldi called out. Sengoku sighed, already knowing his next words. Meanwhile, the other elders stayed silent. They had the same thoughts as Baldi, talking too much was meaningless. Send Garp to Skypea. All the world nobles are already enraged. They will be more if we don't present the head of that bastard before them. Overall, it will leave a major effect on the world. The nobles will try to gain back their pride by showing dominance to the civilians. It will be the worst situation. Sengarp, or you go there yourself. I won't rely on an admiral anymore. Sengoku stayed silent hearing them. He couldn't find any excuse to refuse them. This was a serious situation, serious enough to force the marine hero to fight. Sigh, though he still tried to think of another way. We should not rush like that since Lucifer still has the three nobles on his grasp. 
He may kill them if we try to force. The elder knitted his burrows. Sengoku was right. Although this was a serious matter, if the nobles were killed, it will evolve into a dangerous one. All the marines will be forced to go after Lucifer, which can weaken the HQ. At that time, the emperors might make a move. Things will be out of control and completely chaotic if that happens. Actually, Golden Buddha is right. ZZZ. Suddenly, everyone in the room heard a voice coming from up. Their eyes grew. Someone invaded Marihoy's under our nose? They abruptly looked up, but they found nothing. Look down. The same voice again sounded, this time it came from the same level as them. Again, they abruptly looked at their side, the empty sofa. Yo, it's been five years since we met like this. Though the room didn't change much, I guess nobles like to keep things clean, huh? In front of them, the man they were talking about was sitting with one leg above the other, looking around the room carefully. Lucifer. After a short silence, the bald elder rushed ahead at full speed, swinging his sword towards Amon's neck. Slash. The sword touched Amon's skin, but... ZZZT. It just passed through his body as if he was an illusion. What? The elder was surprised. But I used armament on the sword. Amon just used the flash's phasing techniques, though he can do something similar to Katakuri as well. You cheeky little bastard. The elder didn't stop. Rather, the other four elders also rushed towards Amon with their weapons unsheathed. All of them used their weapons, fists, and started to attack Amon. Sword slash. Sure gone. Tempest kick. Zynix punch. Wooden impact. ZZZZ. Amon dodged all the attacks using Ultra Instinct. Later, by teleporting in the air, he then decided to con them. Hey, hey, calm down. Aren't you curious why I came here to spite? No one is curious. Now die. The elders didn't listen at all and rushed towards Amon again. Meanwhile, Sengoku was just observing the match with wide eyes. It was clear to him, Amon was playing them. The five elders were being played by a young man. After being rejected, Amon's childish smile disappeared as he just silently stared down at the five elders. One might question, how strong were these five elders, the epitome of world government? The answer was simple, they were monstrously strong. Each of them was stronger than an admiral but weaker than a fleet admiral because of their age. So Amon was being chased by five admiral plus level people, but he didn't seem worried. He was confident enough to run away, and the ability to escape is everything to a person like him. A spherical orb formed around Amon's body as his face darkened and his eyes shined red. The elders were surprised for a second. Was that intimidation they felt? Impossible. Amon targeted the bald elder and gripped his fist which was wearing a golden knuckle duster. He came here prepared. While the five elders rushed towards him, Amon rushed towards the bald specifically with his fist glowing. One out of ten speed. The world went slow. This was Amon's battlefield. The wind started to swirl around Amon's fist. Wind style, rail gun punch. Amon hit the guy in his bald head, bending it inward slightly. Although this wasn't flashy like his 700 million volts punch, it was enough since he only wanted to calm him down. Bam. With a hit in the head, the elder flew backward, hitting the wall. A crater was formed even in this sturdy wall. Asterisk spit asterisk. Spitting a tooth, the elder just stood up as if nothing happened. Now I can see how you killed Kazara. Saying this, the elder again rushed forward. However, wait. Sengoku stepped in the middle. He is right. It's something to think about. Why is he here? We should hear him out first. He still has the nobles in his grasp. The bald didn't want to listen and prepared to dash forward, but the hand of another elder on his shoulder made him skeptical. Arg, fine. Just this once. Amon just walked back to the sofa and sat down like before, as if everything that happened until now was a dream. The bald elder then walked to his own seat and sat down. You have five minutes, say anything and everything you want. After the time is up, don't think of leaving this place with your life. Amon just glanced at him before starting to surf his side back. He took out a camera dial and tossed it to the elder swiftly. The elder caught with a frown. What is the meaning of this? Amon picked up a biscuit which was already served on the table in front. Play it, you will see. After a certain amount of time, the elder did as he asked. Beep. The video with two actors in it started to play. Ah. Uh, Someone stopped this filthy beast. In the video, a horse was doing things it shouldn't with a female celestial dragon. It hurts. As someone. Eh. It hurts. Bam. The elder instantly crushed the camera by bashing it on the table and prepared to attack Amon yet again. Wait, wait, wait. But Amon just raised his hands as a gesture. 
I've thousands of digital and physical copies of that. In two hours, if I don't return, my trusty assistant is supposed to stream this clip throughout the world. I'm sure you don't want that to happen, right? Amon lied about his assistant. Gur. The elder groaned while his hands holding the hilt of the sword shook. He wanted to kill the man in front tight now. How dare he do that to a world noble? But if what he said was true, killing him would only help the anger of his, not the anger of world nobles. They will be more enraged seeing their kin like that. The old man released a big breath and sat down. What do you want, you devil bastard? Amon spat on the floor. Devil bastard? Look, I was just protecting my land. My kingdom. I'm a warlord. I was doing a good job too, but you guys had to mess it up. Like why? Why can't those fat bastards calm down? They wanted to make my people. My people their slaves. You think I will sit around still? Be grateful I didn't kill them already, fukling idiots. The old elders listened to his rant with a frown. That said, let's proceed to what you should generously hand over as compensation. Amon grinned. He had many desires to be fulfilled today. Hours later. Was it a good idea to grant him everything he asked for? The bald elder was asking the elder with a big grayed out beard. Amon asked for many things, but they weren't completely absurd and somewhat grantable in exchange for the dignity of world government and celestial dragons. The bald elder slammed the table. Amon has already left the hall by now. Even after taking all that, he said he will only hand over Brasiado and Ainsworth. He doesn't want to hand over the lady. He gritted his odd teeth. Not only that, but he said he won't also destroy the clips. Then what's the point of doing this? Why suck up to him? Another elder slammed the table. He said he will take over Grant Azaro and asked us to suppress that news. Do we look like his dogs? Sigh. The bearded elder sighed. You don't get it. We underestimated him. We are at the losing end no matter what. So we should better be on the side with most promises. Don't forget, nothing is important more than the dignity of world nobles. Try to think what will happen to the government if that clip is leaked? Although he seemed to have given up in the presence of Sangoku, his eyes were readable by other elders. We will have to talk with Imasama. Reading this message, the bald elder sighed lightly. He recalled Amon's strange but absurd request six years ago. It was the number four condition. Never let the Kuja pirates become a part of the warlord system. Rather, make Kuja pirates a part of my guild. They are to be exempt from their previous sins. But make sure that they are not aware of that. This was what he asked for. And it didn't seem like much of a surprise seeing a hormonal teenager being interested in beautiful women. But why hide it? If he hides it then won't all his heroic deeds be hidden under a cloud, thus failing his goal? None of the elders knew. Back then they only guessed Amon had a special sexual condition. But after six years, after hearing his new demands, they knew it wasn't as simple as it looked back then. Just what goes inside that bastard's mind? Nevertheless, he would be finished as long as Imasama takes action. What will Amon do when the strongest being on the planet decides to play with him? Or, have Amon already foreseen this event? Hey. Suddenly, an elder pointed at the seat Amon was sitting. Isn't that a dial? Looks like the kid dropped it. An elder walked to Amon's seat and picked up the dial. There was a paper note attached to the dial. Hello, this one contains the clip of two celestial dragons making love with two bulky men. Feel free to relive yourselves, smiley face. The elder tore the paper and slammed the dial on the ground. Lucifer. Like that. Three days passed. Hina had reached the HQ and reported everything she saw in detail. Sengoku was overcome with more fear after hearing the events of the incident. Kazars was still healing. He will take around another week to fully heal and prove that he isn't dead. Amon is supposed to let the two celestial dragons go after his bounty is announced. Currently, Amon was in the upper yard, inside the training hall with only a few people around. Amon was standing on the other side of a table, with a few birkins on the other side. On the table, devil fruits were kept. There were exactly five devil fruits. Amon has prepared many trees in the upper yard. All the trees can grow various types of fruits, so there was a chance of devil fruits spawning their most. However, this world has millions and billions of different types of fruit. The fruit trees in the upper yard can't even cover 1% of all the existing variety. And since devil fruits only spawn on a similarly looking fruit, it mostly depended on luck to find the devil fruit of a person who died in the upper yard. That's why Amon asks what the enemy's fruit looked like most of the time, though in this war that couldn't happen. So Amon only got five devil fruits this time from the thousands of people who died. Amon looked at the people in front of him, then he picked the leftmost fruit and tossed it forward. Ah. Sumi caught the fruit with her eyes shining. 
This was a precious fruit. How can he throw it? Though she didn't question out loud. Amon laughed hearing her internal thoughts. Amon ordered. Eat the fruit. Yeah. Sumi looked around. You mean, me? As Amon nodded, a sly smile bloomed on Sumi's face. She assumed all her conning had finally taken effect. Eat it. After Amon's second command, Sumi instantly raised the fruit towards her now wide open mouth. She didn't know what type of ability she will get, but she was fine with anything. Wait. Suddenly, Amon called as Sumi stopped. My, lord. Sumi looked ahead, confused. Amon picked another fruit and threw it forward. Sumi barely caught it with her hand already having another fruit in it. Now, give me that fruit. Try eating the new one. Again confused, Sumi gave Amon the previous fruit and proceeded to eat the other one. However, even this time when she was about to take a bite, Amon called out. Wait, not that too. Amon threw her another fruit which Sumi caught yet again. Sumi made a bitter face. Is he trying to tease me? Or just giving me false hope? Sighing, she returned the other fruit and proceeded to eat the fruit. She was expecting another stop from Amon, but Amon didn't call. Crunch. Sumi, still expecting a shout, but the fruit engulfed it. Arg. This tastes bad. As a priest, Sumi didn't curse. But she wanted it this time. Amon nodded his head. Good, Sumi. There is no need to eat the whole thing if you want. That you should eat it expecting a miracle. Sumi didn't want to eat. But seeing the low-ranking priest behind her, she proceeded to eat the whole fruit, trying to preserve her pride. Besides Sumi, Yona, whose hand was bandaged, was also there. It was a miracle how she healed such an injury in two days. High-tech medical equipment truly is overpowered. Sumi stayed silent for a few seconds before raising her hand. I feel. Her olive skin started to pale. Awesome. Sea crunch. The air froze in front of her. Cold, cold fruit. This one is awesome. Sumi got Cooler's cold, cold fruit. Sumi seemed particularly happy with what she got. This was seemingly a battle of luck since nobody knew which fruit had which powers, not even Amon, at least not until Sumi proceeded to raise the fruit to her mouth. Future sight. That was why he stopped Sumi from eating the two fruits. He knew they were not suitable for her. Amon saw the future where Sumi has eaten the other fruits. He found out what powers the fruit held. This is not good enough to implant in battle since I need to focus for three seconds and can only see less than a minute in the future. Amon thought. If he used it against Kazaru, he would have died. I didn't need to face any life-death situation to get this one unlike the other two forms of hockey. Observation is my proud side, that's why. Indeed, he achieved this ability with sheer training. There was no need to face an enemy who Amon was struggling against, since after all, no one is faster than him anyway, thus no need for a better way to dodge. Ah ha ha ha. Sumi was laughing as if this was one of her happiest days. Her red cheeks and sweet smile caught the attention of some people, though they quickly looked away. Air freeze. Sumi cried as the air around froze, snow starting to fall. This was awesome. While everyone was looking at her with jealous or congratulating eyes, among the crowd, Yona was looking at her with her hardly readable expression. She just stared at her for a second before her eyes became soft. She glanced at Amon. Her expectant eyes were clear to Amon. But Amon completely ignored her. Now, you four come forward. Amon called out the other priest, like Om, Sutra, and their group walked forward. Yona opened her lips to say something, but she didn't in the end. She just smiled lightly and looked down. It was then, Yona sensed someone running here. She frowned and went to see who it was. Yona was surprised to get the news from the guy who came here running. With a paper in her hand, she ran towards Amon with a cheerful expression. She was aware of the bounty system and knew about the highest bounties that were public. So this was... My lord. My Kami. Her cheerful and excited shout attracted everyone's attention. Amon looked at her as his eyes fell upon the poster in her hand. My lord, you got the bounty of. Chapter 111. Rise of the Sky Emperor. Dress Rosa, Royal Palace, the Don Quixote family. Doflamingo was sitting on a chair with one leg above another. A grin was forming on his face while he had the newspaper in his hand. Coo, coo, coo. Celestial Dragon's bootlicking clip viral. Two celestial dragons were seen running as dogs in Skypea. Daffy read out loud. By now, the news of the celestial dragon incident in the sky was known throughout the world. No one was left in the dark about it. Doflamingo was busy with underworld work, so he was reading yesterday's newspaper. The famous Miss All Sunday is none other than Devil Child, Nico Robin. Oh, this is a piece of interesting news. Kaido will be interested in her. 
Daffy then proceeded to read the next news. Lucifer lost his warlord position. Who will be the new candidate? Meanwhile, Kazari's defeat was suppressed by the government. So people were still seeing Amon as a weakling. Reading all the headlines, Daffy scratched his cheek. Lucifer lost his position. It was predictable from the beginning that he will do something like that. Cuckoo. Sad bastard. Suddenly, um, Da Flamingo looked at the sky. A bird was flying. It was a news albatross. It was carrying today's newspaper. Da Flamingo knew today Lucifer's new bounty will be revealed. It is so late since something happened in the Mariawa that he doesn't know. Lucifer's new bounty. He was interested. He felt some kind of friendly connection with Amon since he humiliated the world nobles, the people Daffy hates. If he has a good bounty, then he might propose an alliance to him. Your enemy's enemy is your friend. Thinking this, Daffy caught the newspaper that the duck threw using his strengths. Coincidentally, his eyes fell on the last page of the newspaper, his eyes grew up, and he jumped up from his seat. Death of Admiral Cazaro, Borsellino. How did Lucifer manage to defeat the fastest man alive? Da Flamingo couldn't believe his eyes. He felt cold sweat dripping down his back. Daffy was strong, but he couldn't imagine defeating an admiral, at least not Kazara. Daffy read the contents of the said news. A question popped up in his head. Why was this news printed today? It should have been printed two days ago. He was confused. The answer was simple. The government tried to suppress the news, but Morgan was too intrigued by the things he saw on his trip. He would never let this news die under a rock. His journalist spirit won't let it happen. So he went against the government, just like he always does. With sweat forming on his forehead, Daffy turned the newspaper around and focused on the headline. What? Another shout escaped his lips. This attracted the other donks out pirates of the palace. The headline was like this. Birth of the Fifth Emperor of the Sea. Lucifer's real name, Amon. The rise of the Fifth Emperor, Amon, with the bounty of 2.4 billion bellies, dead. Daffy was only standing in the spot with sweat falling down his face. In Mariehua, in a massive hall with a high staircase, the famous empty throne stood. There were exactly twenty swords in front of the throne, they were rusty and old. However, the so-called empty throne wasn't empty today. Imasama, what should we do with this man? A being clad in white was sitting on the empty throne. At the footing under the staircase, the five elders were bowing, their head touching the ground. They were bowing to the being, the being wearing a golden crown. Silently sitting on the empty throne, the figure was looking at the poster on its hand. Minutes passed. A courageous elder decided to open his mouth. Imasama. Imu, the being whose gender was unknown, just stayed silent at their call. It was almost as if Imu left this time and entered another dimension. Another few minutes passed while the being stared down with its blood-red eyes. While its gaze was falling on the elders, they shivered. After a few minutes, a genderless voice sounded. It is not time yet. The voice was both masculine and feminine. The elders felt their heart calm down hearing the soothing voice. It was not the time yet. Only the being knew what that meant. The elders nodded with their bit of understanding. We understand, Imasama. Skypea, City of Gold, Shandora. Upper Ard was declared as Shandora yesterday by Amon. The City of Gold has regained its previous status in the world. It was only waiting to progress more. In my Kami, Yona rushed towards Amon with her eyes shining. Her previously down self was nowhere to be seen. My Kami, Yona stood in front of Amon. Her eyes were shining as she presented the bounty poster to Amon. Look, look, you got a bounty. Instantly, the people around started to chatter. Amon has made them well known with worldly affairs, so they knew what a bounty meant. Although there were people with a very high number of bounty, they knew they aren't greater than their god. Amon accepted the poster. His eyes shined instantly as he counted the number of zero on the poster. He then looked at his picture. In the poster, Amon was smiling. His face was clad in blood, but his white teeth were a perfect match with his olive skin. His red eyes were looking directly at the other party's eyes. Amon grinned seeing this. Yona looked at the crowd. Everyone. Our Kami got a bounty too. She took a deep breath. A bounty of 2.4 billion belly. Only dead. Although it's quite small compared to other big names, don't forget this is our Kami's first bounty. This is a big step towards divinity of our lord. Yona seemed happier than anyone else. This made Amon smile. Her loyalty was enough to give that to her. Amon's mind was busy thinking. 2.4 billion is very high for a first bounty, but pretty meh if I consider everything I did. The celestial dragons probably wanted to force a high bounty on me, but was rejected at the end. Still, 
It was good that he got this high a bounty, after all, if he was going to get a bounty anyway, it was better to get a high one than low. Meanwhile, after this news, most of the guild members left the guild. Though many of them stayed too, they were already doing dirty works under the guilds after all. This will only benefit them more. Not to mention, my alliance with many countries makes me dangerous. I don't think any of the kingdom will try to take back their alliance if I gain the fifth emperor with my name to it. Guys, don't be happy yet. That's not the end. Ah, dash. Amon was interrupted by Yona who took a deep breath, preparing to read the headline of the newspaper out loud. Are I see of the fifth emperor? Yes. Our Kami is the fifth powerhouse of the world. The Kaderi Yona had a rarely seen happy smile on her face. Her cheeks were red out of excitement. Even her purple eyes were shining. Amon smirked hearing this. My bounty surpassed 1.5 billion marks of Can and Luffy after all. Not that I didn't demand the title myself. Among the many things he asked the elders of, this was a thing. Though he would have gotten it anyway without asking. Just that, unlike Luffy, Amon was officially announced an emperor by the government. Besides, he would have gotten the title anyway. The Garo Garo Nomi itself is enough to grant him a 500 million bounty, but according to Hina's report, because of the explosion Amon made in the sky, the government assumed Amon awakened his fruit too. Taking all this into account, everything made sense. Not only that, Yona screamed again. Unlike other emperors, our Kami has a special title. The Sky Emperor, Amon. A short silence. Yay! Yeah, everyone screamed. They seemed happy hearing that. By now, most of the people have gathered in the training hall. Even Robin was amongst the crowd. She seemed to wipe her teary eyes. She was truly happy. She had one thought. I will always be by your side. Amon glanced at Robin. He wanted to laugh a little, but he controlled himself. He then decided to make an announcement. Everyone, Amon called out. To celebrate this event, I will train you personally for a week. Everyone became ecstatic hearing this. Why, why, wait. They stopped midway from shouting happily. They had a thought. Isn't this a bad thing for our bones? And oh well. In the corner of the room, Wiper had a poster in his hand. A small smile on his face. The bounty was not as high as Amon, but it made him happy at least. Meanwhile, in the Big Mom territory, Big Mom herself was reading a newspaper. A rare sight to behold. Fifth Emperor? Mamma Mia. A kid who was still wet behind the ears. Mamma Mia. Big Mom laughed out loudly. This was an interesting development. Though it would be interesting to see how long he can keep that title. Mama. The other emperor has similar reactions, especially Whitebeard. Wahaha. <laughs> Whitebeard laughed while gulping sake. Roger. It seems our generation has already ended. Wahaha. <laughs> the Yonko would now have a new name on the list. The name, Amon. This name will be written a lot starting from now on. Many kingdoms associated with the guild wanted to cut ties, but after getting this news, they were too afraid and greedy. They even tried to use their princesses as bait to use against Lucifer who was infamous as a playboy. Alas, it was a bad move from their side. On the other side of the world, in the East Blue, the heinous fishman Arlong was in Kokoyashi Village, Arlong Park. Wahahaha. <laughs> Arlong laughed loudly seeing the newspaper. Those pig human bastards were nicely done by this guy. He had a grin on his face, his eyes deadly. He even killed that Borsalino. Borsalino was the one who injured Fisher Tiger and indirectly killed him. So Kazara was the person who was hated most by Arlong. After this incident, Arlong started to respect Amon. He didn't respect Amon because of his fifth emperor title, but he respects him for his other feats. It was then when Arlong recalled the news he got from a spy in Fishman Royal Palace a few years ago. I heard this guy is also the protector of us fishmen, something stated in the legendary Pongliff. Arlong didn't believe that before because of Amon's similarities with a human. But after how he saved Odoheim, and after today's incident, his views changed. Haha. Uh -huh. Everyone. Everyone at that place looked at Arlong. Amon, the fifth emperor is our idol from now on. Huh. Everyone was shocked and surprised. Scaredly, a fishman beside him walked towards him. Erm, boss, shouldn't he be our enemy too? He's a human after all. Along shouted. Fool. Can't you see those beautiful wings on his back? He is not human. The other fishman flinched and looked at the bounty newspaper which had a photo of Amon. It was different from the bounty poster which only captured his face. Oh. Right. Ha ha. Scratching his neck, the other fishman also started to laugh, albeit awkwardly. They had no idea what feat Amon achieved. They were a frog in the well. Among the people who were in Arlong Park, 
A human with orange hair was also there. Who is this guy? Arlong called him his idol, so he must be a bad guy. Knitting her brows, the girl, Nami, decided to look at the newspaper later. Her 15-year self hated fish men and everyone associated with them from her core. She is keeping a list of people associated with Arlong to one day take revenge. Meanwhile, the world nobles were pressuring the government to increase Amon's bounty. 2.4 billion seemed too small compared to their anger. They didn't care about the balance that the elders were talking about. They wanted Amon to die. Chapter 112 The Compensation After Amon's declaration, the training days of Scipions began. Upper Yard was now officially named Shandora, City of Gold, both by Amon and the newspaper. It is located in Skypea. Bro, pay attention. Currently, Amon is fighting with Raki. This was a sword battle. Amon laughed lightly. The truth is, speed is everything if you have balanced strength along with it. Amon continued. Give up, sis. You can't win. Raki grinned. I'm a proud Shandorian. How can I give up? Now, the Shandians are now known as Shandorians, but the Scipians and Birkins still held their previous names. Fine. Commander Raki. Amon rushed towards her with his sword going towards her neck. Clang but Raki blocked it. All right, Emperor Amon. Then a devastating battle began to foster between the duo. While fighting, Amon was still thinking leisurely. Skypea is the best possible place to be the base of my emperor identity. This is a naturally secured area, proving that Amon's thought was correct. For any ship to reach the Skypea, Shandora, it needs to use the knock upstream or summit of the west. However, both ways would lead a traveler to the three kilometers long road called Milky Road. And for Amon, there are hundreds of ways to stop a ship from getting to the other end of the Milky Road alive. Doesn't matter if the ship is that of an emperor or not. Amon evaded one of Raki's attacks. The Milky Road is similar to the Reverse Mountain. The only difference is the Whitewater. Let's take Big Mom for an example. If Big Mom pirates decided to invade the sky, the only way they would think of reaching here is to travel their ship through the Milky Road, connecting to Heaven's Gate. However, in that scenario, just like how all Star King almost destroyed the Big Mom pirates while they were climbing the Reverse River in Wano, Amon can do the same here. More so, I can actually kill them since not everyone can survive the fall of 10,000 meters from Sky. This time, Amon attacked Raki. Even if Big Mom survives the fall, she won't survive falling into the sea. More so, Amon can even know when someone enters Jaya Island with his 300 kilometers observation range, so it was impossible that he would be caught off guard. But even if a rat managed to sneak in, with all the clouds, which can grow into thunder clouds, around, this was Amon's natural domain. I should focus on the fight right now. Go rest, Raki. Sky Sword Style, Divine Impact of Zen. Sky Sword Style is something he invented after working with Raki day and night for the past four years. So it wasn't surprising for Raki to use the same move and repel Amon. On the third day of Amon's training regime, a call from Alabasta reached him. I have already started to make the preparations of the marriage. Now I'm just waiting for your response. That's what the caller, King Cobra, said. I understand. Please try to make it as grand as possible. I want the news to reach every corner of the world. I will be there in a few days. Saying this, Amum agreed on his proposal. Cobra seemed more than eager to let Vivi marry Amon. Previously, he agreed on the marriage because Amon was a warlord. So it only makes sense that he would be all for it when Amon is an emperor. Although this would mean Alabasta will now be Amon's territory and will lose the protection of WG and Marines, Cobra was fine with it. Even if the Marines won't protect Alabasta anymore doesn't mean they will attack it either, or they would have attacked the islands like Fishman Island since it is Whitebeard's territory. The only possible problem was pirate attacks. Marines won't help against them, but Cobra was confident enough in Amon's influence and power. He assumed, since Amon will have his wife stay here, he would definitely take precautions to help the kingdom against possible attacks. Considering all this, Cobra declared the marriage between Vivi and Amon public. There was a reason for this stupid action that would make Vivi seem like Amon's sore spot. Naturally, after the marriage, the pirates will target Alabasta since Amon's wife would be there. They would assume they can lure Amon easily like this, especially those wicked bastards working under the shadows. However, wasn't that what Amon wants? Indeed, People would target Vivi, but that also meant they won't target the few people Amon cared about in this world. Amon would make people believe Vivi is a weak spot. So before thinking of invading the sky, where some special people live, they will target Vivi and Alabasta. 
Amon would rather let Vivi die than letting an emperor come to the sky, especially Kaido or Big Mom who both can fly. Cobra doesn't realize that, so he assumed this would rather benefit Vivi. Actually, it sure will benefit Vivi if she isn't naive. Thus, the marriage began. Papu. VUP VUP VUP. Many kinds of instruments were being played all around Riki, but she didn't seem happy hearing them. Rather, she had a frown. Why? Even though that bitch almost killed Yona, why does bro still want to marry her? She seemed very outraged at Amon's decision, not knowing his plans. She still hasn't forgiven Vivi, after all, Yona had a special spot in her heart. She was cute, and she treated both her and Amon nicely, in a way that no one other does. Riki looked at Amon who was sitting with Vivi on a stage far away. She bit her lips and whispered, Horny bastard. Then Riki walked around, looking at earth food that she hadn't seen in four years. Cursing in her mind for the umpteenth time, she focused on the food and started to eat from one side of the table. Some waiters tried to stop her, but they walked back after her glare filled with killing intent. Today was the day of marriage. Amon was getting married to Vivi, the princess of Alabasta. This news naturally attracted the attention of many people, emperors, and government alike. They have sent many spies around the island, but none of them wanted to confront Amon any time soon, especially the marines who now knew a glimpse of Amon's powers from the report made by Hinachan. Meanwhile, Amon knew about the spies and was well aware that no one will make a move now. They would rather observe. To them, it was beneficial that this marriage was happening since they can use Vivi and use her against Amon. Thus, they decided to let the marriage proceed smoothly. In front of the large crowd, with many journalists hiding within them, Vivi and Amon were preparing their final words asked by the marriage priest. Do you accept this man, Amon, as your loving husband? The priest asked Vivi, who nodded with a red face. She looked more dazzling than beautiful today. Her white marriage dress and gold accessories were saturated by her sky-blue hair. Un. Seeing her nod, the priest then looked at Amon and asked the same question. Amon decided to add two more lines. I accept Princess Vivi as my life partner. I hope we will be together forever. Not only in this life, but even after our death. Amon kneeled on his one knee and kissed Vivi's hand. Everyone clapped at his words. If only someone said this to me. Even though the lines weren't cool, the females were already jumping up and down. I'm feeling strange. Is this love? What a man. Among them, the red-haired princess from the Melromark kingdom was also there. Ugh. If only I could reach him first. She quickly went to make new plans to reach him, only to be stopped by Robin. The marriage went smoothly. Some distractions occurred, but regular people were unaware of it since Wiper quickly took care of them. Soon, the night fell upon the sandy land of Alabasta. Amon was in a room, a beautifully decorated room with flowers. This was the wedding room for tonight's activities. MMM. What's your name? Amon was sitting on the bed. A silver-haired woman wearing maid clothes was on his lap. He was hugging her from behind. Now and then, the maidservant was helplessly twisting her body in Amon's grasp, but Amon just proceeded to insert electricity in her pleasure nerves. And my name is... Irene. She seemed to have given up herself to the pleasure source. She simply started to breathe heavily while her hands clutched the bedsheet. She tried to do a last try. Dear Prince, today is your special day with Princess, you can't touch me like this. Amon stayed silent for a while before removing his hands and falling on the bed on his back. Meh, I'm not interested in a girl with no boobs and ass like Vivi, you are more desirable. Anyway, you can go. Vivi was 14 this year although her body looked like a 16-year-old's, she still hadn't gained the property she had in canon. The maid got up and bowed, ignoring him. She ran away through the door. Although she did feel her body act strange, if she was found acting like this, she would have been executed. She didn't want to take the chance and ran away. Amon yawned as his eyes became sleepy. He didn't act like this with the girl simply because of horniness, it had a reason behind it. She was the illegitimate daughter of Cobra, and she was 17. So Cobra cheated on Vivi's mother even before her death. Amon decided to use the silver-haired woman according to her wishes because of this. I just need to ignite her will to get revenge towards Cobra and then I can find a scapegoat. Amon yawned again and twisted his body in the outfit of the groom. After a few minutes, Vivi entered the room. It was Alabasta's tradition that the bride will enter the wedroom after the groom, so she was late. She had no idea what happened in the meantime. She brought milk with her. Milk for Amon. This was also a tradition. But. Vivi looked at the sleeping Amon as her red face became redder. But this red was of anger. Am I that bad? 
In anger, Vivi drank the milk and went to sleep beside him. Soon, her eyelids closed as a mon and she slept in the same bed. Vivi POV Sunlight flashed on my eyes as I slightly opened my eyelids. MMM I stretched a little in the bed as my eyes fell around the room. At first, I was surprised seeing all that decoration before recalling it was my special night yesterday. I also recalled how I slept through it. Groaning a little, I looked at my side where my husband is supposed to be. Where is he? My so-called husband who slept on the same bed as me but didn't touch me was not here. I recall him being beside me when I slept. Then where is he? I sat up and rubbed my eyes. Looking around the room, I couldn't see him anywhere. I feel bad and dejected. I'm trying to hide it. But it's a fact. I'm only 14, but even I expected a special night. Yet. Sigh. I sighed. I can't possibly expect anything from him. I should be happy that he married me. Now, Alabasta will grow tremendously. I hate to say it, but now we will be the leech. While I prepared to get up from the bed, I heard the sound of passing electricity behind me. You were up. Sorry I slept. I was tired. Surprised, I looked behind. My nose touched another similarly slender nose. My eyes locked with his red eyes, a similarly colored red hue appeared on my face. As compensation, he revealed his hands. Eat this fruit. An earth-colored fruit with strange encrypts was in his hand. My eyes grew instantly. Father never said anything about this. Chapter 113 Further Plants As compensation, you can eat this fruit. Amon had a strange fruit in the color of soil with unique encrypts in his hand. Yeah. Vivi expressed her surprise by taking a few steps back. She specifically wanted to move her face away from his. Amon let her do it so that she could grasp the situation. Feeling the wall on her back, Vivi blinked with her mouth agape. W-N did you come here? That's not important. Anyway, catch this. Amon threw the fruit. Vivi was barely able to catch it. For around three minutes, she kept inspecting the fruit. You? You want me to eat a devil fruit? Vivi was surprised. She has studied world politics a lot. For that reason, she also gained a lot of knowledge in other fields. One of the fields was devil fruit powers. She knew how powerful and useless DFs can be as well. As seconds passed, she looked at Amon's relaxed eyes, Vivi's shocked face formed a frown. Her red face returned to its normal form. What fruit is this? Father never told me anything about it. Vivi was curious and suspicious. Amon laughed. It's sand sand fruit. One of the rare Logia category. It is one of the destructive Logias. You'd benefit a lot from eating this. This is something your father and I talked about before the engagement. I guess he didn't tell you because you might grow too dependent even before eating it. Vivi was surprised hearing this, but she still could not believe it. I will come back in a minute. Saying this, Vivi ran through the door, rushing towards Cobra's room while still clutching the fruit in her hand. Vivi POV Oh, I didn't tell you because I was unsure. You might have been too expectant if the marriage didn't happen, or if Lucifer didn't bring the fruit, you would have been disappointed and sad. So I didn't reveal it, anyway. Isn't it a pleasant surprise now? That's what father replied after I asked him about this deal with that man. Now if I consider this, it makes sense why father agreed with the engagement five years ago. I walked out of father's room and went towards my room. It truly is a powerful fruit. I looked down at the fruit in my hand. Sand sand fruit. From what I know about devil fruits, their usage gets a tremendous boost based on the environment. So that fruit is perfect for me. I don't see any loss from eating this fruit. But, isn't that crocodile's fruit? For years ago, Sir Crocodile died. Because of a heroic marine, his bad deeds were revealed. From there, I learned how he planned to take over Alabasta. I couldn't bear with it and started to prepare myself for something similar in the future. Father didn't let me learn how to fight, so I'm still pretty weak. If I had enough strength, I wouldn't have been taken hostage in the sky. I'm well aware of this, so I tried my best in other areas. Currently, my best perk is my knowledge. I'm prepared for things that might harm me, my father, and my kingdom. But knowledge isn't enough to protect them. I need actual power. I tried to gain political powers, but since I'm still 14 I can't do much in that department. I gulped and looked back at the fruit again. It doesn't matter if it's crocodile's fruit or not. To begin with, nobody knew what crocodile's fruit was. They just knew some of its abilities. So this might possibly be another fruit. Now, not only with my knowledge, but I can also use my own strength to protect Alabasta. I will accept his offer. Nodding to myself, I walked through the door. Inside, 
that man is eating grapes. He noticed my presence and walked towards me with a wide smile. So, did you decide? He asked as I nodded. He is not as bad as I thought. A smile that I wasn't aware of bloomed on my face. I'm sure our life would be long and beautiful. General POV Days later After taking permission from Cobra, Vivi was permitted to train with Amon. He was simply happy that an emperor was training his child, she was deemed to grow into a powerhouse this way. Vivi was also happy being able to learn how to fight. Vivi, try it. Focus on the design first. Yes, yes, I'm trying to concentrate. In a large training hall located in Alabasta, Amon and Vivi were alone. Amon was training Vivi who has now eaten the sand sand fruit. Amon stared at Vivi who had her eyes closed, concentrating. Fudu. Vivi took a deep breath. Her eyes opened with a dedicated glim within them. Golem creation. Human soldiers. In seconds, the sand outside the building came flying through the window and started to form a humanoid body made of sand. Seconds passed, the sounds of sand colliding with each other filled the hall. Amon clapped from the side. Wow, you did it on your second try? You are a genius, as expected of my wife. Vivi blushed and avoided his gaze. Why yeah? She seemed happy hearing his praises. But this single carelessness made the sand humans deform. Dup. In seconds, the solid sand soldier crumbled down. Ah, uh, I messed up. Vivi's eyes became teary. It was like making a card house after spinning all day, but a single burst of wind destroys it. I've been concentrating for half an hour now. Seeing Vivi down, Amon walked towards her and stroked her hair. It's okay, you did fine. This is only your second try. You already learned many other techniques the previous days. Vivi enjoyed his care-filled hands on her head. M.M. She placed her head in his chest as Amon threw his hands around her shoulders and hugged her. As long as I am here, you do fine. Now, since you are already tired, we should stop for today. Amon gave up a lot of his free time for Vivi. It seems an emperor had less worry than a guildmaster. Then, Vivi looked at Amon with expectant eyes. She was like a puppy. Her previous rebellious self was long gone. Amon stared at her. Girls in their teens. He just shook his head. You won't be able to walk if we do it too much. Don't forget your body is small and weak. Train more if you want to do it any time. With a red face, Vivi humphed and turned away. That's right. They did it. Amon spent around a week here in Alabasta, and Vivi didn't fail to get him on the bed. Though Amon did it by his own will. It was a necessary step to take if I wanted to completely subdue her. As a few minutes passed, Vivi fell asleep with her head resting on Amon's chest. Amon ignored her and planned his next action. I wasted too much time with this shitty spoiled brat. I need to make quick moves. Just because the emperors are observing now, doesn't mean they will continue to observe. If Amon tries to make a big move, the emperors will surely step forward. For that, Amon first needed to make the moves that would increase his protection. Power without a means to keep it wasn't good at all. So he needs to start taking over strong islands and recruit strong individuals. Among them, some particular things needed to be done right now. Claiming Gran Tazaro, the largest entertainment city in the world. Claiming Gecko Moria's Thriller Bark. Claiming the whole Amazon Lily. First of all, I need tremendous wealth to make some particular moves. So Gran Tazaro should be my first target. Amon already asked the old elders to not mess with Gran Tazaro when it would be under his name. If they don't listen, Amon will just leak the clips. They had no choice except to listen to him. But someone needs to watch after Gran Tazaro and instead, he can't always be present there. But he also can't let such a big thing stay unprotected. I guess. I will just brainwash Tazaro, although there are some drawbacks. Amon decided. But he won't go there himself. Chapter 114 Okay. While Amon was busy making Vivi familiar with her powers, in Skypea, something special was taking place. We got the news. Some small pirate crews have invaded Angel Island. They are currently hiding, seemingly preparing for a perfect time to attack. Riki was explaining to the people in front of her. In front of her, many people of different ages were sitting. All of them were Shandorian. They listened to her every word unconditionally. This time, I will send five teams. Each team will have only one person. Your jobs will be to gather as much information as possible about them. Riki stared at their faces. I will say this once so listen carefully. Do not engage in a fight. That's not your job. You will only gather information. Am I clear? Yes. The people in front of her shouted in unison. These are some teachings Riki learned from the different moons. 
After asking Amon's permission, she was now applying these to the promising Shandorian. Riki pointed her finger forward. Rai, Rei, Jigolo, Harama. You four will do this raid. Some people looked dejected that they weren't picked. Some looked happy. The four had a delighted expression that they were picked. And lastly, Riki looked at a four-year-old who clearly wasn't paying attention to her words. He was thinking about how to get his hands on an automata. He wanted to dismantle them. Then learn the secrets of the universe. Karna, you will go too. Kid, if you fail, I will whip you for five hours. After someone nudged Karna, he returned to reality. He grumped after hearing her, but he was forced to do as she asked. He was four, but his mind was developed enough to think like an adult, but that didn't mean he was as mature as an adult. He was still a kid who was stimulated using Amon's hypnotic powers a few days ago. Though his personality remained the same, he knew he was someone who would only serve Amon. Only serve Amon. Because of this line, he hated being ordered around by anyone other than him, even if that is Riki who everyone else respects. I heard this girl, Riki, used to be looked down upon when she was young. People said she only grew where she was because Brother Amon treated her like a sister. Karna thought with his furrows knitted. Crazy woman. But all that is in the past now, she is strong. She cut those vice admirals in half, the ones who were on the verge of beating Wiper. For that, people now respect her for herself. He didn't even think of dismantling her. He felt a chill run down his spine under her gaze. Because, unlike Amon, she didn't hide anything. Then a sweet smile bloomed on Karna's face. Yes, big sister. I will go. People would have thought he was a natural actor. But in reality, he was someone who couldn't maintain his facade for long. People knew this kid was crazy, but they knew he wouldn't harm them. He saw them as his family. It was true. Even though Karna had fantasies of dismantling people, even though he had this thought every time he looked at a person who was not his mother, father or sister, he still knew he couldn't touch a Shandorian. He was attached to them. Soon after, he left along with the other four. The other four were all adults. He was the only child, but nobody questioned anything. It's almost as if they knew the kid would be safe. Would he really though? Riki sat down on a chair while reading adult magazines and drinking lemon juice. She was waiting for someone who she called just a while ago. Ah. Oh. This girl is good. The magazine was filled with Skypea girls. This was how modern the Skypea was. Modeling was quite normal here. And this was something happening even before Amon came into power. Riki scratched her cheeks. I have to say, Coin is on the level of models. I recall she had a daughter. Hmm. Interesting. While Riki started to laugh cheekily, trying to copy a young Amon, the person, or rather, the robot she was waiting for reached the place. Ma'am. Automata short motor is here. Riki glanced at him, short motor, and put the book down on the table. You are here. I recall calling ghost motor, but whatever. As the leader of motor gang, you are more appropriate. Riki didn't like short motor. He was supposed to be a heinous existence who hated his creator, thus forming the motor gang. At first, when they reached the moon four years ago, Amon let motor punch him in the face, sensing his anger. Amon found it interesting that a robot could feel emotions to that degree. So he let things proceed smoothly. However, even after the punch, the automata didn't subdue. But just when Riki threatened to stop motor that time, he did after inspecting her body. Hiki, ma'am, ask me anything you want. This was why Riki didn't like him. He was weird. Just like how Mon had expected, short motor was interesting. He could not only feel clear anger, but he could also feel enough emotions to be a pervert. Riki snapped hearing him and seeing his smile. Shut up. Didn't I ask you to not smile like that? She glared at him as Motor jumped back. He gulped his non-existent saliva. Riki sighed after a second. Listen, go after the kid named Karna. Protect him at all costs. Short Motor's eyes shined. Such a pure girl. Although she acts like a cold-hearted woman, she cares about that cheeky kid. As expected from my goddess. Yes, God cough my am. While Riki glared at him, Motor turned around and flew like Iron Man. Amon did many experiments on his body since he was a special existence with multiple bodies. So even if one of his bodies gets destroyed or harmed, he would still be there. He had 12 bodies. Each of them acted differently but in reality, all the bodies are connected using wireless technology. Even though 12 of them act like they are different people, they are actually the same being with a single mind commanding them. This was because Shore Motor was an engineer. He experimented on his own body and when all the automata were out of battery, he used his genius to charge himself using different techniques. He unknowingly used Haki, 
a special form of hockey which charged his battery. Being lonely, he created another automata by himself. However, he didn't have enough knowledge to make a brain for the automatus. So he used a wireless connection and controlled all the bodies by himself. He acted like 12 people by himself, trying to keep his mind away from breaking down due to the loneliness he felt. Short Motor, the leader of the motor gang, flew like Iron Man and followed Karna from the air. Karna POV. HNM. This is a construction area. I am currently hiding behind a boulder. Big Brother Amon had decided to make Angel Island bigger, so he ordered the engineers to add more island clouds to the main island. They were doing so, and many buildings were halfway done. Today is a holiday, so no construction workers were working on the site. If I was those pirates, I would have come here seeing this as a chance. And yes, after searching for a while, I found a pack of them. I don't have observation hockey, or things would have been easier. Unlike Sister Isa, I'm not talented at it. I can use a bit of it, but it's too weak. For it being too weak, I suffer a lot. Like right now. Caught you, kid. Suddenly, a gruff voice entered my ears. And before I could turn back, my hands were restrained. I only sensed this guy when he was one meter close to me. I really am not meant for fighting, huh? Kid, I sensed you a while ago. Haha. Ha. The man looked at my head. I didn't have those hair antennas like the Scipians. So you were a Shandian? From that island? Wow, looks like I caught a big fish. The man prepared to walk towards his group along with me in his hands. I didn't struggle. It was useless and meaningless. Because... Let go of Karna. A robotic voice came from behind me. Because I knew someone would come to save me, I'm precious. I laughed a little while the man who caught me flinched. I couldn't see which robot it was since the man covered my eyes, but I ordered it. Attack him, my automata slav. Bam. Before I could finish though, I was hit with what I assume is a revolver in the head as I felt my head get wet. Shut up, kid. A robot won't be enough to save you. I was bleeding. Ugh. I never bled before. This thing hurts. I was suddenly frightened. I was my family's precious child. They always protected me. So this was a new type of feeling for me. The man who had me restrained laughed. Ha ha ha. A robot that can talk? The man laughed again. That's comparable to Germa 66. Hand yourself over robot. Or this Shandian kid will die. Ugh. He knows about Germa 66. I guess he is someone formidable or just a fanboy. Anyway, I feel scared. I didn't even test a human body. Will I die here? I almost peed my pants. And it was then. You. The robotic voice started to sound more. Natural? No, it wasn't natural. It was gruff like an animal. You touched the wrong person. The voice got gruffer. It was as if a lion was talking human language. The man's hands shook and were removed from my eyes. My eyes fell upon the robono. It wasn't a robot. It was a living being. A. Lion? Or a tiger? I sure motor. The one with the liger liger fruit will stop you from harming him. I won't disappoint my goddess. The man holding me started to shake. It shouldn't be just because of the dangerous look of the creature alone. It must be something related to his devil fruit. Speed kill, oh. Fwoosh. The creature vanished from in front of me as I was covered in blood the next second. I was shocked, but I was able to get a grip and grasp the situation. The man died. The robot. The humanoid liger killed the man. His head was cut in half. A robot can become a humanoid creature with flesh and blood with a devil fruit. I was on the verge of. How interesting devil fruits are. Losing consciousness. With that, my world went blank. I was too shocked because of the blood. For a year ago. After staying on the moon for a few days, Amon was having words with a few automata. Among them the motor gang was present. Ugh, it takes to the bad creator. What was that thing anyway? Sure motor had eaten a fruit given by Amon. It was a devil fruit. Amon ignored his question. Rather, he asked his own question. You don't feel any change? Amon asked. He knew that non-living creatures can use devil fruit powers too as shown many times throughout the series. But, eh? No, I don't feel anything. Should there have been something? Shore Motor made a confused face. Amon fed him the blanket blanket fruit. A paramecia, but it didn't work. A zoan would work, I'm sure. It was because the devil fruit used non-living creatures shown in the anime were all Zoan users. The theory goes like this. Zoan fruits have a body sealed in them, the body of a particular animal. When someone eats it, they get the ability to switch to that body. This way, even non-living beings can use Zoan fruit powers. They switch their non-living body with that other body. 
though it's still a mystery how one can make a non-living being eat a fruit. And what about the fact that non-living beings can think after eating the fruit? There might be a sealed life form along with the sealed body. Or some kind of bullcrap. I don't want to think too much. Amon then took a fruit and threw it towards Shore Motor. Eat this. This will work. It was the fruit of Liger, the ancient Zoan. Chapter 115 Plans for the Son of King In Dress Rosa, Da Quixote Da Flamingo was in a room with a few people in front of him. All right then, I will go in. Mokvice, a member of the Don Quixote Pirates, the one with Tun Tun Fruit, said to Da Flamingo in front of him. Yes, be sure to avoid the golden dust, at all costs, Duffy said. This time we won't fight, we would rather offer an alliance. The occurrence of another emperor will change many things, so I need to act more cautiously. I understand it. Nayahiki. Mokvice laughed reassuringly. Duffy grinned. He knew Mokvice wasn't strong enough to beat Tazaro, but this was sufficient. He would only be used as the medium to offer an alliance. Daffy believed Dazaro would accept it since he is going as far as sending one of his executives rather than just calling him through a snail. But if he doesn't, I will just keep hunting him down. Kukuku. Doflamingo chuckled while planning for the future. He felt that something big would happen, and that big thing would be surrounding him. A few days later, in a certain place of the New World, under the sea, a submarine could be spotted. It was golden in color and had an S written on its wall. It was a submarine made of gold. Riki was riding it with two automata accompanying her. This was a submarine made of gold and sea prism stone. It was only partially made of sea prism stone, as Amon didn't have an unlimited supply of it. Still, sea kings stayed away from it because they confused the ship's presence with the sea itself because of the sea stone. This is the tactic marines are yet to find, but Amon didn't knew it because of his canon knowledge. This was one of the five submarines Amon had of the S model, and more are being made in real time. Suddenly, Bearboop, inside the ship, Riki was looking outside the window of the submarine. This beauty is on par with outer space. Indeed, the space was beautiful, but it didn't have creatures swimming on it like the sea. To Riki, who has fought many battles in space, this was even more beautiful. Humans don't even know the secrets of the sea, but they want to discover the secrets of space? Ridiculous but this is just proof of human greed. Asterisk Rahar Asterisk. Suddenly, hearing a roar and seeing a seeking approach the ship, Riki gripped her sword tight. Foo. But sensing something, she stopped midway. The next second, many guns came out of the ship and shot towards the Sea King. Pew 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 pew. Asterisk Roa, R, Asterisk. Bearboop. In seconds, the Sea King was killed, the blue sea turned red. It was a strong sea king to have even found the location of this ship, but it couldn't survive two seconds in front of these weapons. It just sank deeper in the sea. Ma'am, you can rest. I, Shore Motor, shall take care of the thing. The reliable Shore Motor had used the ship to kill the sea king. Beside him, an automata with a similar appearance replied, Indeed, this was Ghost Motor, another body of Shore Motor. Shore Motor seemed to become infuriated hearing this. He looked back with angry eyes. Hey. You idiot. Why are you replying to me? Huh? It's my mouth. I say anything I want. The two robots started to fight among themselves, or it should be said one robot started to fight himself. It was as if a guy was using an alt account to fight himself. Truly lonely. Riki endured it for three seconds before she looked at the two after her veins popped up. Shut up. Riki's scream almost shattered the glass of the submarine. This hurt the automata's sound receptor mechanism too. Ah. Hey, uh, the two robots took steps back in unison. You want me to tear you apart? Riki glared at the two. They sure were brave to fight when she was enjoying the scene outside. If you really want to fight on your heads, aren't you two connected anyways? Ah, hey, uh, that's right. Sighing, Riki went back to the sightseeing while the robots did as asked of them. Amon asked Riki to visit Grand Desaro and wreak havoc. She wasn't given any restriction on what she can do, so she was happy today. She also wanted a bounty. Soon after Amon's bounty was revealed, Wiper got a bounty of 500 million bellies. Yet, she didn't have any since people didn't see her heroic battle. They were already knocked out by Amon's hockey. So she was excited about this raid. She was feeling like a pirate today, so she even wore an eye patch. Higi, I heard the owner of the Dazaro is a strong guy, and he even has strong subordinates. Riki had a few sheets of paper in her hand. If I take down the richest man in the world, then I will surely get a good bounty. Riki giggled while reading the sheets. They contained the detailed power of the people she will have to face. 
Though Amon deliberately hid the weakness that he knew by watching the movie, One Piece, film gold. He wanted Riki to face a little disadvantage. She had it too easy these days. Riki was someone who relied on her power most, but she wasn't dumb in any sense. She was confident but wasn't overconfident. When she learned that she can check her enemy's powers written on these sheets of paper, she didn't think it would hurt her pride by doing so. Grand Tazaro, a massive ship that is also the biggest entertainment city. It's a floating city that roams around the New World. It is a famous place for rich people, world nobles, and figures from the underground world to spend their time on. Riki read out loud. Eternal log pose pointing to the island is buyable from the underworld, and that's where Amon got one for Riki. The automata were using it to navigate. The ruler of the Tazaro is a smart and strong man, as it took Luffy's gear forth to beat him. His gold gold fruit was acquired from Doflamingo, he stole it. So Doffy is always after his head, though he was unable to touch him to date. For that reason, he was trying to ally with him. He felt going after his head won't be a good idea anymore. This alliance was supposed to form three years later if this was the original timeline, but Amon's presence changed things, though it doesn't matter much. Same time. Woaha. Master Desaro. Kia. In the Grand Blue Sea, a massive golden ship was floating. This was the biggest entertainment city in the world, Grand Desaro. Yoho, I'm here for everybody. Gil Desaro, the owner of this ship, and the holder of 20% of the world's economy, was singing on a platform with liquid gold under it. He was using his fruit powers to make a show around his foothold. Woa, people were cheering for him. To most of the people living here, he was a hero. But there were a few who knew the dark secret, they were forced to stay silent. Or they would have been sent to the prison under the ship. Tesoro used golden dust spray on the entrance of the ship. Someone who was showered by the dust would be under Tazaro's mercy because of his powers to control gold. Even a revolutionary army member lost to him, though this was confidential knowledge. It was then a... Mwahahaha. A pirate ship came from the entrance. It was a random pirate crew, trying their luck at this luxurious ship. A short and fat man was standing on the deck of the ship. He had his sword pointed towards Tazaro who was singing. Tazaro, I have come here to claim the ship. Hand it over. Muha. Seeing Tezaram ignoring him and singing, he ordered his subordinates to shoot cannonballs. They did as he asked. Boom. 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 One after another, the cannonballs started to go towards the audience at a terrible speed. Kya. The audience started to scream and some even began to hug themselves. Oh, God. A mother hugged her children, scared that their life would end here and now. PCCHHD dash. However, the cannonballs weren't able to hit the audience because the liquid gold on the ship was floating and had formed solid shields that were used to block the cannons. Huh. The captain of the pirates was shocked. He knew Gil Dazaro had the power to manipulate gold, but he didn't think it was this strong. Keck. Everyone, keep attacking. Don't stop firing the cannons. But he didn't give up. He has already come this far after all. He assumed Dazaro would surely run out of stamina trying to block all the balls, then they would attack. However, his tries were useless. Tazaro didn't seem worried or tired at all. He just formed barriers for the hundreds of cannonballs fired and blocked them all. He wasn't an awakened fruit user for nothing. Everyone prepare for the show. Tazaro grinned while the audience cheered his name. They were excited that their hero saved them in the show he was about to put on. Tazaro raised his hands and jabbed it down in the air. Golden flood. Sha. Sha. The liquid gold started to dance and made a huge wave comparable to the aggressive sea. Thrash. In a second, it crashed into the ship taking it down in seconds. The pirates riding the ship cried for help, but Tazaro pulled them under the gold water ruthlessly. Yaya. Yeah, yeah. Tazaro yelled to the mic as everyone did the same. The audience seemed ecstatic. It was then that, a submarine slowly rose from the entrance of the Grand Tazaro, coming to the Golden Sea from the Blue Sea. Bearbup. Is Riki, who's been training for the past four years, strong enough to take down an awakened gold gold fruit user by herself? Even more so, along with his strong and tricky subordinates? Yes, she was more than capable. I am the strongest. Meanwhile, Amon was very busy. He wore his diving suit and a futuristic invisibility cloak. After taking all these precautions, he started to teleport towards a single direction, the direction of Big Mom's kingdom, the Tato Land. He was gathering the known red poneglyphs. It's easy to do with his speed and presence hiding abilities. Roger was able to steal the poneglyph's contents from there. Why can't I? In this world, there are 30 pongeables. Amon had 12 of them on him, or at least their contents. 
Eleven of them were normal ones, containing useless history, and one was a red pongipple that he copied from the zoo. I also made Robin read the alabaster ponglyph. I have to say, it was a surprising discovery, the pluton. Just, who would have thought something like that is possible? Amon flew past a few birds. But it's not that surprising after seeing Shandora Hall. Speaking of which, I should also visit the AI after I go to Wayno. Amon contemplated how to travel to Wayno and return safely. Where I can enter her circuits and try to hack her this time, it should be possible if I can brainwash human beings. Hmm. That's for later. First the Wayno trip. He can go there and return safely, but the problem is the proof the bitch asked for. I know something. Odin's diary. But if he steals it, Yamato will tell Kaido. And Kaido will be after him. And if news gets out about the diary which contains the journey of Odin who reached the One Piece, other emperors, pirates, and the government will be more interested in him. That will be too much attention for a single man like Amon who isn't strong enough to take two emperors head on. For that, it's better to use a scapegoat. Someone who will bear his name of Diary Thief. Surprisingly, it isn't a hard-to-achieve feat. A name came to his mind. Portgas. D.A.S. Ace went to Wayno in canon, but what about this timeline? He wasn't firefist here. Amon hasn't been here for four years, so he didn't know much about the current world. But Robin should have collected everything about Ace since he asked her to before leaving. Ace is destined to die, even if he isn't firefist anymore. The best scapegoat, the Pirate King's son. Pirate King's son being interested in the journey of Odin who traveled with his father would be a believable excuse to the old emperors. They would go after him rather than Amon then. Huh. So easy. See? Chapter 116 Swordsman Riki Amon POV SLP I hypnotized the homie door along with two guards who were guarding the Ponglyph room. I reached Tato land a few minutes ago and observed things quietly from the shadows as my first move. I would have left if things were looking bad, but they fortunately didn't. After that, I teleported inside the room. Naturally, the room is always highly guarded but it's still not as guarded as it was when Brooke invaded here in canon. The reason being, Big Mom isn't aware that her Pongipple would be copied today. Even so, it didn't matter, as I was invisible and the fastest creature on the planet. After hypnotizing the guards and Mama's homies inside the massive room, I immediately started to copy the Pongglyph. This is easy. Speed truly is everything. Even though I said, speed is everything, I was also aware that things might get messed up if I get too caught up in my measly arrogance. General POV. Meanwhile, in Mariewa. Brother, brother, we are back. Yes, we are back. The two noble brothers, Ainsworth and Bersiado, who were escorted back to the Holy Land, were acting childish. Ainsworth, what are you doing? Their father, a prestigious world noble even among the nobles, shouted, What happened to you two? You are acting out of your mind. Seeing his eldest and smartest son tilt his head childishly, the old noble gritted his teeth. Ainsworth, you were captured, so you were supposed to be angry. Do you know how worried and angry I was? The two brothers looked confused. Eh? We are back now, aren't we? Doesn't that make everything fine? No, they weren't brainwashed by Amon. They were tortured, tortured by Yona and the priests. Yona was very angry, not because she was humiliated, rather because she was angry because they humiliated her lord by making her almost lick their shoes. So, Yona used many ways to torture them. They were now eunuchs. All that torture made their mind adopt a happy state, so that they don't break down and mentally die. Amon didn't even need to use hypnotism on them. They were weak-willed from the beginning after all. Ha ha, daddy why are you so furious? You are getting old, ha uh ha. -huh. Perseido laughed, making the old noble face bomb himself. This is unbearable. What are the elders doing? I asked them to make that boy's bounty more than ten billion. Yet. Those useless old fools. The prestigious world noble asked the government to give Amon a high bounty, but they weren't able to do so because of the ballots. If a young emperor suddenly had a bounty surpassing the old ones, they will definitely target him. Although this might seem like a wait, isn't that better? Plan. It's like summoning the devil. They assumed, after Amon would have gotten defeated, the emperors might ally or start a war among themselves. Either way, it would have been a bad decision. Slam. He hardly slammed the table in front of him. Looks like I need to hire mercenaries and pirates. I need my daughter back too. Taking deep breaths to calm down his high pressure, the noble then ignored his two sons. He felt his blood pressure rise the more he looked at their childish behavior. Alas, he didn't know his daughter was already a brainwashed nymphomaniac. In the vast sea of the new world. 
slash. A battle was taking place in Grand Tazaro. Clang. Riki slashed towards Tazaro's waist, but it was blocked by liquid gold. She was safe from the gold dust since she was in the submarine, so Tazaro was having a hard time fighting against her. Golden Paladin. Tazaro made a spear of gold and threw it towards Riki. The sharp edge went directly at her face. It seemed it would completely penetrate her head, but she perfectly blocked the attack with her twin swords. Although she blocked the attacks, Riki was still hurt. She had blood dripping down her forehead. Ha! Huh. Yet, she was grinning. Prepare for destruction. Riki's fast footstep irritated Dazaro as Baccarat also joined him. It seems the tables would turn because Riki's luck was stolen by Baccarat's touch. Slip. While running, Riki slipped on a banana peel and fell on her face. At first, she assumed it was the Katetsa Blade's fault who didn't pull this prank in the last four years. But soon she realized what happened after observing the laughing Baccarat. Hey. She just returned a grin. Meanwhile, Shore Motor was fighting the through through fruit user. The opponent was phasing through all his attacks, irritating him to an unbelievable degree. Motor, who never watched the film Gold, didn't know that the fruit user could only phase through something that wasn't flesh and blood. If he knew, he would have transformed into a Liger. Even so, unfortunately, the phase fruit user wasn't alone while attacking Motor. There was the masochistic guy as well. They were teaming up against a single robot. Bam. Something hit Motor in the back of his head as he was flown meters away. If he was a human, he would have become unconscious, but luckily he was a robot. He rubbed the back of his head which was bent inwardly as his eyes became sharp. He didn't transform yet since Riki only asked him to keep them in check. But if he transforms into that monster, he would start killing them. But, looking at Riki who was struggling, he clenched his fist. I need to transform. Groaning, the automata started to transform making the phase fruit user flinch because of the passive intimidation of the transformation. Motor's transformation wasn't fully flesh and blood. His nose, neck collar, and shoulder were still made of metal. It looked rather cool. Seeing his enemies caught off guard, Shore Motor then ran towards the through fruit user, Shurgan. Meanwhile, Ghost Motor was flying like Iron Man. He was fighting the other members of the ship who tried to interfere in the battle by shooting lasers and bullets. Bam! Riki was hit in the nose by Dazaro's gold gauntlets and was flung far behind. Fuck, I'm not this weak. But that woman. Riki looked at Dazaro's side where a red haired, beautiful tanned woman stood. She is troublesome. Seeing her gaze, the woman who was wearing a beautiful golden armor giggled. I'm Baccarat. I ate the Rikiriki fruit. Luck, luck fruit. I have the power of luck by my side. I'm Lady Luck herself. Riki's eyes twitched. Rikiriki fruit. You? Are you making fun of me? She assumed the woman was deliberately doing this. Baccarat didn't answer, confused. What are you talking about? Tazaro laughed. Girl, I don't know who you are, but you are strong. It seems you aren't a pirate. Even if you are, you don't have a big enough bounty to stand out. Would you reveal, why are you here and interrupting my concert? Wait. Suddenly, Tazaro had an idea as he laughed out loud. Could it be that I ever robbed your family and you were here to take revenge? Is that it? Baccarat also laughed with him. She did what benefited her. That's the reason she was working with Tazaro, to begin with. If she gets a better offer, she won't think twice to change sides. Tazaro then pointed at Baccarat. Her power is luck itself. She is currently assisting me after stealing your luck. As long as she is by my side, I will be fine. Riki finally understood what she meant as she gritted her teeth. Luck? Fuck it. Riki rushed forward after wiping her bloody lips. Enough chit chat you gold bastard. Her grip on her swords was firm. I will cut you in four pieces. Riki gripped her sword tight and jumped in the air. She spun in the air once and went towards. Baccarat. Tazaro was suddenly alert. He thought the muscle brain girl would go after him, but to think she would do this. Bro said I should not kill Tazaro unless it's an emergency, but he didn't say anything about others. Riki's sword started to leave two after images. Sky sword style, Giganomachia. The after images started to grow big, they became many times bigger than the actual swords and went towards the surprised Baccarat's neck. Cling. However, they were stopped by Dazaro's golden shield. As Riki looked at Dazaro with darkened eyes, her eyes grew. Guild Dazaro was using his powers to make a massive gigantic armor around his body. This was his iconic technique that he only used when he was serious. Uh, fuck. While the fight was going, among the audience, a member of the Da Flamingo Pirates was hiding. Kaya. Monsters. People of Grand Tazaro were running wildly. 
They didn't expect someone this strong to invade here. Even their hero is having a hard time. The concert ended after everyone ran away from their seats. Everyone was fearful of the battle, but they assumed it would end soon with Tazaro on the winning side. However, some people were praying for Tazaro's loss. They would finally be able to escape this prison named Entertainment City. They had their eyes on Riki, who was now solely going after Tazaro and assumed herself as their hero. The Luck Devil Fruit user was taken away by the Automata. This is good. After Shore Motor transformed, he easily started to take out the subordinated. The through through Fruit user can't phase through a living being, so he was easily defeated by Motor Shurgan. He also took out the Masochist guy. After that, he went after Baccarat, though even he was unable to defeat her yet. Her luck powers were too OP. Now, with nobody there to mess with her, Riki was thinking of going all out. Clang. Riki blocked Tazaro's punch using her swords. Stopping the massive fist, her arms shook. Her swordsmanship was top-notch, but her strength was measly. One year ago, on the moon, she faced a limit. She was 17 that year. Her young mind almost collapsed from that limit. Females are physically weaker than males. Dada. This is what she learned. Riki was weak. She once dreamed to protect her brother, but now, she was completely aware that it would always remain a dream. Her brother would never need her protection, simply because he was too strong and she was too weak. The gap between them was simply too huge. If so, then I have to stop being a woman. This time, quite literally. Dot, ah. Riki thought with a dry smile. She was always confident over the years, from the time she first touched a sword to now. But there were some hiccups in her small and meaningless life. Last year, after she reached her limit, she started to take medicine secretly. They were supposed to change her feminine body to that of a male's. Brother always liked feminine girls. He won't like a girl like me anymore. Dot. That's what she thought when she raised the medicine towards her mouth a year ago. But it doesn't matter. I would be happy to just protect him from the sidelines. Dot. Eh. She bit her lower lip while tears fell down. Riki started to open the cap of the bottle and pour the liquid into her mouth. One bottle would be enough to change her. This was a medicine that some particular female aliens use. She won't have the parts of a male, but her body will change and become too masculine for her taste. Just when she was about to put the liquid in her mouth. She was stopped by two hands. Recalling that day, my cheeks hurt. Recalling the slap she received that day, Riki crackled up. Riki made an X with her swords and jumped towards Tazaro's massive self. If you ever try something like this again, I will kill you, Dada. That time, hearing him on, Riki cried. She wasn't familiar with her brother's cold side, but that wasn't why she cried. Rather, she was simply too happy hearing him. This is not a perfect medicine, but it's better than the one you were about to eat. Dada. That's what Amon said back then while handing over another medicine to her. It was the angel formula that helped him unlock his wings. Riki shook her head and ignored the past. If given a second chance, she wouldn't drink that medicine that her brother made. It was too flawed in her opinion. She didn't eat the man hormone, but rather the one Amon made, so she was still a woman. Fishman Karate. Water started to swirl around her sword and her. Wings. Fah. Riki's wings soared up. But she also felt pain. Her white wings became partially red because of the blood coming out of the joints. This is what she meant by the flaw. Twelve sword style, just like Zaro's Azura technique, Riki started to have three images of herself attached to her. Water Devil Incarnation. As Riki's voice echoed, her swords glowed blue from the water. Peace SSD. Riki's swords, clad in water, rushed forward, towards the massive armor's golden neck. The attack was so fast. Tazaro wasn't even able to see it, let alone repel it. Ting. One sword left a scratch on the neck. Ting. The second sword left a scratch bigger than before. Ting. The third sword left a cut in the golden armor. Ting. The fourth sword cut the armor deeply. Ting. The fifth sword left a similar cut. Ting. The sixth sword left a deeper cut. Tazaro's neck was 25% severed from the body. But this wasn't enough at all. It was then. Riki's six white-red wings that were soaring up became dark, they became ink-black with blue water swirling around them. Armament. Wing Blade Parade. Riki used Tazaro's shoulders to jump up and started to spin fast mid-air. Ting. Ting. Ting ting ting. Ting ting ting. Ting ting ting. The neck was hit more than 24 times per second until it finally went down. Dup. The severed head fell down from the massive golden giant's shoulder, but it was still standing on its foot. Huff. Riki grinned while blood dripped from her wings. That was easy. 
She wiped her forehead sweat as she eyed Desaro who came out of the severed head while coughing. Cough, girl, you are powerful. Desaro believed money is everything, money can buy everything. Join me, I will make you rich. Riki rushed forward while laughing. Nobody other than him deserves me. Riki started to stream all her hockey and strength to the sword. This technique was an altered version of Rokugan. This time the shockwave beam would come out of the sword rather than the hand. Sky Sword Style There are seven true forms in this style. Form 1 Form 1 is the weakest but the only form she can currently use. SLLT It was a silent slash, but the impact almost cut the Grand Desaro in half. Boom. ZZZ After copying the Pongliff stealthily and leaving a hidden message under a disguise to provoke Big Mom, Amon returned to Skypea, Shandora. After hiding the large paper which he used to copy the text of Poneglyphs, Amon decided to pay a visit to Dazaro where Riki went. He was confident that she would win, but he was worried that she would accidentally destroy the whole ship. It would be a massive loss. ZZZ. So Amon again started to teleport towards the largest entertainment city using an eternal log post. While going, he had some lingering thoughts in his mind. Sky Sword style would be enough to take Dazaro down. Riki even knows a bit of fishman karate. After using an artificial sea and moon, for the place where the waterbenders live, both Amon and Riki were able to learn fishman karate more efficiently. This time, the breathing problem that a human faces was gone because of the artificial sea and enough oxygen supply, so Riki was able to learn it too. The waterbender aliens were surprised to see how people not from their race could manipulate water so efficiently. Meanwhile, last year, Amon used the Growth Unlock Serum on Riki, which he slowly pushed towards perfection without the AI's help. With the advanced tech there, Riki was able to unlock her wings, but because of some miscalculation, she can't fully use them, but all it takes is some time and medicine to fix that. That's why she was bleeding, cursing it as a flawed medicine. I can't believe she went as far as using the man hormone on herself. Crazy bitch. Though Amon was also quite satisfied seeing this. That proved Riki's sense of protection for him far past her stupid love for him. Meanwhile, there are seven forms of the Sky Sword style. In many hybrid forms like Sky Sword style, Divine Impact of Zen, and Sky Sword style, Giganomachia, they are nowhere near the actual forms. Each of the true forms are enough to harm an emperor if used correctly. Though Riki can't even use the first form properly. Her hand will break. It probably did already. It needed an adequate level of strength. Amon had enough to use till the fifth form. But Riki, a female like she said, didn't have that much. She was right, she was weak, but she won't always be weak if she trained while using Amon's medicines. People underestimate the power of science. Just look at Sanji, and then his brothers from Germa 66. Amon flew fast as he finally sighted Dazaro. Speaking of which, Germa is good at brainwashing and cloning. I wonder how they would like a taste of their own medicine. Amon laughed while flying. He decided to pay a visit to Germa 66 after this was done. Ace's plan would be for later. First, he needs to take the gene formula from Vince Moke Judge. This time, he won't be a rat and offer a marriage proposal. He will just wreck them from the get-go. Amon finally was close enough to see what Riki was doing. A smirk formed on his face seeing her grin while looking at Tazaro who was under her foot. And like he assumed, her arms and wings were broken. Chapter 117 Lucky Wiper POV. FWA. FWA. I was training my spear style while sweating a little. This wasn't the sweat from heat. I'm immune to it. It's the sweat formed from hard work. Wave fire dance. I started to dance skillfully. This is a tribal dance that I learned when I was a kid. But now, this is a powerful move where with each of my steps, I move at an extraordinary speed to strike someone and return to my previous spot without anyone noticing. To normal people, the dance must seem unstable and flawed, but this is one of my strongest hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques. Yet, I can't beat him. Amon. He is my older cousin. He never lost to me in anything even once. He even won in the birthday section, as it is a few days before mine. For years ago, before he left for Raijin Island, I challenged him for one last time. I stopped my dance and stared at the ground. I lost. That's right. I lost back then. But I didn't stop training. I thought after four years the gap between us would decrease. But now, even Riki is stronger than me. My hand shook as I clenched my jaws and tightened my grip on the spear. I looked after Shandor for the past four years as if this was my own kingdom, but after so long when he returned, he claimed it back. I don't mind it though, 
This was my punishment for the loss four years ago. Besides, he is a nice brother. He praised me for lasting so long against the Marines. But I don't want to be praised for holding long. I want to be praised for winning. I want to win. Even if I can't beat him, I want to beat others. At least Ricky. Cooler died. Ricky killed him. She also killed his colleagues. She is stronger than me then. People might say I was not able to beat Cooler because he is my natural counter, but the truth is, he is not my natural counter, rather it's the opposite. I am his. I'm a superior element, yet I couldn't defeat him. I can scream and say it was the rain's fault, but it would be stupid. That's right, nature won't always be by my side. I'm not a protagonist from a fairy tale. If someone is the protagonist, it would be him. Fudu. I sighed after a few moments of silence. Readjusting my grip on the spear. These thoughts are useless. I should train more. I should be able to use at least 2,000 degrees heat. No, I should be able to lift at least 5,000 tons before the next two years. Hap. Again, I vigorously started to train. Life is all about training and challenges, I'm sure one day. I will reach his height. I will get out of his shadow. One day, I'm on POV. I flew towards Riki as I noticed something. Da Flamingo's rat. In the ruined ship, in a corner, one of Daffy's family members, Mach Weiss, was hiding. I can see some people with severe injuries beside him. They must be his subordinates. It seems they were injured by the battle's skirmish. Let's ignore them for now. He hid from the battle, so there is no need to go after him right now. I also don't want to harm him. I will use him to contact Daffy. I need to get close to Caesar Clown. I then flew towards Riki who was holding two swords with her injured hands. Her hands remind me of the incident eight years ago when I threw the blaze dial. Good grief. ZZZ. Ricky was alarmed by the slight sound of passing electricity. I need to work on this sound. I need to make it vanish, or this might be a weak point in the future. Oh. Ricky blinked her swollen eyelids. It's you, bro. She smiled and pointed at Tazaro who was under her feet. Look, I defeated Hi. M. Ricky couldn't continue her words and dropped forward towards my chest her face at my chest. Hey, get up. I slapped her cheeks, but she didn't respond. She was unconscious. Sighing, I contacted Shore Motor by sending an electrical signal to his processor. B-Boss, you are here. I stared at him. He looked strange with that automata nose on top of Liger's intimidating face. Take Riki to the ship, treat her quickly. I handed Riki to him as he needed it and ran backward. This wasn't a big injury, she got far worse injured in space. Earth is relatively more peaceful than that hell. Unlike I initially thought, space was dangerous. So she will be fine, completely fine. I then looked at Tazaro who was laying on the ground, unconscious. He is a stubborn man. A villain with a cliché backstory, but that story is what makes him stubborn. He won't work under me at all. He is an awakened user of the gold gold fruit, so I don't want to kill him. I wanted to have him as my subordinate. If I kill him and give the fruit to another person, they may never awaken it so it would be a rather big loss. But if subordinating doesn't work, then brainwashing it is. But there is a problem. Brainwashing someone reduces their fighting ability since some nerves are destroyed and the brain can't function properly sometimes. Other than that, there is also the fact that, while I'm brainwashing someone, he she might die. Also, the stronger a person is, the more chances of the technique failing increases. Or I would have spammed this and already brainwashed people like Whitebeard. Yes, sometimes their brain bursts out. That's a thing that happened with many Marines who came after Hina that day. It's a 50 to 50 chance that a person will survive. I only took the chance with Hina since I simply didn't care if she died or not. And also the fact that there were many others besides her to be used as a spy. If it was this simple, I would have already brainwashed Vivi too. Though it's true that I am still hypnotizing her every day. It's nothing extreme, just pure love. Can't take any chances. I shook the thoughts away. Anyway, I should focus on brainwashing him. I need to concentrate, wait. Abruptly, after sensing a presence, I looked at my side. There a woman with red hair was lying. She wasn't unconscious. A grin formed on my face. Luck luck fruit can easily enhance his chances of survival. Perfect. The world is on my side. Laughing, I approached the woman who shrank backward. She recognized who I was. Eskai Emperor. Oh, is that how I'm known around here now? It has a feel to it. The one and only Sky Emperor. I crouched down and patted the woman's head. My eyes curled up as I smiled. 
If you don't want to die after being raped by horses, do as I say. The next day, address Rosa. What? You encountered Lucifer, the Sky Emperor. Doflamingo cried in surprise to the mock vice in front of him. Yes, Daffy, it was a dangerous experience. I don't know why I felt that way. I never felt this scared in my life and... Mokvice returned safely from Tizaro today. Daffy wiped his sweat and sat down on his seat after taking a breath. Tell me everything in detail. In. Yes. So, when I reached Tizaro, Mokvice started to talk about everything he saw. About Riki's sword slash. And how strong she was. Yes, she is a part of the Sky Emperor's people. When Lucifer came down from the sky, he and the robot chatted quite casually in. Mokvice kept explaining things to him as Daffy kept sweating. From the detailed explanation, and because of Mach View's fear, he even exaggerated some things. Riki's image in his mind grew to be a dangerous existence. And most frighteningly, he started to sweat. When that monster came, he took the red-haired woman and unconscious Tazaro to her room. After that, he suddenly teleported behind me. And I was scared shitless. Oh, that's right. Mokvice then slipped his hands in his pocket, taking out a letter. He handed me this letter and asked me to deliver it to you in. Daffy had a frown on his face. He accepted the letter and unfolded it as his eyes under the sunglasses arched up. Don Quixote da Flamingo. I will ignore that you were after my prey. Reading this line, Daffy's veins popped up. Cuckoo. Tazaro was initially my prey. Although he was very angry, he still decided to read further. I have some business with you, and I would like to have some chat together while drinking tea. All right, I will let your subordinate go without any harm but be careful to not mess with me in the future. Sayonara, smiley face, eh. The smiley emoji got on Daffy's nerves, but he just sighed. It's lucky that you didn't touch my family, or I wouldn't have cared that you are an emperor. Daffy cared most about his family, his subordinates. He was one of the few antagonists who did so, but there was still a problem left. But what does he want from me? He wondered, why did Amon want to meet him? He felt it's not something that will harm him or he would have decided to weaken him by taking out Mokvice. Still, all emperors are freaks. He might be just too arrogant and let Mokvice go. I should prepare for his coming here. Daffy felt irritated that he didn't specify a date, so he has to be on guard every day from now on. Unfortunately, Amon won't let him sleep peacefully for more than one month. Chapter 118 A Meeting After Riki was taken to the submarine by short motor and Amon handed the letter to Mokvice, he returned to his new puppets. Amon was sitting on a sofa in a room on Grand Tizaro. He was looking at the two people who were sitting on the sofa in front of him. One of them was Gil Dizarro, the owner of this ship, and the other one was Baccarat, the red-haired woman. Unlike Hina's emotionless state, both of these two are smiling. Amon was inspecting both of them. What are your names? Both of them opened their lips at the same time. I am Gil Dizarro, my lord. My lord, I'm Baccarat. The two of them were now successfully brainwashed. They didn't even receive much damage like Hina did. They could feel emotions perfectly unlike Hina, but they still held Amon as their lord. This was what Amon called perfect brainwash. Good. Amon scratched his cheeks with a smirk on his face. All of this was because of Baccarat. The luck luck fruit power is awesome. I ordered the woman to steal my and Tazaro's luck and use it on herself. She did so in complete fear. After that, I successfully brainwashed her. And since her luck tripled, she didn't die or get any other side effect too. Amon chuckled lightly. Good grief. After doing that, I ordered the brainwashed Baccarat to use the tripled luck on the unconscious Tazaro, and then I started to brainwash him too. It was an easy game. Amon successfully brainwashed him as well. Amon had a single thought then. I wonder, what if I mix luck luck fruits powers and karma karma fruits power together? It would be interesting. Amon might even unlock the one and only protagonist Aura using them. He cracked up at the thought. Anyway, Amon got up. I will be going. I need to treat Riki. Look after the ship. I will be back soon. Amon's body turned blue. Bye. A week later. Ha 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 ha
only to start laughing again. Ha ha, ha, and the girl was Riki. She was making an uwu face and started to twist her body while touching her crotch. Yes, yes, I got a bounty, and it surpasses wiper. Fuck fuck, ah, uh, I'm wet. She was talking shamelessly while people around her ignored her and walked past with an embarrassed face. The kids around pointed their fingers at her wet shirt, showing her bosom, but their parents quickly covered their eyes and grabbed them away. Beside her, Shore Motor was sitting on the wall while eating an apple. He didn't mind what she was saying and just observed her acts. He took a bite. Lady, won't you catch a cold like this? Even though your arms are healed, you will again fall sick. Boss will then lock you in your room again. Asterisk bam. Asterisk. Ah. Ricky threw one of her sheathed swords at his head as he fell on the other side of the wall. Though he quickly got up the next second. Ouch, that hurt. But I'm not wrong. Shut you up. I will cuck that bastard if he locks me again. I'm going after Yona, don't you know? She is so cut to ee. I always had my eyes on her. Ricky hugged herself and rolled on the water with closed eyes. Oh. I'm waiting for the fateful night when we will become together. Ahem. Hearing the fake cough, Ricky opened one of her eyes. Soon both her eyes grew up. Be bro. This is not what it looks like. I swear. Shore motor sighed from the side. She took a 180 degrees turn in a second. Such a pure girl. In front of the fountain, Amon was standing with Yona hiding behind him in fear of Riki. Her eyes were glaring at her, screaming, Lord, punish this girl. Riki cried tears while Amon walked away. He glanced at her one last time. Look after this, Yona and I will be going hunting for a while. Yona is one of Amon's most loyal subordinates. So it makes sense that Amon will trust her with something powerful. Seeing a holy priest handling such a dark power would be interesting. Though it's a mystery if Yona, the girl who spent her life serving humans, would choose to accept such power. Amon glanced at Yona. But you will do that for me, won't you? He laughed and flew after grabbing Yona. In Marahoy's, an important meeting was being held. Slam. Look everyone, this is the bounty of the new girl. An executive of the government slammed a paper on the large round table. There were around 30 people sitting. Among them, Sengoku, Kong, and Sakazuki were also present. This executive's name was Baron. He was a middle-aged man with a thin build and had a goat beard on his chin. He wasn't particularly a greedy person, but even he was smart enough to take an aspiring chance. Knowing that the nobles wanted Lucifer's bounty to increase, he was trying his best to make it happen so that he could get a bonus or even a raise. This girl is said to be one of the sisters of Lucifer, Baron explained. According to the report, the person who defeated the vice admirals in the raid was also her. But since there was zero information on her because she appeared when everyone was knocked unconscious, we held back from giving her a bounty. But now, she got a bounty already. It would take a great amount of strength to raid the largest entertainment city by herself along with only some robotic toys. Even more so, she defeated Gil Tazaro and his subordinates. That was a feat. Tazaro was around Admiral level, and calculating her previous feats, she should revive a bounty higher than Fire Fist Wiper. Although it seems Gil Tazaro was still alive and ruling over the Tazaro from the Sky Emperor's arrival there, it is most likely that they have formed an alliance. Although this news was kept hidden from the general mass, as requested by Amon, the government did get a glimpse of it. Obviously, it was impossible to fully cover because of Morgan, but the WG blocked most of it. The only news out to the general mass was, Sky Emperor's subordinate defeats the richest man on Earth. There was no news out on what happened later on. Along with WG, the emperors with vast networks such as Big Mom assumed that Gil Dazaro was in an alliance with Amon, nothing more than that. But since the WG knows about the destruction Riki caused, she got a bounty. Considering all this, this girl, Sky Sword Riki's bounty of 750 million seems small. 750 million belly. As Baron yelled, everyone started to murmur hearing this. It was quite a high number for the first bounty, but he was right. Just considering her relationship with Amon, she should have a higher bounty. Among the people present there, a fat man opened his mouth. First, her brother broke the history by receiving the highest first-time bounty there is, and now this girl? People nodded hearing him. She indeed should be the most dangerous person after the Sky Emperor himself and his army. She deserves a bigger bounty. Baron smirked internally. That's what I was saying. She should have a higher bounty. Not only that, with such a powerful girl under him, Lucifer should get a bounty boost as well. I suggest a four billion belly. All right, all right. Calm down. 
The old voice of Kong stopped his sentence. This isn't big enough to increase his bounty. Don't think I'm not aware of you guys' greedy thoughts. I can smell them. You won't get a promotion like this, young ones. Kong laughed a little. Let us observe a little more. He's just a kid after all. Don't get too hyped. Along with Baron, everyone went silent. Baron pulled his courage to say some more words. BB, sir. You can't underestimate him just because he is young. He killed Admiral Kazaro after all, dash. A voice cut him. What nonsense are you spouting? Flash. Everyone looked outside the window where a blinding light flashed. There, a man with a severed arm and torn off yellow suit was standing. Killing me isn't that EAC. It was. Admiral Kazaru. Kong laughed from the side. He knew Kazaru was alive, his Viva card was still fine after all. In the end. Sigh. Baron just sighed. I will have to wait until Lucifer makes another move. He gave up this chance. But Baron's next chance will come soon because. Amon is going to hunt down another warlord. Sip? Ah, how do you have such great tea in this old ship, Brooke? Amon asked towards the tea drinking skeleton in front of him. Yohoho, -ho -ho. it's a secret. The skeleton answered with his iconic laugh. It was. Brooke. Chapter 119. It won't work, at least not on me. Tick. Amon placed the cup of tea on the table. Currently, he was sitting on a creepy old ship with Yona beside him and a talking skeleton in front of him. The ship was in a foggy area with nothing more around it. But both Amon and Yona didn't seem to mind it. Amon reached here after wandering around the sea for a few hours. It was possible to find it even in this grand line, since there were pretty famous rumors about this foggy place already. Yona had a frown on her face while looking at the skeleton. My lord, is this an evil spirit? In this foggy sea, Amon had an unexpected encounter. Who? The skeleton jumped up. Evil spirit? You mean ghost? W where? Amon laughed seeing this. He didn't mind some humor every now and then. She is joking, Brooke. After calming down the skeleton, Brooke, who he just met a couple of minutes ago, Amon patted Yona's head. Now, now, he is not an evil spirit. I think it's the effect of revive revive fruit. Brooke laughed. Yoho. That's right. You are quite knowledgeable. It is indeed the effect of revive revive fruit. The fruit revived me after I died. Brooke shredded tears. Ah, you are my first encounter who isn't scared of me. I'm so happy. Yo ho ho. Amon laughed with him. Yona was suddenly interested. A fruit that can revive people? Like the one from our legend? Amon shook his head. No, the one in Birkin Legends isn't this one. This isn't a devil fruit, but something scientific. Even Amon was confused if this was scientific or not. The one in Birkin myths was clearly just a myth, and nothing more. Even if it was something more, it didn't matter at all. Amon then looked at Brooke. Then Mr. Brooke, what do you think about joining me? I'm a king of a kingdom, an emperor of the sea. Though I assume you are not familiar with that term. I'm in search of strong people, though I also need musicians. Brooke suddenly got emotional. Yo-ho, I've been stuck here for 50 years already. Ha, huh. I would thank you if you take me in. Brooke bowed slightly as Yona stared at him with narrowed eyes. I have to be careful of the evil spirit. But, Brooke continued, it's such a pity that I can't leave this foggy area. Why is that? Amon feigned ignorance. My shadow has been stolen away by a big-bellied man. A shadow is the second soul of a being. If I go out in the sun without one, I will be burned alive by the sunlight. Is that a devil fruit ability too? Yes, Brooke answered Yona's question. Without retrieving my shadow, I can't join you. I am terribly sorry. Brooke apologized while Amon was smiling reassuringly. However, he was frowning internally. This was supposed to happen two and half a year from now on. But Brooke met Gecko Moria now? Butterfly effect. Amon just sighed. It wasn't anything bad. Rather, it is surely because of his presence. Do you know who it is? Amon feigned more ignorance. The fat man, I mean. Brooke went silent, searching his memories. Gecko Moria. Yes. His name was Gecko Moria. Amon made a surprised face. Oh, now I understand. He is one of the seven warlords, a system newly formed in your absence. Amon already chatted with Brooke and Brooke talked about how he's been wandering in the sea for years. Amon continued. He is someone who ate the shadow shadow fruit. I can see what you meant by my shadow got stolen. That's his fruit's power. Retrieving the shadow from him isn't that hard, but it's not easy either. Brooke nodded. I know it's hard. I experienced it myself, but I was still planning to do my second attempt today, Yoho. Amon smiled. You don't have to, 
I have some business with Gecko Moria. When I'm done, you will get your shadow back. Brooke frowned with his non-existent burrows. I will get my shadow back just like that. Wait, he plans to kill him. It would make sense that his shadow would return even with him not being there only if Moria dies. After a moment of thought, he sighed. This is none of my business. After all, even I am a pirate who did bad things. Even so, here the bad guy seems to be Moria. Still, I can't allow you to do this for me. It's against Dash. Calm down. It's fine. I will be done in half an hour. If I fail, you can come to assist. You did say you already invaded there once, but seeing you here, it must mean you lost. Amon stated. In that case, assume it's a favor for me, your future leader, since you decided to join me. I am in need of a musician. Amon flashed a charming smile. Then, see you in 30 minutes. Amon didn't teleport but rather flew off at an astonishing speed. Teleporting would make lightning flash, thus creating light which will then hurt the shadowless Brook. Amon's first priority now is getting strong subordinates. Although Brook's fruit is something that can grant a third chance to Amon, he has already eaten a fruit. While he does plan to eat two more fruit, this wasn't one of them. If subordination doesn't work, no. Only if subordination doesn't work, will I extract the fruit from today. This is a line Amon drew. Now I need immediate strong people. I don't have enough time to extract fruits then give them to someone who's under me and then train them. It will be too long and inconvenient. Although that's the case, there can be variables. Like Shadow Shadow Fruit. Gecko Moria doesn't deserve it. Z Z Z Z. After flying far from Brook, Amon expanded his observation and looked for Thriller Bark Island. His 300 kilometers range easily caught the floating island since it could only be hiding in the foggy area. He teleported at the top of Thriller Bark and stared down at it with shining red eyes. Amon was looking for a certain person. Ghost Princess, Perona. He found her after a single second. The holder of one of the Opus Fruits, Hollow Hollow Fruit. With its abilities, she is truly fearsome. She might even be successful at taking down emperors, though certain people would be immune to her, depressing ghosts, such as pessimistic people. The ones who are already depressed can't be depressed even more after all. After inspecting her, Amon teleported inside her room silently. HM 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 HM. A pink-haired girl was playing with half-transparent white creatures, ghosts. The girl was Perona, a subordinate of Gecko Moria. Amon will kill Gecko Moria today. Amon doesn't have any use for him. But the other people along with Perona are different. Killing them won't benefit him, so he will just recruit them instead. I want to take over the world. Sign my name as the leader of this planet in the space station up in the other planets. For that, I need strong people under me. They don't necessarily have to be super loyal. Being scared is enough. If they say no, he will then proceed to brainwash. While Perona was lying on the bed on her tummy, Amon walked from behind her. He placed his hands on her shoulders silently. Ah. Who is it? Irritated, the girl turned around. Absalom, how many times did I tell you to not sneak up on me in my room? Perona's eyes grew as her brain caught up to the situation. The one who sneaked up is not Absalom, but rather a person she doesn't know? Assassin. As the thought crossed her mind, she instantly prepared for battle. She pointed her palms at the assassin. Negative hollow. A ghost came out of Perona's hand and rushed forward. It's a ghost that would drain the will of any person it comes into contact with, making them very negative and depressed about themselves. Everyone would be affected by it, even if they have conqueror's hockey. The ghosts went through the assassin, Amon's body. There is a way to defend against this ghost. As long as the person was already depressed, they would be fine. Meh, Amon patted his chest. He was fine. A depressed soul can't be more depressed, right? Don't bother, it won't work. Amon stretched his body while the surprised Perona started to spam ghosts. Shoo 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 shoo. None of them worked, in fact, some of her ghosts became depressed instead. In Brooke's ship, it has only been 50 seconds since Amon left. Brooke was still surprised. My, he is so fast. I didn't even see him. Yo-ho. He then slowly turned his head towards Yona. Then, would you let me see your panty, Kayaha? Before he could finish his words, Yona's hair started to float in the air as they rushed towards him. As I thought, you were an evil spirit, or else what type of man wants to see a girl's panties? Yona's hair was about to catch him, but Brooke barely got out. Yoho. I'm sorry, you who? Brooke started to run while Yona chased after him. I will exorcise you, evil spirit. Chapter 120 The Shadow Shadow Fruit. Swoo. The pink haired girl, Perona, spammed ghosts towards Amon, but Amon didn't seem to be affected at all. 
He didn't explain why, while Perona was dead confused. This never happened before. Why are my ghosts not working? And what up with that deadly aura? It was as if a predator was playing with its prey. A few seconds passed, seeing Amon not showing any hostility, Perona stopped. She decided to first inquire about his identity. W. Who are you? She was still on her guard, but he didn't attack. Amon stared at her with aloof eyes. Lucifer, the Sky Emperor. Amon's smile radiated the same dangerous gleam it was radiating in his bounty poster. Perona's body shook. Dangerous. Even in her shocked state, Perona seemed to catch on to his words as her round eyes grew. Now that I look at him, yes. She pays attention to the newspaper, so she recognized him even though her mind was hyperactive right now. But just as she recognized him, another thought crossed her mind. Wait, no. This is not a good thing. Why is a former warlord of the sea, a current emperor of the sea here? She only reached one conclusion as her legs became weak. He's here to hunt Gecko Moria. Perona took steps back. If Moria is hunted down, she will also be because of being his subordinate. Wasn't that right? But she won't give up without a fight. Even if her negative hollow was nullified, she had more attacks. They would damage him for sure. But would it be a good idea to provoke an emperor? Ultimately, at that thought, Perona stopped. Her life was precious. Besides, the aura around Amon didn't let her think of any smart moves. She decided to take the easy route and inquire about his intention. Yes, sir. How can I help you? Sweating, Perona gulped a few times in this short sentence. Ha ha. Amon laughed reassuringly, but his dangerous aura was still present there. I won't harm you, considering you stop attacking me. Perona gulped again. It's good that you recognize me. She nodded shakily. I am not here to harm you. Rather, I am here to recruit you. I need strong people like you. Amon had a smile on his face. Perona knew she wasn't that strong to attract an emperor of the sea, but she felt good being complimented. Normally, Amon would have chosen a more laid-down approach. He would have talked reassuringly, but since Perona's personality was that of a laid-down person, acting the same won't work. Acting hard was the way. Amon continued. Join me, you will receive tremendous bonuses. There aren't many restrictions either. Amon smirked seeing Perona's eyes glow for a brief second. After all, an invitation from a person like him is a big deal. He pushed further. I'm sure you don't like this place filled with corpses. After joining, I will grant you a place to stay above the clouds. A few seconds passed while Perona's surprised mind understood what he meant. An emperor was inviting her. For the first time, she felt a little relieved in his presence. Won't he provide more protection than Moria? To begin with, she was only working at this shabby place because of protection from marines. Being under a warlord was beneficial. But, if she can get more protection, then why not? After all, Moria doesn't even treat her nicely. The word, bonuses also caught her attention. She almost decided it, but she had a thought. Currently, everyone's top priority was Amon, Marines, Pirates, and Emperors would bite him the moment they get a chance. Will it be a good idea to go under him? Perona gulped, and what if I decline? While she managed to ask that, Amon's smile turned cold and his eyes darkened. His previous aura returned as Perona felt her legs shake. She was one step away from peeing herself. This was the aura of an emperor. It's pretty clear, isn't it? You will be tortured before I kill you. Amon finished his words with a crazy snicker. Sigh, psychopath. Did she have any choice other than to accept his offer now? As her first job, Perona was ordered to propose the same offer to the other two mysterious four other than Gecko Moria. If they declined, she should capture them. So Perona left to do so in fear. The mad Dr. Hogback accepted her offer since he was only here for his dead crush. The offer included the well-being of his crush even after Moria's death, so he didn't mind accepting it. However, Absalom didn't accept it. He retorted but Perona easily defeated and captured him. All this happened in under five minutes, so Moria was still unaware of it all. Amon forced Absalom's body to shut down by injecting electricity into his brain. He will brainwash him later in Baccarat's presence. Truly, the power to hypnotize and brainwashing people is very handy. Amon felt lucky that he researched the hypnotic guy's boy from years ago. If not, he might have missed a lot of opportunities now. Now, rather than meaninglessly killing them, Amon can use human beings to their fullest. The things that are unachievable by hypnotism can be done by brainwashing. All right, your job is done, Perona. I rate you a five star for your first job. Perona smiled smugly. She liked how he didn't just kill Absalom. Maybe he wasn't as bad as she thought. She opened her mouth excitedly. 
then dash. It's fine. Amon cut Perona as if he knew what she was about to say. You don't have to fight Gecko Moria. I will take care of it myself. Rather, send your ghosts all around the island. Try using them as eyes. Soon, all the shadows will leave the zombies' bodies. I need you to deliver me to their locations. Amon couldn't sense shadows using observation. Even though he could use Thunder Eyes to back that weakness up, it would generate light. While it won't harm the shows themselves, the light generated will hurt, and even kill, the shadowless people lingering on the island. They are precious test subjects, I can't let them die. Now it's Moria's turn. Deciding this, Amon teleported to Moria's room. Hmm, hmm. In a huge room, an ugly white-skinned humanoid creature was lying down with his back, his hands locked behind his head in a carefree manner. He was laying around like he always does, a person who dreams to become the pirate king by lazing around. It was Gecko Moria, one of the seven warlords of the sea. Z Z Z Z. Meh. Hearing the sound of passing electricity, Moria rather dismissed it as flies roaming around with his eyes closed. No. Something is off. After a few moments of silence, Moria felt a little strange as he opened his eyes with a frown. His eyes met an old pocket watch moving in front of his eyes. They were instantly locked on the watch's rhythmic movements as Moria's eyes then started to spin. Eh? Where am I? Slowly, a man's silhouette appeared in front of him. He was the one holding the watch. Good grief. This wasn't even a challenge. Lazy bastard. After Amon teleported behind Moria, he only observed as Moria lazed around. In the end, expecting that even hypnotizing would work, Amon took out his pocket watch. Generic hypnotization doesn't work on everyone, ambitious, smart, or strong people, and some specific people are immune to it. But Moria was none of them. Lazy idiot. Amon easily hypnotized Moria with his decent skills in this field that he's been cultivating for eight years before revealing himself in front of him. He had only one question for Moria. What did your devil fruit look like? It was a question many people heard from Amon in 19 years of his life, but no one is alive to tell the tale of it. It looked like a mudikin. Moria answered the simple question in a simple way and received a simple death. Amon POV. Moria was a worthless man. Such a deadly devil fruit was wasted on him. Yes, he was, but not anymore. I looked in front of me. Moria was lying on the floor with a hole in his chest, not breathing anymore. I have killed him without him even realizing it. Warlords are weak. In my left hand, there is a fruit basket. I brought this from Skypea a second ago. The basket contains five round green fruits of the same type that didn't exist in my previous world. However, I know this was the mudikin fruit that he was talking about since I do memorize their names every day, even now. There are millions of fruits in this world. I only know a small part of them. There were cases where my victims didn't know what their own fruit's name was, so I had to miss out on some good fruits. Such a shame. But after I gain memory reading abilities, this won't be a problem anymore. Slowly, one of the fruits started to turn strange. The green skin became black in color and started to form golden encrypts on it. There were green leaves that started to pop up out of nowhere. The fruit now looked like a proper devil fruit. H.M. Suddenly, I sensed someone approaching this room. The person pushed open the door. Creak. Hey, mister. All the zombies are collapsing and shadows are leaving the bodies. It was Perona who I asked to watch after the shadows. What do you want to do now? She stopped talking after seeing Moria's dead body and the hole in his chest. She was too caught off guard by the crimson blood to notice the strange fruit in my hand. Gecko Moria. Perona gulped. Is dead. Perona was shocked. But I didn't care. She was a pirate. She obviously killed many people in her life. This shouldn't be too much for her to bear. I ordered her. Ignore him. He's already dead. She knew if she didn't want the same to happen to her, she had to obey. Provide me the shadow's location. I threw a walkie-talkie at her. Talk in that thing. I will hear everything with my earpiece. Now, start. Perona was still shocked, but she pulled her courage to move her lips. Who can guarantee that this man won't kill her too? Why yes, there are 150 shadows in the northeast area. I nodded. ZZZTT. Teleporting around, I entered my slow world. Around me were countless shadows, flying out of the island. I started to grab them and tied them up with a rope. Yes. A shadow freed from the clutch of the shadow shadow fruit user can be touched by normal people. It was shown in anime too if I recall right. Luckily, shadows are immune to light, so they didn't perish by my flash. Like this, I grabbed a few and tied them. Grabbed and tied. Grabbed and tied. 
Perona kept giving me the locations on my earpiece. Her ghosts are useful. Some shadows have already left the foggy area, but I didn't care. I just moved fast and brought them back here. These shadows were important to me. They're like an army. I only miss the ones who already entered the bodies of the people residing on this island. Oh, my shadow returned to me. Why, yes. I could even hear some of their voices from up here. Though their happiness would be definitely short-lived. First, let me give the fruit to Yona. Then I will deal with them. I continued capturing shadows for another 10 minutes before I was able to gather around 6,000 shadows. It was fun, to be honest. Well, now time to give this to my dragoness. First, let's talk with her a little. I'm not sure if she will accept this. Since Shadow is a second soul, will she be fine playing with that so-called mortal soul? So, what do you think? I asked Yona. It's a good fruit. Yona had a darkened face as she exchanged glances between me and the fruit. This is harder than I thought. I also noticed Brooke who was broken into pieces in a corner of the deck, acting to be dead. Chapter 121 Steam After Amon left, Yona started to chase Brooke throughout the ship. Although Brooke's gentlemanliness wasn't at the level of Sanji, he was still against the idea of harming Yona. More so, when he could feel she was only trying to capture him, not harm him in any other way. Finally, giving up, Brooke handed himself over to Yona who chanted some weird lines as Brooke acted dead. Good, the evil spirit is now gone. Yona made a proud face after exorcising an evil spirit. She almost jumped up in happiness. But it was then when she witnessed black humanoid creatures, almost as if shadows, flying through the air. They definitely looked like evil beings too. She assumed they were this skeleton named Brooke's friends. Looking at the sky, Yona closed her eyes. Taking a deep breath, she jumped. Jeppo. This was Jeppo that she learned along with many others from Wiper. Yona jumped in the air and started to go towards the shadows. However, they weren't bonded by the concept of gravity so they moved very fast, out of Yona's reach. Yona's face distorted while she tried her best to reach the shadows. However, zzz, -Z -Z. there was no need for her to work hard anymore because the familiar sound of passing electricity made her sigh in relief. In seconds, the shadows that passed hundreds of kilometers were captured by a trail of lightning. Indeed, it was Amon. Yona returned to her ship with a smile on her face. As expected of Kami, he is also strict against evil spirits. As a follower of a religion that believed in multiple gods, but worshipped only one, Yona believed the more evil spirit she hunts for her kami, the more her kami will have an increase in rank. Her kami was still a young god. To become omnipotent, he needs more divinity. Yona glanced at the bones of the evil spirit in a corner of the ship. Her eyes narrowed while Brooke was sweating. He was waiting for Amon to come back since he knew Amon would help him. But Yona didn't know that as she went back to the table where tea was kept. It was already proved that this spirit named Brooke wasn't a devil fruit user, rather an actual evil spirit since her exorcism worked. Her kami would never favor him after learning he's an evil spirit. She saw him hunt them down just a second ago after all. He might even praise her. Praise. If that was right, why was he saying this now? Yona, this will grant you the power over shadows. You will be the lord of shadow. All shadows of the world would be your subordinate, serving you all their life. You will be able to call people back from death. The other world, you will be the goddess of death herself. If he really wanted to punish evil, why was he offering such an evil power to her? What do you think? It's a good fruit. Yona was suddenly confused. Her face darkened as she glanced between Amon and the fruit. From the side, Brooke was also observing the situation. Brooke's shadow had returned to him. Amon allowed it. So Brooke could guess what is happening here. So he killed that man named Moria and extracted his fruit. Can everyone after 50 years of my isolation do such a thing? He was very interested. But since he already promised he would join his army after gaining his shadow back, thus making him on his leader now, Brooke held back from prying into his new leader's secret. To begin with, it's not a bad thing. Now, Brooke was more interested in Yona's response. What will she choose? A few minutes passed. Amon stared at Yona who had a darkened face, thinking, She is taking so much time. I assume she would be happy to take it after a while, to be honest. Oh well dash. Amon had an idea. He lightly pinched her cheeks as Yona's eyes twitched and she returned to reality. My Kami. Have you decided? Hearing Amon, she made a determined face as if she decided something. Though Amon still couldn't tell what she decided. All right, future sight, dot. After waiting for three seconds, Amon's vision twisted and the space became blurry. He saw the future. 
Unfortunately, Yona wasted a lot of time, so his low-level future vision couldn't see what she chose. So he rather chose to make her view things from another perspective. Yona, Amon called her name. One of the rare occasions. The most important things are most of the time dirty. Every god needs someone to manage their dirty work, and I need you. Yona blinked a few times. Amon continued. You know, I already ate one fruit, but I absolutely need this power over death. I could have chosen Riki or any other person. You should be grateful that I chose you. Amon lied. He doesn't plan to give Riki any fruit other than the mythical zone that the AI is hiding. Still, by making her see this from the lower perspective, making it seem like Amon is doing her a favor, the words hit Yona harder. As Yona's lips quivered, Amon smiled and caressed her hair. You will be the keeper of death, my executive who will break the concept of death for me. For the sole reason of erasing the concept of death from my people. It's harder than I thought. Ignoring his thought, Amon said the half-truth. Although he can revive people with the fruit's power, after the job is done, it won't be the same person anymore. It is a flawed reincarnation. However, Amon didn't mind it. He only had an attachment with a few people. He didn't care about the leftovers. Besides, the power of shadows is already awesome enough. Amon again looked to the future, still too long for him. Yona looked down, contemplating on his words. In truth, Amon didn't have to say all this. She already decided that she would do anything her lord asks for. Handling an evil power like this was just a small deed. However, Amon's words weren't meaningless. She did receive another perspective in this power. Just because this power seemed evil, doesn't mean it is evil. So Yona was feeling a lot better. Oh. Ignoring the future, Amon also learned this through his trusty mind reading powers. To solidify things, Amon pushed further. You know Yama, right? Yona nodded. He has the power of death, but does that make him evil? No. He smiled. Just because you are managing this power doesn't mean you are evil. Assume I am letting you borrow one of my powers, thus making you a part of me. Bullshit. But it worked. Anyone would love to be praised. Even more so, getting praise from your god. But this exceeded the word praise. She was offered the power of her own kami. She would become a part of him with it. Then she would obviously accept it. In my kami. Yona stuttered with shining eyes. Yona didn't have any romantic feelings for Amon, just like how he didn't have any for her. The feeling she directed towards Amon the most was faith. She was an extreme devotee. You don't have to say anything more. I already decided to accept it. Is it to murder a hundred virgins and thousand of children? As long as you ask, I shall do it. Compared to that, this is a blessing. I am more than happy that you are bestowing me with such powers. Yona bowed. Brooke from the side seemed to be enjoying what was happening here. Some words went above his head, but he understood the gist of it. So Amon is a god? That's what he understood. As someone who returned from the cycle of reincarnation. Brooke did believe in divinity, though he has yet to confirm that thought. However, he did feel a strange sense of familiarity with Amon. It was almost as if, just like himself. Amon had also died already. Though, it's just a feeling. He assumed Amon just lived a dangerous life where he almost lost his life many times. Now, now. No useless thoughts, yo ho ho. Brooke intensely stares at the duo. In the end, Yona accepted his proposal. She would take it. The fruit was good for her overall growth, and her Kami's growth as well. She will utilize its power to the fullest. It was then a, yo ho ho. Looks like you returned before half an hour. You weren't boasting. Brooke. After finally building up some courage, reformed and looked at Amon. Yona, who was wiping her teary eyes, suddenly made a shocked expression as she looked at Brooke. Eh, my exorcism didn't work. What a powerful evil spirit. Amon laughed again. Yona, I asked you to not attack him. He's your new colleague, treat him nicely. Brooke laughed while Yona protested for a while. He was satisfied with his new leader's attitude. He wondered how life would work for a pirate like him not being a pirate. But, what? There are five pirates more powerful than any other in this world, and you are one of them. Brooke was surely surprised when he found out he was still a pirate. He felt a strange warmness enveloping his heart. But he doesn't have a heart, yo ho 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 ho. Perona just looked at him strangely. After that, nothing special happened on the ship. Yona ate her fruit, and Amon took them both to the thriller bark. They flew into the sky to avoid all the zombies. After Brooke learned about Amon's identity from Perona and before proceeding to insert the shadows back into the bodies of the zombies, Amon had a talk with Brooke. As you can see, we are quite the evil group. 
Though we don't hurt innocents, we do not show any mercy to any of the pirates. Again, Amon said the half-truth. He wouldn't think twice to use any innocent people for his gain. However, it was true that his subordinates were different. If he didn't show any kind of morals, his faction would never last long. It's a fact. Humans are emotional. They would surely feel sadness, pity, sympathy for others. Amon can't let this small fact mess big things up, so he keeps his condition to himself. However, it is true that as long as the opposite party is a pirate or criminal, I won't show any mercy, Amon said in a serious voice. He pointed behind him, where all the shadows were tied. All these shadows belonged to people who were brave enough to come to Thriller Bark. They were definitely pirates since marines won't come after a warlord, Amon said. I plan to use these shadows rather than freeing them, just like Moria. I also plan to get the shadows of the people hiding in the darkness of this island back. Brooke listened to him in silence. This was no different than Moria. No, maybe a little different. Amon asked the important question. Are you fine with that, Brooke? Brooke took some time to answer his question. Ultimately, morals are actual things. Brooke had morals thus. Even being a pirate, he cared about children and sang them songs. But in no sense was he an innocent man. He also did bad deeds like stealing and robbing, even though he had his limits. So, the answer was simple. I'm fine with it. I rather feel good that you are asking for my thoughts even though I just joined. I would thank you for that. Yoho. Humans are emotional. Emotions are easy to manipulate. Amon smiled with his eyes closed. Same time. On Fishman Island, a familiar yet unfamiliar face to Amon was preparing to enter the new world. Hey, catch that man. He's a criminal. He was currently being chased by Fishman guards. He stole food from a restaurant after all. Haha, <laughs> sorry guys. I don't have money. I will pay later, for real. The guards didn't stop. They kept chasing him. Stop him. A human would always be human. A large crowd of fishmen blocked his way. The man sighed. Who would have thought? Ah, so troublesome. I guess I have to force my way through. Fate would go according to Amon. Ahem. The man's hand shined. His fist became half transparent. Sorry guys, he swung his fist. Steam fist. It was the pirate king's son, Steam Fist Ace. Chapter 122, Do Quixote Da Flamingo Steam Fist One day, the ship of the Spade Pirates was severely damaged, and the only member of the crew back then, poured gas. D. Ace and Mass Deuce were stranded on an island in the East Blue, Sixus Island. It was a dangerous island where they barely found any food. On their sixth day starving, Ace came across a treasure chest where a strange fruit was kept. Ace took the first bite. Mass Deuce took the second. Naturally, poor D. Ace became the person to possess the fruit Amon left there. Steam steam fruit. Eh, my attack was blocked? In front of him Ace, the Knight of the Sea, Jimbei stood. Just like that, two more weeks passed by. Ace was captured by fishman guards. Amon learned about this but didn't take any actions. Finally, Ace was able to escape. Barely, Ace and his crew came out of the fishman island safely. He was quite injured, but he made a new friend, Jimbei. After Jimbei tried to stop him, but ultimately got defeated as Ace unlocked hockey mid-battle, he let Ace go because of his respect for Ace. Now, the Spade Pirates were left to choose one of the three islands that their log pose was pointing at. Hmm, Raijin Island? I heard lightning rains in that place. That's dangerous. Ace was happy after unlocking this new power named Hockey, so he didn't mind going to Raijin Island. The problem was his crew members, they were too weak. Mass Deuce, Ace's first crewmate, made a suggestion. Ace, why not choose Risky Red Island? I heard it's a volcanic place, and it's old like Little Garden. Not only that, there is a rumor that there is a devil fruit that many factions are after. Ace grinned. Really? That's interesting. Then let's go there. Everyone in the crew agreed. Risky Red Island. An island with rumors swirling around it. They said in the past, a black dragon used to live there. After his death, the grave became a volcano. It erupts every now and then, without any sign. Still, unlike Raijin Island, people choose this island since the volcano is only in the middle of it and the other dangers are bearable. Everyone, let's go. The ship started to move towards the island, but how would things move after this? How would Ace react after meeting up with Kaidos and the Fifth Emperor subordinates on that island? Same time, Amon was in a room with a tall blonde man in front of him. The man had a grin plastered on his face. Kiki, so Sky Emperor, why is it that you are here? Why? Can't I come to this beautiful place as a tourist? I heard a lot about Dress Rosa, so I thought why not see it for myself. 
the Sky Emperor, Amon said after a laugh. Amon tilted his head with a dangerous gleam. Perhaps, are you against it, Da Flamingo? Kiki, not at all. I was simply curious. Indeed, it was Da Quixote Da Flamingo. Amon came to dress Rosa by himself. He didn't let Daffy know of this before and just enjoyed the scene of the One Piece World Spain. He enjoyed some food, observed some toys, flirted with girls, and watched the dance of Viola, all under a disguise. Viola kissed in the air towards him, meaning Daffy already found out about his arrival. As expected, Da Flamingo had truly learned of his arrival and sent people to respectfully take him to the royal palace. So here he was now, sitting in front of Da Flamingo, legs crossed. Ah. Oh. Is this fear I am feeling? The people who can make me feel this can be counted in one hand. Daffy was scared. Even though he knew Kaido was backing him, this was the guy who humiliated world nobles. He knew there were some screws loose in his head to do that. But there was another reason. It was the aura around Amon's body. This was the result of killing millions of lives in space. Amon had a passive presence of a slaughterer that strong people could easily see unless he decided to hide it himself, which he didn't do right now. Sensing the danger, even Daffy, who always uses Kaido's backing to scare people, was scared that Amon might snap and kill him. But he absolutely couldn't show his fear on the outside, or it would weaken his image. He knew he can't beat Amon, and from what he heard about his powers, Amon can destroy this place using that explosion attack. So Daffy was more careful. He can't beat him. He can't even touch him. In that case, playing passive and hoping he's not here to destroy things would be the smartest choice. He decided to talk about things first. But Amon opened his mouth first. Hmm, Daflamingo? Are you not happy with me here? Do you have any problem with my presence? Amon played with Daffy's mind while Daffy controlled his veins from popping up. Kiki, obviously not. But I assumed an emperor would be busier than this. He had his iconic grin plastered on his face. I was just being considerate. Amon laughed. I understand. It's good that you are such a considerate man, unlike how rumors suggest. Amon wasn't beating around the bush, he was not hiding under a mask either. This was the treatment Daffy deserved, he was just another pawn to Amon. Amon's smiling face took a serious turn. He was still smiling, but that smile was easily deemed dangerous. Daflamingo, Amon attracted his attention. Let me cut to the chase, I want you to hand over Caesar Clown to me along with Punk Hazard. You get it? What? Daffy's face froze. SD. I want SAD and Caesar Clown. Amon's face was grim. I'm not requesting it. I am demanding it. Hand it over. Duffy failed to control his veins as they popped up. I can't do that. I work directly under Kaido. He wants the SAD. If you want it, then get it from Kaido. Oh my, Duffy. Amon grinned. Are you that eager to die? Under Amon's gaze, Doflamingo felt chills down his spine. Are you an idiot? Amon chuckled. Kaido? Do you think I care about him at all? I, Amon, can kill him in a second. After a short silence filled with shock, Daffy laughed hearing him. Don't get over your head, you aren't that strong, little emperor. He took out a newspaper. Admiral Kazaru is alive. Sky Emperor's mischief? Or plotting by the government? This was the headline. Yes, two weeks ago, after Kazara's arrival in the Mariehua, his status was changed again. People now knew Amon didn't kill him. For that, some even assumed Amon couldn't kill him. Daffy was one of them. Before, he assumed Amon was above Admiral and below Fleet Admiral. But after this, he assumed Amon was just around Admiral. Although Daffy was confident enough to beat an Admiral, he wasn't dumb enough to believe that he could beat Amon as well. However, I am confident Kaido can whip your ass, Lucy Dash. Zzzzz. Before Daffy could react, he was pinned against the wall. He blinked. Amon had his hand on his neck, his eyes looking deep within Daffy. Maybe Kaido really can but can. You? I can kill you here and Kaido won't know shit. Amon's voice was vibrating. His skin was blue. Donks out Doflamingo. Don't underestimate God. This was not arrogance. This was confidence. Amon was confident to run from Kaido, and that was enough for his morale to get a boost. Daffy started to sweat. I didn't even see him move. Cuckoo, monster. Zzzzzt. Daffy felt his body give up. Physical strength can't stop the nerve from being controlled. In the end, Daffy agreed to let Amon use Caesar Clown, but he won't hand him over fully. Amon accepted it. This was enough. He also knew Daffy won't reveal that Caesar is working for Amon too, since then Kaido will be enraged. Finally, Amon calmed down. Doflamingo, it was a good sight here in Dress Rosa. But since I'm done with my work here, 
I should now leave. Daffy chuckled. Cuckoo. Now, now, why don't you stay for a while more? I can be your guide here. Amon looked at him with a radiant smile. What are you up to, you slimy bastard? While Amon started to look into the future, Daffy continued. You haven't seen a lot of things, so why not? Doflamingo had a spare plan for Amon. From my underworld network, I heard he's a playboy. Sad. I will use it against him. He used that girl, Viola, against Sanji and Cannon. It would only make sense that he would use her against this playboy emperor as well. Rather, this time, he will use her entirely. Doflamingo dash. Creek. Before Amon could finish his question, the door was pushed open and a person entered the room. Tack, 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 tack. Her slow steps made both of them look. Sorry for the insertion, I have brought tea. It was a sweetly smiling woman, Viola. She made a surprised face as her eyes fell on Amon. Oh my, aren't you the handsome man who was watching my show? Amon nodded lightly with a smile. Doffy grinned internally, he asked for Viola to come here before. They made an act to attract Amon as well. Thinking such, Doffy made an angered face. Viola, didn't I tell you not to come in when I am having an important meeting? He continued. He is an important man. Why are you acting like this in front of him? Amon laughed internally seeing Doflamingo's act. He has seen into the future, and the development was fascinating. He played along. Does he want to seduce me with her? Fine. I also need a spy and dress Rosa. If he was offering his girl, Amon wouldn't reject. He widened his lips. Doflamingo, calm down. You should treat women more respectfully. Amon said as Doffy's frown disappeared. KK, if you say so. He then glanced at Viola. I don't really see her as a woman. She is trash dash. Doflamingo, that's not how you should treat them. Amon made a grim face. Doffy's internal grin widened. I understand. As a short silence enveloped the place, Doffy looked at Viola. Viola, get out for a second. She nodded with a nonchalant face and walked out after bowing in courtesy. As she went out, Doffy looked at Amon. Sky Emperor, what do you think about spending a night with her? I can see that you quite like her. Amon's eyes grew up in shock. Doffy grinned. Surprisingly, Viola has pretty high stamina. When the gigolo falls asleep, I will make her look into his memories. It will certainly help Kaido. Kukuku. Amon's grim face loosened up as he smiled. What an idiot cock. That night. Viola begged Amon to defeat Daffy since she saw how he pinned him against the wall. She bowed to the ground and cried. She told Amon about what happened in Dressrosa six years ago. But unfortunately, Amon simply didn't care. Daffy had quite the uses for him now. He wasn't beta enough to listen to a woman he met for a one-night stand. Miss Viola, let me be clear. I don't care at all. So, I would like to proceed with the main part of tonight, all right? Viola's tears started to fall down her naked body. Please. I beg you. Amon just crackled up. The answer was clear as Viola bit her lips. After she was rejected, Amon did as he pleased with her. The details would be omitted. Ultimately, Amon took her to Dizarro at night at a high speed and returned after making her into another brainwashed puppet with Baccarat's help. One spy and Dress Rosa completed. Just like that. Amon completed his journey in Dress Rosa. However, things will get very busy for him and his people. Because, even though Daffy won't reveal anything about him to Kaido, something big will happen in Risky Red Island and attract the strongest creature's wrath. Chapter 123 What the fuck? What? Doflamingo shouted at Viola who was looking down. She bit her lips and began to scratch her left arm with her right. Really? I couldn't read his memories since I fell asleep. It was a really wild night, so I was tired. Keck. Daffy's veins popped up as he grabbed her by the neck. Are you deliberately trying to anger me, Viola? He wanted to cut her into pieces with his strings, but he was barely able to control himself. Her power is too useful to him. In the end, he let her go. Bam. He punched the wall, creating a crater, and walked away. Stay away out of my sight for a few days. I don't want to see your dirty face. He didn't forget to add. He was acting all grumpy. Even though, to begin with, it was him who laid Amon and herself. Amon, who was flying in the sky 70 kilometers far from Dress Rosa, laughed hearing this. I didn't think Mr. Daffy was a cuck when I first watched the anime. Now, let's not get too caught up in the fun. Amon held himself back. He started to pay attention to a new piece of information. He recently got a report. Doflamingo should have also gotten it, as he was also a part of the underworld. The rumor of a dragon dragon fruit on Risky Red Island. 
This is a rumor that started a few days ago. However, Amon didn't care about it. To begin with, just like this, there were previous scamming situations. Three years ago, there was a rumor regarding OPOP Nomi. Amon came from the moon for that at once. But in the end, it was all a scam. Amon killed all the scammers for interrupting his busy life. This wasn't the only case. There were around 28 cases like this that Amon could recall that are worth remembering. There was even one outrageous claim like by Pirate King's Devil Fruit with 5 billion belly. This is when Amon learned to not trust everything there is in the underworld. So he wasn't taking this one seriously as well, more so when he doesn't remember a situation like this from the show. Still, he needs to be careful. Although there was no Dragon Fruit's appearance like this shown in the anime, anything can happen so he needs to try getting it. Amon passed by some birds flying in the sky. However, since Daffy learned about this too, Kaido's troops might come. He is the only emperor with whom I don't want to pick a fight. After all, he can come to my place flying and destroy everything. To beat Big Mom, Amon just needs to take out her three main homies. But to beat Kaido, who knows something terrible like Conqueror's hockey coating, Amon needs powers that he might or might not have at this point. It was something to be cautious of. But since this time the rumor is coming from a reliable source, Amon needs to test it by going there himself, or better, send someone who doesn't have any affiliation with the Fifth Emperor, at least to the general mass. Finally, it's time to meet him after four years. By him, Amon meant that man who he asked to set sail in the Blue Sea four years ago before leaving for the moon. He was Gonfall's son, Rio, who wasn't seen participating in the War of Liberated Tried. The reason was simple. He wasn't there in the Skypea back then. He didn't go to the 400th anniversary since to the outside world. He is someone who fled from Skypea. Along with Amon, only a few more people knew the truth. But before that, I need to finish some small jobs. Port SD. A should be heading to Risky Red Island too. I should check the Thriller Bark once before moving on with more important things. Thriller Bark was changing. ZZZ. Not far from Skypea, there was an island floating in the White White Sea. This island looked creepy from the outside, and it was creepier from the inside. Yes, this was the Thriller Bark. The ship of Gecko Moria. After taking over this land, Amon brought it into the sky. The outside world didn't know that Gecko Moria was now dead. It was because people didn't know the location of the Thriller Bark and couldn't confirm his death. Even if they could, they wouldn't know who killed him. So, just like Crocodile, Moria also died silently, unknowingly to the world. In the process, Amon's fame was interrupted. I will make a report myself. This would guarantee an increase in his bounty. Amon was all in for that. He was almost like an addict, wanting to see the numbers rise. Lost in thought, Amon slowly went towards the artificial ship island. Put that shit there, damn it. Are you fucking idiots? Riki was having a hard time. Her brother asked her to rebuild this new island he brought to the sky. It was quite strange how he was out there, bringing islands here, but she didn't question anything. It was not unnatural for her after she saw him taking over actual moons. Taking over islands only proved Amon was still left with human desires and also the fact he was growing stronger. Stronger? Huh. Riki laughed lightly. She knew better than anyone, there wasn't anyone who could beat her brother. So what was left to get stronger? Riki realized the answer to the questions without anyone telling her. Just because individually none can beat him, doesn't mean he is strong enough to individually beat everyone either. She was aware of this, so she would help him by becoming his sword. Riki was lost for a second as she gripped her sword only to get back to reality after seeing some people messing up their works. Ah. Oh. Hey, put those bricks in area. Three. Not here. Riki screamed towards the Birkins moving bricks. Amon decided to reconstruct this place, Thriller Bark, into a beautiful city. However, not a normal one. Rather, a dead city. From the outside, it will look new, but only zombies would live here. Normal Scipians are forbidden from entering here. Only Birkins and Shandians can sense they are too loyal to get any smart ideas. The previous creepy state is good to scare weak people, but it won't work on strong individuals. However, after reconstruction, the seemingly new city would scare a few people after observing the dead state. That's what Amon had in his mind when he decided to change this place. A newly built park with no living beings on it is more terrifying than a horror-themed one. Although some particular places will indeed be the same, like the massive mansion and the graveyard. It's just that new houses will be built around it, kept out of the outside visitors' eyes. The reason is that the hostages are kept inside, the people who were hiding on the island before, 
one of Big Mom's daughters as well. Unfortunately, Big Mom doesn't care about her, or Amon would have used her to threaten her. Also, there is Orz Jr. Amon is currently working on his DNA, but he was getting nowhere. He needs the research files of Vince Moke Judge. Uh, so annoying. Riki rubbed her temple while looking around. Yona was busy learning her new powers, so she wasn't able to get close to her. She cursed in her mind and started to pay attention to her surroundings. Z z z z. The sound of passing electricity entered Riki's ears. Amon teleported directly beside Riki, his elbow resting on her shoulders, his body leaning on her. Riki, what's up? Oh, shut up. I'm busy. Why'd I have to do your job, fuck? Amin laughed seeing her nonchalant reply. She wasn't even surprised seeing his sudden arrival. Endure it, endure it. Everything will be easy after we take over the world. HM. This picked Riki's interest as she giggled. Fufu. Yes, yes. That's why I am enduring it. Bro, I want beautiful girls to bathe me after we take over the world. You won't stop me then, okay? Amon stared at her for a second before sighing. Whatever you have your own dreams, I have mine. A short silence fell upon the duo. Riki bit her lips and smiled. I am doing everything for you, idiot. Anyway, where is Yona? I gave her a task. She should have completed it. Amon ignored her thought and asked. Riki pointed at the main mansion. Inside. She then ran to a spot where people were lazing around. Amon walked towards the mansion while people bowed in his presence. Shadows are supposed to follow their master forever. For that reason, when the master, meaning the body moves, the shadow also moves, and vice versa. If the shadow is forcefully moved, the main body will move too. This way, by cracking the neck of a shadow, Yona, who can touch shadows, can kill the actual person. Amon asked Yona to learn this technique two weeks ago, as it came with the passive ability of the fruit. Currently, Amon was standing in front of Yona, ordering her. All right. Yona, make me punch myself. Basically, Amon wanted another controller other than him. Yona nodded. She won't reject her Kami's will even if it was to harm himself. She raised her hand in the air as Amon's shadow moved like a ripple in water. Shadow Possession Yona then controlled Amon's hand to punch his face. Amon tried to resist the effect, but as expected, he was unable to. Fwoosh. Amon's hand twisted and his fist went towards his face. Bam. How? Before it could hit his face, his other hand stopped it. Not enough speed. While controlling me, try to force me to use my fruit. This was the main part. Controlling people's shadows to punch wasn't hard, but Amon wanted Yona to be able to control his devil fruit, to force him to use his fruit without him willing it. Yona nodded. Um, I will try, but it's hard. She tried it. Once. Bam. But the desired effect did not occur and Amon stopped the attack. Twice. Bam. Thrice. Bam. Fourth. Just like that. Yona tried 68 times. She was tired. My lord. I need rest. Seeing her sweating buckets and gasping for breath, Amon nodded. It's fine, take a rest. You did a good job. Yona fell on her but as Amon walked towards her and sat beside her, Yona had her head down, her face darkened, and her eyes narrowed. She couldn't do it. If only she was a bit more talent. Don't push yourself. Amon's hand on her shoulder stopped her haywire thoughts. Yes. Although, she did say that. Her mood didn't improve that much. To begin with, she didn't even improve that much over the last two weeks. This wasn't what she was good at. Amon patted her head, reading her mind. Calm down. You did well. Truth be told, Amon was disappointed. But he didn't show it. That wasn't how one should treat his subordinates. Ignoring his disappointment, Amon had a theory regarding this case. Maybe it wasn't about talent, but rather about intelligence. Red Dragon. Amon decided to explain his theory. You now ate a devil fruit. It's a new power that is different from your physical power, right? Confused, Yona looked at his face, but in the end answered, Yes, it's like an outer force. Amon stroked her hair. Try looking at it this way. When you try to control the other person's devil fruit, your goal is to control their body, their movements. Then try controlling that outer force rather than the body alone. Got that. Yona didn't answer. She was surprised. It was a new view on things. She praised her Kami's wisdom in her mind before standing up. My Kami. Can I try once more? Amon smiled. Yes. Amon stood a few meters far from Yona while she raised her hand in the air. The shadow of Amon moved according to her hand signals. Shadow possession. 
Amon's hand moved. Surprisingly, lightning was dancing around it. V. Vroom. It moved so fast that it broke the sound barrier and went towards Amon's face. For a second, he couldn't follow its movement, meaning it was moving outside his speed and observation hockey's limit. Something that should be impossible. Bam. Amon's fist landed on his face, breaking his nose. He was thrown meters away, breaking the wall and landing on the graveyard outside, surprising many Birkins and Riki. She quickly ran to him and looked at her brother's bloody broken nose and hand. Bro, what the fuck happened to you? And your arm. It broke. Amon smiled bitterly, which looked disgusting, and laid down. He wondered, what the fuck just happened? Chapter 124 Plants Shadows Shadows have no weight nor mass. Shadows are just the lack of light on a certain spot. Considering that, shadows shouldn't be tangible, let alone be manipulatable. Yet, the Shadow Shadow Fruit user has the power to touch shadows and even to control them. In that sense, by controlling the shadow, Yona could force people to use their DF power as well? Right, theoretically. This was Amon's goal. He wanted Yona to learn this. That way, she might be able to one day control people whose hockey is weak enough for the shadow possession to work and use them against their own allies. A perfect victim candidate should be Blackbeard with his fruit. Not considering Teach, this is still a necessary power-up. Amon thought while lying on the ground. When Amon's shadow was possessed by Yona, he could have resisted it with his hockey, but he didn't do so since it would ruin the whole point of training her. He assumed that even if she did succeed in controlling his fruit power since it was her first time, the effect would be bearable. The worst could have been that his fist would just come towards his face super fast, but in that case, he would just stop it with the other hand. It was because he was confident in his buffless observation hockey as it was even able to follow some of Kazari's attacks. But who would have thought the punch almost surpassed his regular observation's limit speed? Without transforming, Amon's hand can endure the force of punching at three-tenths of lightning speed, so his hand breaking only minutes surpassed that speed, which is theoretically speaking, shouldn't be possible in his human form. The shadow moved that fast, faster than Amon expected, and his fist was forced to follow its movement. Amon still could have stopped it just by thinking, but to help Yona understand her own capacity, he let himself get hurt. But, the question was, why did it move so fast? Yona wasn't fast enough to make his hand move at that speed, right? Yes, she wasn't that fast. Rather, it's just that since Amon's shadow is massless, it was faster than him, who has mass. She just controlled that shadow. Anything that is massless would be faster than something with mass, it's a fact. The punch of the massless shadow mixed with lightning was faster than Amon's normal lighting punch, so his punch surpassed 3 out of 10 of lightning speed. At that speed, Amon's hand was forced to follow that massless shadow's punch speed, thus breaking down since it couldn't endure the force. He was amazed by the combined power of lightning speed and a massless shadow. The power that broke his nose even though he imbued hockey on his face. The moral of the story, Yona didn't hurt Amon, Amon hurt himself. Also, Gekko Moria was an idiot for not fully using such a devastating fruit. Amon kept laying down on his back. His nose twisting strangely, slowly recovered by itself. The same goes for his broken hand. Amon was using Saimai Kikin, one of his trump cards. Riki crouched down as she inspected his face. She couldn't sense any enemy in this vicinity. Then who hurt him like this? Her hand went to her sword while shaking. Her eyes were red. Who the fuck did this? Brother, tell me the name and I will kill them. Amon laughed. Calm down, it sounded rather weird since his nose was broken. It's nothing. I was just training Yona. Huh. Riki's killing intent vanished. After a short silence, she sighed. Such a powerful devil fruit. Did that overpower yours? In a sense, yes. Maybe. Riki averted her hand from her sword. I want one too, better than yours. She simply remarked. You will get one one day, but not any time soon. Aha fuck, it hurts. Amon made a pained expression while his hand made a crack sound. Fixing a broken hand was painful as hell. Not only that, his nose hurt too. His own punch hurt more than Kazara's countless attacks. He was proud that his attack power was so high, but he felt that he now needs to pay attention to his defense. Shank's body is weak enough to allow a puny sea king to bite his arm off. While old Whitebeard died of gun bullets in the canon timeline. Amon found a point to pay attention to rather than just increasing attack power. I was already training my defense, but it seems I need to pay more attention. As if the injuries never existed, 
The broken nose and hand went back to normal in a matter of minutes while he groaned every now and then. Even his blood was absorbed. All the time, Riki sat beside him stroking his hair. Yona, who was shocked, also ran towards him by then. K. Kami. She instantly jumped to the ground and bowed towards Amon. P. Please kill me. Kill me for doing that to you. I am incompetent mortal. Riki turned her head towards her and sighed after a short silence. She would have killed the culprit if it wasn't Yona. She knew her brother probably asked her to do that, to begin with. He always was like that. Amon just sat up and looked towards Yona while stretching his hand. Calm down, this isn't your fault. Indeed, it wasn't her fault. Rather, his previous assumption was wrong. Yona wasn't talentless, she was just not creative enough. But for that, he was here. Also, Robin. I need Robin to teach her things. She is surprisingly creative. Walking towards the shaking and crying Yona on the ground, Amon decided his next course of action. Time to meet the Sky Pirates. Four years ago. At a corner of the upper yard, a young Amon was standing in front of a few Birkins and a few Scipians. Among them, a young man with a neatly trimmed beard stood out most. This bunch of Birkins were the few people who worked under Enel in the canon timeline. Named Ohm, Satori, Shura, Gadatsu, and a few goat people. And the Scipian people were some random nobodies Amon picked up to fill the names. Among them, only the first commander of God's militia and son of Gonfall, Ryo, was worth mentioning. He was the strongest among all of them here. Okay, guys, I am preparing to leave for a long journey. We already talked about it, so let's cut to the chase and remind you one last time. They nodded. This wasn't a sudden meeting. They were thoroughly explained about things beforehand. You will go down in the sea and form the Sky Pirates. You will also pick fights with the Wingless Valkyrie Guild so that nobody suspects we are from the same side. Also, don't forget to do things against Skypea. Make yourselves seem like criminal runaways from here. I will take care of your backgrounds and the paperwork. Amon explained as everyone nodded. This is a serious mission. We need to fool the masses to gain specific things that strength can't guarantee. Understood? Again, everyone nodded. They didn't have any questions and were happy to be picked like this. This bunch of Scipians assumed this was all for the safety of Skypea. The Birkins just did as Amon ordered without any questions. So, Rio opened his mouth. I will try my best as their leader. I will play the captain role as you have assigned me. Amon nodded at Rio's words. Yes, also, I am sure you are aware why I chose you as the captain. You are the person with the most experience in handling a group since you were a militia commander. Amon just stared ahead with a serious face. I don't care if you get a huge bounty or no bounty at all. Just don't mess up. Or things will be bad. You guys will have important roles to play in the future. It's a given. Having a hidden group is a must to survive in this world. They nodded, without realizing that they were basically scapegoats. To them, they were doing this for honor and to obey their god. But in the end, they were just sacrifices. Amon grinned lightly and nodded. Now then, I hope you have a safe and enjoyable journey. Present time. Just like Amon had predicted, the Sky Pirates, after four years of staying away from their families and friends, were having their uses. Today, Amon was sitting on a pirate ship with two wings and a skull in their middle printed on the Jolly Roger. He was enjoying tea with a man sitting opposite him. The man had a neatly trimmed beard with no mustache. He was wearing a robe, a gray dress designing similar to Ancient One's suit from Doctor Strange. Around the right shoulder of the robe, there was a special sign that he had as the leader of this pirate crew. Two wings with a pirate skull between them, and three triangles below the two wings, and one a little further below the skull symbol. He then talked in a deep voice. I heard about what happened on the 400th anniversary. The nobles got what they deserved. I have watched the stream. As he said this, he had a small, hardly noticeable smile on his face. He sighed soon after. It's a pity that I am stuck here in the mission, or I would have participated in the war for sure. This was when his voice became a little shaky and his grip on his teacup tightened. I heard many of us died, leaving their families behind. For all of this, Marines are at fault. As a person who has been running from Marines for four years, the man formed some kind of hatred towards them. But after learning about the things that happened in the sky, he was enraged. This was when Amon moved his mouth. Indeed, Marines are the ones who are responsible for their death, but it is also true that we were weak. If we were strong enough, none of us would have died. Rio, I am glad that you were able to control your emotions and not go to the sky after learning all of this. I wanted to, but I recalled your words. The man, Rio, said. He was referring to, 
just don't mess up, or things will be bad. From four years ago, Amon grinned lightly. If you had done that, things would have gotten really messed up. His eyes looked within Ryo's eyes as they shook. You are a smart man, I will give you that. But never get too smart, please. Or I need to make sure your head doesn't work properly anymore. Amon told the truth, Ryo knew it. Ryo gulped, he felt his initially boiling blood become calm. He hasn't changed, just like a predator. Amon sipped his tea while enjoying his inner thoughts. While Amon returned from the moon every now and then, he met up with Ryo and took a recollection of his actions. Meantime, Amon showed his ruthless side more and more, making Ryo frightened, thus learning how insignificant he was. Ahem, anyway. Amon took out a paper from the pocket of his black luxurious leather jacket. We have a new mission, Risky Red Island. There is supposed to be an ancient Zoan at that place. This attracted a lot of attention, Amon explained while looking at the paper. It was a map of Risky Red Island. Jack from Beast Pirates will be there as well. The reason I am taking you is, Ryo, I want to see if you can defeat him. Amon looked at his face. I will go with you, but I won't take any actions. You have to do everything by yourself. If you win, I will reward you in Ancient Zone. Even if there was no dragon fruit, Amon can make it seem like Ryo killed Jack. Even if Ryo isn't strong enough, he himself would kill him. After that, he would get his hands on Jack's Ancient Zone fruit. He might then give the fruit to Ryo since he still doesn't have any fruit. But if there is a dragon fruit, then things will get more interesting, ha. Huh? Amon smiled and stretched his limbs. It will take two days to reach Risky Red from here. I got an eternal log post. Amon glanced at the people behind him, the Birkins. Meanwhile, let me see how much you have all grown. I need to make sure if you guys are strong enough to match the beast pirates or not. Kiki. Amon's passive aura leaked out made everyone gulp in fear. Chapter 125 Smart Ace. Ace POV. It took us three days to reach Risky Red Island. Man, this place is awesome. This was my initial reaction when I came here. This place is a forest. An old forest with massive old trees similar to Little Garden, an island I visited in the past. The thing that stands out the most here is the dark red volcano in the middle of the island. It has a majestic appearance, almost as if it is a majestic dragon itself, making the whole island hot with steam all around. I was in awe for a while. My body felt good. My steam steam fruit allows me to maintain my body temperature, so it was no surprise that I was not feeling hot. But why was I feeling good? It was because around me, there was steam. Natural steam made by the volcano. My body is absorbing the steam and tempering itself in real time. I looked at my companions on the side. They were in worse condition. Huff. Ace, you don't feel anything. As the gasping for air mast asked me a question I just grinned. A little. I lied to keep them familiar with me. Anyway, since I don't feel hot nor uncomfortable, I can check the area around the volcano. Hey, Deuce. He looked at me. Where did you get the news about that fruit? Do you know any more specifics? He made a thinking posture. Well, I told you about that friend from the underworld. He got this intel and shared it with me. It is supposed to be a dragon dragon fruit, ancient Zoan. Oh. You told me about All-Star King once. He also has a dragon dragon fruit, didn't he? Yes. Then it's decided. I cried out. As the future Pirate King's right-hand man, you would need a strong fruit. I will search the island and get this fruit for you. Everyone on the crew cheered hearing me. I gave them a last look before jumping in the air. Steam flight. Fru. Ace. Wait. You don't have to. That is all I heard as I was flying in the steamy air. My flight ability is quite unstable in the sea since I can get swept by the wind blows. But since this whole place is a steamy fountain, it's my domain. Even though I cannot control steam that comes from nature, this isn't bad. General POV. Before any one of the crew could stop Ace, he flew off and started to look around the island. His last words, wait in the ship if it's too hot for you. Obviously, they didn't care about it. Mass Deuce forgot to add one important line. He made a worried face. I heard the Jack of the Beast Pirates is also here currently. Looking for the fruit. Darn, Ace will surely mess up. Everyone let's go. He also started to run behind the flying ace. The other crew member followed suit. Outside the volcano which was boiling inside, a group of people wearing similar looking clothes and two horns could be seen. In front of them stood a massive man with a metallic jaw mask with tusk-like horns attached to the two sides of his head. He was Jack the Drought, a 27 feet 3 inches feet man, Kaido's all-star from Beast Pirates. 
They were standing at the edge of the volcano, looking within the boiling volcano itself. Verbub. Some gifters took steps back seeing the boiling volcano. This place was very hot, yet they were forced to come here because of Jack. Fa, fa. Around them, a gifter with eagle powers was flying while his sharp eyes were looking within the volcano. Beside him, a man with bat powers was flying as well. Egira, are you certain? Jack's heavy voice made everyone stiff. Egira, the eagle man nodded. His eagle vision could see the terrain of the volcanic walls clearly. Yes, just around the level where lava ends, there is a hole. Enough to allow a slim crouching man to enter it. It's a cave. I am assuming it's the location where the fruit is kept. I can be wrong though, ee. -e. As Egira ended his line with an ee, -e, Jack nodded. We are not certain about the fruit. So before sending anyone there, we need to confirm if the fruit really is there or not. Everyone gulped hearing him. Sending anyone? And that volcano? While everyone nodded in fright, Jack looked at the bat-looking man flying beside him. Batman, try searching with your sound wave sensing. Pay special attention to objects as big as fist inside that cave. It might be the devil fruit. I got that. The man bat. Batman nodded and closed his eyes. Bat search. His vision started to move, going towards the cave. The world looked invert color to him. Around three minutes later, he opened his eyes. Sir, Batman came down from the air. You are right. T there really is a devil fruit inside the cave. Everyone gulped hearing him. They actually hoped there wasn't any fruit. After a short silence from Jack, he grinned under his mask. Now we just need someone to go there. Unfortunately, none of them are heat resistant enough to do so. B boss, we can't go there. Jack's face darkened. He was a fishman, so even with his ancient Zoan's defense, he was very uncomfortable around this much heat, meters above the lava. So going down using a strong rope was out of the way. Besides, Egira said the hole is only big enough for a slim crouching man to enter. I can't possibly achieve that. Jack was 27 feet 3 inches feet tall. However, there wasn't anyone else to approach it other than him either. He had a high defense, but that wasn't the case for others. Their bodies would just melt. Jack gritted his teeth. Why? If it was King, he could have just flown there. His inferiority complex started to act up as he clenched his fist. He then looked at Batman and Egira. Prepare yourselves. You need to dive down. H. Huh? Boss, our bodies would melt. Jack laughed. We don't know until we try, do we? If one person didn't make it, the second will. If the second couldn't, the third will. If the third couldn't, then the fourth definitely. Ah, who are you people? Suddenly, Jack's eyes grew as he abruptly looked at the unknown voice, seemingly coming from the sky. You guys look familiar. It was Ace. I think. Oh, beast pirates. Right? Unlike Luffy, Ace always kept up with bounty posters, so he knew the ones with high bounty, he easily recognized Jack the Drought. Why are you here? As Ace was about to say something again, he heard a voice from far. The voice was in his head. This was one of his crew members' devil fruit power, telepathy. Ace. Ace. Okay. Okay. I can hear you. What is it, Perry? Ace replied to his crewmate while the people on the ground looked at him with a frown, especially Jack. How is he flying, more so, with such control in this heat? He easily understood it's his devil fruit power. He could see steam coming out of his body while also absorbing the natural ones. Isn't he a perfect scapegoat? Jack snickered to himself. He couldn't see this rat disobeying him, an all-star of Kaido. So he can just order him to get the fruit. But Ace was in a whole other world. For real. They are here to take the fruit. Hearing the intel, Ace was excited. This meant he might get Jack. However. No, that's not good. My crew would definitely get hurt. Ace, listen to me. Get away from there. We are preparing our ship. We will leave. What? Why? We came so far. No way. Don't worry. I have a plan. I will dash, ew. Ace's thought was cut off with a yell from Jack. Hey, you. Come down here. I have an order for you. If you get the job right, Emperor Kaido will take you in. Ace stopped his telepathy. Silently, he stared down for a second. This guy. He was angry that Jack dared propose to him the offer to become his subordinate. He wanted to punch him, but he suddenly got a plan. He grinned and talked in telepathy. Perry, I will only go after I take the fruit, I promise Deuce. It won't even take ten minutes, okay. The feminine voice of Perry, who was secretly in love with Ace, sounded for the last time. Ace, listen to me. Only for the connection to be severed by Ace himself. Ace looked down. Please, how can I help you? 
Chapter 126, Fire Fist. Port Ass D, Ace POV. I was looking down. How can I help you, please? As I asked this question, I noticed Jack had a small smirk under his jaw mask. This will be easy. Thinking such, I came down from the sky first, standing in front of the giant man. Jack then said while releasing an intimidating aura. Kid, you have just won a one in a million chance. Be grateful. Kaido will be happy hearing that you helped on this mission, get it? Kaido, huh? I nodded. I understand, but what do I need to do? Jack made a grim face. First, according to him, there is a devil fruit they are looking for. They didn't reveal anything more, obviously. They already found the fruit. It is in a small hole inside the volcano, just where the lava ends. Jack said, since I seem to have some kind of immunity to heat and can fly, I can easily enter the hole and then grab the fruit. To be honest, this is easy. Bearboop. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of boiling lava. Yes, currently, I am swimming through the steam inside the borders of the volcano, going towards that hole. I can feel the gazes full of anticipation on my back. Losers. I will just take the fruit and flee. In this fountain of steam, although I can't control the natural steam, by releasing my own then mixing them with the natural ones, I can absolutely control it. I've been doing it all the time while flying from the sea to here to the volcano. 40% of the island is already below me. I am aware that Jack is strong, stronger than I am currently. However, this is my domain. Even if I can't win, I can run. As long as my crew doesn't come here and goes back to the ship as I ordered, I can escape. Thinking such, I entered the small hole, barely. They probably already reached the ship. Ah, I am feeling hot. Yes, being just one meter above the magma heats up even me. Although I am sweating, it is bearable. Then I entered the cave. My hand got burned as I placed it on the floor. This hurts. I barely managed to control myself from screaming and headed forward, crawling. Basically, I am torturing my palm and knees right now. Nothing I can't handle. Gritting my teeth, I kept crawling. The cave was a little deep, deeper than I would have liked it to be. So it took around three minutes of torture when I finally reached a wider place. One can even call this a room. In the middle of the room, there was an altar. On top of it, a fruit that clearly looked like a devil fruit stood. I grinned. The fruit looked majestic. I would easily believe it's a dragon dragon fruit if anyone told me that. I stood up and went ahead slowly and was about to touch the fruit when. I suddenly felt suspicious. I heard in many pirate folktales that when they went treasure hunting, they encountered this type of altar where the treasure was kept. Most of the time, the whole place crumbled upon touching the treasure. Will this whole place crumble down if I touch it as well? It was something one should consider. I stayed silent for three seconds before I couldn't endure the heat and grab the fruit. Fortunately, nothing happened. Sighing, I started to crawl out of the hole. It took about another three minutes. Oh, hey, he is out. Yes, I can see that. Coming out while ignoring the voices, the first thing I did was fly. I instantly flew hundreds of meters above the volcano. I couldn't endure the heat anymore. Hey, you come down here. Hearing the call, I looked down, there Jack was looking at me, especially at my hand expectantly. I first searched if my companions came here to do something stupid like save me or not. Fortunately, they didn't. However, I can see some of them coming in this direction from far. This is not good. Hey, kid. My thoughts were cut by Jack's words. What are you doing up there? Come down. Dumbass. Hey, I had a question. How strong is Kaido? My last question before I flee. Jack's face went dark. He seemed to understand something about me. He laughed a little before looking straight at my eyes. Kid, he is someone out of your imagination. Don't even try anything stupid, or you, along with all your companions, will all die. I just laughed before putting the fruit in my side bag. You know what? Fuck you. I am gonna go now. Fwoosh. I turned around and gave force around me. Instantly, leaping a few hundred meters ahead. General POV. Jack's rage reached his limit as he transformed into his mammoth form. He ordered Egura and Batman. You too, chase him. He ran fast with his giant body while both of them flew. Egura was fast being an eagle, but Batman was a little slow. Brat, you made a terrible mistake. With heavy but fast steps, Jack started to run towards the ship that he noticed when Ace went inside. Ace POV. As I leaped ahead, I instantly started to fly towards Deuce and a few other comrades of mine who were coming in this direction from approximately 1,000 meters away. I cover the distance in five seconds. Hey, Deuce. I got the fruit. I grin seeing his shocked face. Run. Haha. Uh -huh. 
Du screamed one last time before starting to run. He was happy obviously, he was going to get a dragon zone after all. Things were supposed to go easy, according to plan. But, ee -ye. the eagle man I saw before surpassed my speed and went towards my ship. I felt my blood freeze. Mass Deuce and others noticed it, he started to run faster towards the ship. I flew too. My speed increased, I was about to catch up to the eagle but, I felt a headache and almost lost consciousness. What was that? I looked at the culprit behind me, it was that bat-looking guy. I am Batman. Nobody can escape my sound waves. Sound waves. He is a bat. No wonder. He again prepared another attack. Today your death will be granted for disobeying Jack-sama. Steam fist. Before he could finish, I punched my hand in the air, and he got swept by it in seconds, flying back to the volcano. Damn it, he made me be late. I turned my head around the ship. I was only 500 meters away from it. I could see my companions, but the eagle man had already reached there. I increased my speed. I was able to sense this place's steam was under my control now. This was my top speed where I can't even see anything. Fwoosh. Instantly, I reached the ship, but what I witnessed made me baffled. Ugh. Hey, Ace. Don't come here. One of my companions, Perry, was already taken hostage by the eagle man. He had one of his claws on her neck. Damn it. I was late. He laughed while his claw penetrated Perry's neck. A little bit of blood started to flow. Eee, kid, listen. Hand over the fruit, and I will free her. I gritted my teeth looking at him. I got this fruit for Deuce. He must be very expectant to eat it. But he also took Perry as a hostage. I looked at Perry who stopped struggling. Perry. She just smiled. It's fine, Ace. Give the fruit to Deuce. It's my fault I am so weak. Perry is a woman with light brown hair and a perfect hourglass body. The thing most beautiful about her is her chest and her eyes, her ocean blue eyes. I am no airhead to not notice that she likes me. But I don't want to enter a relationship with my companion. It would cause many problems. But it is true. I am attracted to her. So, besides her being my companion, there are some other reasons why I don't want Perry to die. I then looked down at Mask Deuce. Our eyes met. Yes. That's what we talked about with our eyes. Mask Deuce was the same as me. He would care about the crew first before caring about himself. Hey, ee, ee The eagle bastard yelled. Quickly, throw it. I nodded and took out the fruit from the side of my bag. Yes. A grin appeared on my face. I'm throwing it. With all my power and hockey, I punched my fist and the fruit forward. Because of the heavy steam around me, my punch caught fire because of the friction with the air. Fire fist. Zoo. Along with my fist, the fruit got into the fire and hit the eagle man in the face. He was thrown backward, out of the ship. However, as the fruit fell on the deck of the ship, I noticed Jack arriving here too. I am confident the fruit is fine. It was fine in that volcano after all, but this was bad. I screamed at Perry. Perry, throw the fruit to Deuce. Now. She nodded after gulping twice. Why yes. She did the same as Jack ran faster towards Deuce who was the closest to him. Deuce caught the fruit. Jack reached him and swung his elephant nose. Die kid. However, Deuce had already taken a bite of the fruit. His body started to change, his skin became harsh and dark. He started to sprout two wings on his back, his body structure changed. Asterisk Kriach. Asterisk. He cried as if it hurt. Asterisk Rower. Asterisk. With another cry, Deuce turned into a majestic black dragon with spiky wings. Bam. With his newly evolved limbs, he hit Jack and made his giant body fly a few meters away. Strong. That's the only thing that I could think of. Deuce was now stronger than me. Hey, Ace. Perry called me as I looked at her. Don't you recognize that beast? I frowned. What is she? Ah, that's right. It's a beast that was rumored to exist on this island thousands of years ago. We even got a photo that Deuce showed us that he got from his underworld friend. It's a dragon. An ancient beast called. Nergigant. The fruit should be an ancient Zoan. Ryu Ryu no Mi. Model. Nergigant. I gulped seeing this. He looked majestic. A monster, even compared to Jack's mammoth form. My ally got powerful. I was confident that he would win against Jack. That said, I want to meet Deuce's friend from the underworld. He is the one to give him the information. To begin with, he must be one of his close friends. Chapter 127. Conqueror's Hockey. Nergigant a dragon that is rumored to have lived on this island in the past. Amon got this news from the underworld. He also got the news about the devil fruit from there. 
So, after making 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, Amon assumed if the fruit actually existed, then it would be this one. Ancient Zoan. Ri Ryu no Mi. Model. Nergigant. A fruit from a game. It's not that big of a surprise that it's real in this world, to be honest. Amon pondered while looking at the fight happening around the seashore from many kilometers in the sky. But where was the fruit in the canon timeline? Why didn't Ace or Jack take it in that timeline? The answer is simple. Amon made a thinking face. Jack proposed Ace the same offer as this, but in that timeline, he didn't accept it. Only because he didn't have any knowledge of the fruit beforehand, because he didn't promise Deuce to take the fruit for him. Why didn't he do it? Because Deuce didn't tell him about that since he didn't have any knowledge about it in that timeline. After all, his friend from the underworld didn't exist there. A grin formed on Amon's face. It's because I am his friend from the underworld. Dot. While Wind fluttered his hair in the air, Amon kept looking at the fight with shining red eyes. Bam! Jack's trunk slammed on Deuce's body, throwing him a few meters away. But he managed to tune down the damage by flying up. However, since he was relatively new with his body, Deuce wasn't able to fly for long with his massive body and fell down. Bam! Jack struck him again, but Deuce was able to block it with his spiky wings. Ace was confused. Wasn't Deuce supposed to have the upper hand? At first, he did have the upper hand. But it all came down to battle experience and familiarity with the Zoan form not so long after. Deuce didn't have both. He was a doctor, not a fighter. Although he did have fighting powers, they were nothing compared to the experienced Jack. Bam! Jack spun his trunk like the wings of a helicopter and struck the energy. The dragon was thrown backward again, this time even its flight ability wasn't of any help since Jack rushed forward without giving any time to recover. Caduce, hold on. I will help you soon. Ugh. Ace stumbled back while getting punched by Igira. Ace and his crew were busy taking after Jack's subordinates. They were too strong for him and his crew, he didn't get a chance to help. It was clear who the winner of the match was based on this alone. Jack dashed towards Nergy Dragon, preparing a headbutt. Star Impact. Bam. However, Deuce was able to block it. Jack remarked, so this is the defense of a dragon. He again rushed forward. Bam. Again, he headbutted him. Bam. This went for a few minutes while the inexperienced Deuce was forced to stay on defense. Bam. However, as the clock was spinning at 18 minutes, Deuce was bleeding a little. Unfortunately, he didn't have armament. Jack concentrated his armament on his horns and rushed forward again. This was his strongest headbutt. Bloody impact. Bam. Deuce was hit right in his stomach as he coughed out blood and was forced to subside to his human form. That was a surprisingly strong defense, Jack commented. But you were too weak to utilize it fully. He then yelled looking at his subordinates. Everyone stop fighting. It is not a bad thing he ate the fruit. We will just take them under us. Everyone did as he said while the injured ace took long breaths. He looked at Ace. You are the captain, right? We will give you a chance to live. Join us. After a short silence, he looked at the human deuce. Their eyes met. Both of them grinned. Ace remarked, In your dream, you elephant bastard. I will become the pirate king. This line triggered Jack. His veins popped up. He just nodded. Pirate king? Good. Only Kaido will become pirate king. He didn't care about Ace anyway. His only priority was deuce who ate the fruit. Then you shall die. Jack, still in his mammoth form, dashed toward Ace. His horns pointed towards this chest. Oh fuck. Ace cursed in his mind and imbued hockey in his chest. But he knew, this was an impossible to block attack. He knew it, but still, he didn't give up. Chuck. Jack's pointy horns penetrated the flesh. Blood spurted out, covering his face. However. Cough, Ace. It wasn't Ace. Deduce. Why did you? It was Masked Deuce who partially transformed into a dragon, it was his hybrid form. However, he couldn't even fully do it, only his skin became dark. If he had enough time to spout the scales too, then maybe. Deuce, why did you do this? Maybe he would have lived. With a grim face, Jack took back his horns. He didn't expect this situation, this meant he just lost the dragon fruit. Kaido will be enraged. Flop. As Deuce's body got loose from his horns, his body sloped down in the ground. Ace caught it. Blood trickled down from his lips. Ace. I am sorry. Deuce, why? Ace's eyes shook. He's only had one question. Why? But the question wasn't towards Deuce. He looked at Jack with glaring eyes. It was towards Jack. Why? Why you bastard? 
With a burst of Ace's Conqueror's hockey, 80% of people on the battlefield went unconscious. However, Jack was still there, his eyes wide. This kid, a king's candidate. Jack was shocked, but he knew this was too late. He won't come under Kaido, then there was only one way. I have to kill him. Now, this is an unexpected development. Amon commented on the fight while floating in the air with crossed arms. He noticed a ship coming to the island from far. Oh, they are here. It was the ship of Sky Pirates. Amon came here flying a long time ago, waiting for Ryo to come. Looks like he doesn't need to fight Jack. Ace will use his plot armor. ZZZ. Amon's body flickered. He was here when Ace got the fruit, so he knew which fruit it was. He went to the sky, took some fruit, and returned. All this happened in under two seconds. Amon's body flickered again. He went to a blind spot around the battlefield and kept the fruits there. His body flickered again, and he came back to his initial spot. Again, all this happened in under two seconds. Amon tilted his head, questioning something. Now, only thing to decide, do I give the fruit to Ryo or the motor gang? It was a surprise that this fruit was even real. But it's a good fruit. Also the fact that its biggest weakness is lightning. Or at least what is known from the game MHW. The user of the fruit would be easy to control for Amon. Giving it to the motor gang would allow a special thing to happen. But there are some drawbacks like their personality and their weak body. Metal isn't really that strong for the humans of this world. Hard to decide. Amon just sighed and watched the fight. He won't let Ace die. He needs Ace to make the war the best happen. It is a necessary step to take for his influence to reach the peak of this world. Anyway, I assume this encounter led Ace and his crew to reach Wano in the canon timeline? They fought Jack after Ace refused to help, but plot armor saved their lives, not this time around though since one already died. Amon needed Ace to reach Wano, so he would intervene if things seemed like it. Luckily, he already had Deuce's friend, Identity prepared for the worse. Oh, wait. I don't need to fight Jack. I will make Ryo fight for me. It would be interesting. Amon tested Ryo's strength. He was strong, but not strong enough to beat Jack. That means, let me see if he deserves the fruit or not. In the worst case, I will just kill him and take back the fruit. Here, eat this. Amon tossed a black devil fruit with silver zigzag and crips on it towards Ryo who barely caught it. A devil fruit. He asked. Didn't you say I shouldn't eat one unless it's an emergency? This is an emergency. You are gonna fight Jack the Drought and then join the Beast Pirates after becoming a spy. Got it. Chapter 128 Savior Ancient Zoan Ryu Ryu no Mi Model Nergigant Amon sounded out lightly. You probably aren't aware of this dragon species, but it's powerful, that I will say. Ryo, the person who was the recipient of his word, looked strangely excited. A dragon Zoan? Dragons are the strongest among the strongest. Eating this meant he will be stronger, many times stronger than now. That way, he would be able to protect his people, sacrifice himself for them more efficiently. This was a great power boost. But what confused him was his other line. But what do you mean by joining Beast Pirate? Amon nodded at his question. You want me to infiltrate Beast Pirate from inside? That should be the case. But... Ryo looked hesitant. What about All-Star King? He looks like a... How should I put it, evil Scipion? For years ago, you were the one who said to be careful of All-Star King. This question made Amon laugh. Meh, don't think too much of it. Back then I was just paranoid. All-Star King isn't some kind of spiritual enemy of us or anything. After visiting the moon, Amon learned some secrets. Secrets about King's race. It wasn't anything special or supernatural. I will tell you about it on a later day. Now eat the fruit and go fight Jack. Help the spade pirates. Ah. Okay. Amon continued. Even if you don't win, Jack will ask you to join him, accept it in the condition that he lets the spade pirates live. Amon needed Ace to survive. He would then lead him to Wano and steal Odin's diary from Yamato, finally putting all the blame on Ace's shoulders. What will this cost? Kaido's participation in the War of the Best. Amon made a sadistic smile in his mind. This time, he won't let Shank stop Kaido from going there. Okay, but Ryo had one more question. What will I answer if anyone asks me why I did this? In the case of Jack, just tell him you want a good fight. In the case of the Spade Pirates, tell them, Deuce's friend from the Underworld asked you to help them. Add some more lines of your choice, just don't mess up. A short silence occurred while Amon kept grinning. Ryo understood everything and nodded. Any more questions? He shook his head. No, he then looked at the fruit in his hand. Then I will eat this. Masked Deuce was an orphan. 
he lived a life full of tragedy. Not expecting a turn for good, he tried doing criminal activities many times. Though he was captured and beaten by the people many times, he didn't give up. He didn't even think of changing his lifestyle, but he was satisfied with the result. He had some rules and followed them. So to many children and the elderly, he was a hero. Doing these criminal acts, one day he got into the underworld. In his time there, he one day met a benevolent man. The man's age was unknown to him since he always wore a mask and was dressed in black clothing. This benevolent man helped him, gave him new jobs, taught him about the world. So to him, the man was a figure who he never had, the figure of a father. For years ago, his father went missing without telling him. He assumed he must be busy, so he waited. While he was on the verge of believing the man left him for good, he returned. He explained he was in a critical situation and he will also be busy like this later on. Deuce was happy enough that he didn't leave him, so he apologized to him for doubting him. The man said this, since I will be busy from now on, you should try to enjoy your life. Become a free bird. Go be a pirate. That line triggered him. That's how his journey began. After hearing this from that man, he met Ace and started to travel together with him. That man was Amon. Ace's body shook with the body of Deuce on his arms. He had stopped breathing already. Why you bastard? Ace screamed as his conqueror's hockey leaked, knocking many people on the battlefield unconscious. Kek, this kid. Jack was shocked seeing him use conqueror's hockey. In the end, he decided he was too dangerous to be left alive since he saw his companion's death. Jack, the mammoth, rushed towards Ace with his legs aiming at his puny head. Ace didn't even flinch seeing this. He didn't know why, but he felt like he could defeat him. Ace swung his fist towards Jack, making him shocked seeing black thunder swirling around it. That Ace punch left a purple-black lightning trail. Just like Kaido-sama, he is coding his attack in Conqueror's Haki. This was talent the talent of Pirate King's son. He was someone who learned armament hockey coding a week ago, yet he was able to achieve something like this, even though he was doing it subconsciously. Jack was suddenly alarmed. This attack would even hurt Kaido, so he couldn't be fine after receiving it. In this timeline, Blackbeard might need more effort to catch Ace. Rio POV. The fruit tasted disgusting, but I was able to swallow it. I can feel the new power inside me. It's as if another being has entered my body. I can switch bodies with that being, thus granting me unimaginable power. Ja ja. My thoughts were cut by the sound of sea waves. We were now close to the seashore. I can tell with my observation hockey that the mammoth has already noticed us. Time to transform. Ah. Hearing Ace's spiteful cry, Jack frowned. He was already too far to back off now. Jack raised his front leg and decided to block the attack with his forefoot. His bone should be strong enough to block this novice's attack. Jack's forefoot and Ace's glowing red fist clashed with each other. Bam. Boom. Jack didn't have Conqueror's hockey, but his armament was strong. He used it against Ace's punch. The steam had heated up to form a fire fist yet again. Crack. Jack's elephant forefoot cracked like glass, blood dripped down, his face distorted, but he didn't fall back. H-A-A-A. Ace also used his other fist and punched forward. Jack stopped it with his other front foot. Bam. Another impact. The island shook. A surpassed his limit. However, Jack noticed something important. He is unconscious? Yes, Ace was unconscious, but he was still fighting. His crewmates and the few awake beast pirates were shocked to their course. But Jack saw this as an opportunity. He swung his trunk. Bam! Ace was hit from his left side and was flown meters away in a second. He was concentrating all his force on the front, so his side was weak. Jack took this chance. Ace fell meters away from the spot and laid down unconscious, his glowing fist returning to normal. Huff, what is his identity? Jack asked himself. In no way this was a normal pirate. It's better to kill him right here and now. Jack decided. He was a threat. He gave his forefoot a permanent injury. In anger, he walked towards the Ace who was unconsciously lying on the ground. Looking down, he raised his leg to crush Ace's small skull under his leg. He jabbed his leg down, however. It was stopped by a black arm of a beast. This is enough. Hearing the deep voice, he looked at the culprit as his eyes grew. The look reminded him of the dragon he just killed. He instantly looked back where Deuce's body was kept. He was shocked seeing it still there. Then who was this? I have come to stop this fight. It was also energigant, but he had a few changes in his body. He had four black wings instead of two. In the name of my lord. It was Rio. Amon was surprised that Rio's dragon form granted him four wings. After all, 
All-Star King still retained only one pair of wings upon his transformation. Being a half of wing human and half of that race, shouldn't King also retain four wings if Ryo is doing so? It was something to think about, but without any way into it, Amon gave up thinking. Maybe because he isn't a pure blood. Or he just doesn't use four wings since his Zoan body is small? Amon ignored the thoughts about King and Ryo and focused on Ace. Amon was sitting in the borders of the volcano while eating snacks. He looked quite displeased. Ace, that fucker. His genes are too good. For years, Amon has been trying to coat Conqueror's hockey on his body as if armament just like Kaido and Luffy did in Chapter 1010 manga, but he has been unsuccessful. Again, why? Always facing a border, Amon was a little angry. Though it didn't matter. I can do better than that. I can coat armament in my lightning. That can be used as an alternative for this. To begin with, the effect of Conqueror's hockey coating made a trail of black lighting. Amon can just make his lightning become black using armament. It should have the same, or at least a similar effect, right? Fuck this. Amon threw his snacks in the volcano behind. Kaido said, even among the Supreme Kings, only a few chosen people can do that. So, did that mean Amon wasn't chosen? Frankly, he didn't care. I need to train Conqueror's hockey more. It may be I don't have a talent for this like Luffy and Ace, but I will learn it. People say Conqueror's hockey is there from birth. One can't acquire it in any other way. Amon didn't believe that was the case. Amon knows the best hockey teacher, Rayleigh, who never said Conqueror's hockey can't be learned later on in life. This meant there is a high chance Kyoto's statement is wrong too. Maybe 10 more years? Or 100 years? Or 1,000 years? Amon doesn't plan to live a short life like a human. His obsession with absoluteness won't allow that. This meant he still has a chance to learn this. Nothing is impossible. This was a saying in his previous world, but the statement is true in this world more. I need to make Riki train it. Maybe she can unlock it too? Shaking his head while laughing jokingly, Amon then focused on the fight, not before bringing some more snacks from a nearby island of course. Bam. 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 A fight was taking place between Jack and Ryo who has transformed into a dragon. His four wings were attacking Jack without giving him any time to dodge, and since all of the wings were spiky, they were enough to immobilize his defense. Arg. Jack was slammed with the dragon's tail and thrown a few meters away. He was slammed to the ground but managed to get up not so long after. What is your identity? Jack was curious as he asked Ryo. I just want to fight you. I don't hold any malice towards you. Ryo replied with what Amon taught him. Also, I am quite angry you killed one of my fellow dragon fruit users. Huh? You mean that other dragon guy? Jack asked as he got up straight on his feet. His eyes suddenly went cold. So you want revenge? Ryo noticed it and laughed. Not really. It's nothing serious. I'm just angry you killed another dragon and such as me. If he lived, we could have trained together. Ryo used some of his made-up lines. Now, you should satisfy my battle lust. After a short silence, Jack laughed too. He didn't hate this man anymore. He decided. All right. I will give you a fight, but you have to promise if you lose you need to join the Beast Pirates. How does that sound like? Ryo, the dragon, grinned. Seems fair enough. Saying this, he rushed towards Jack. This time Jack again started to take advantage of his experience and familiarity with his Zoan form. Even though Ryo was a good fighter, which granted him the power to last long against Jack, now the tables had turned. Amon grinned lightly. He is good. He changed the atmosphere around Jack with just some words. This was fascinating. Let's wait until he gets defeated. He might have a plan already. Bam. This time around, Jack was more aggressive. He was very vigorous and easily pinned Ryo towards the losing side. Until now, he might have had the upper hand because of his Zoan being overall more powerful than Jack's. But now, it all came down to experience. After all, Ryo in his human form was somewhat weaker than a scabbard of Odin, and Jack could thrash two of them without much difficulty. Although Ryo was many times stronger now, he didn't have enough experience to control that strength. Bam. Okay. Leaving another hit in Ryo, the gasping Jack opened his mouth. Since you're gonna join, why not stop here? It's clear I am the winner. Ryo nodded, albeit barely. He was breathing heavier than Jack. I understand. Saying this, Ryo started to transform back. His 7-inch, seven, 7 feet small stature made Jack amused as he also transformed back. But I have a request. Think of this as a gift for a newbie. Ryo demanded. Jack nodded after a brief silence of surprise. Leave the spade pirates be. A frown appeared on Jack's large face. 
Impossible. Their captain is too dangerous. A short silence later, Ryo chuckled. Why? I think you're very strong. Why are you scared of them? Jack was infuriated. Watch what you say. I might change my mind. Understanding provoking him won't work. Ryo made a change of plans. Okay. Okay. I am sorry. But it's a request. I have pride. As a fellow dragon fruit user, Ryo continued. As you have already perceived, my fighting style is quite lacking, meaning I am a newbie with the fruit. Jack sat down on the ground. He was tired. Yes, that should be the case. Or I would have to use my full power. Yes, that's what I was saying, Ryo stated. From where I am from, we see these types of things as spiritual connections. I believe me and that man, eating the fruit around the same time must have a reason, so I want his companion to leave. It's like seeing your little brother's friends. I just don't want them to die. It's a selfish request. Obviously. Jack was still against it. You have a strange view of things. People with wings are strange even if the wings are white other than the black that I am familiar with, Jack commented. He glanced at Ace. He was barely breathing. His companions were the same. They would probably disband the crew. It's fine, I guess. Jack was dumb. He wasn't good at making decisions, so it was clear he would listen to this promising newbie. He might become one of that group's with six promising talents. This wish, I will grant it. Besides, for a person with a severe inferior complex like him, granting such a request made him feel good about himself. Ryo smiled. Thank you. I will be loyal to the beast pirates in Kaido, to you as well. His smile widened. Jack-sama. Jack noticed how he didn't refer to Kaido as Kaido-sama, but referred to him like that. He felt proud. Jack was gone. Ace was still unconscious. Rio managed to deliver a small piece of paper with some words on it, delivered by a Birkin of his crew. After reading the paper, the spade pirates were silently laying or sitting on the ground, before an unknown person's footsteps made them raise their head. He was wearing a face mask and a black shiny jacket reaching his knees, he had his hands in the pockets of his jacket. Just like Deuce, he had blue shoulder-length hair. The spade pirates recognized him. Even without the small message left by Rio, they heard enough of him from Deuce to know who this was. Hello. The man's voice was gruff and cold, almost as if he was an old man, but his partially visible skin made that thought vanish. You probably know already. I am a fool, Mr. Fool. It was an alias, an alias of Amon. I hate hiding like a rat, but Kaido is my biggest problem to date. Chapter 129. Humans change over time, but some things remain the same. The Spade Pirates were created a few months ago. Considering that, the connections between the crew members weren't supposed to be so deep. However, this is the world of Nakama ship. More so, the son of the previous pirate king, Ace, is the captain of this crew. With his charisma, the crew became very close in the short time. Just like how the Straw Hat pirates were close, the Spade pirates were the same. So losing one of their companions, even more so, their vice captain, everyone was sad. They were now sitting while hugging their legs or lying on the ground while staring at the sky. Perry, the woman who was sitting beside the unconscious ace whispered, Maybe we shouldn't have come to the new world. The ones who were still conscious looked at her, but they didn't retort. Maybe. She was right. Deuce was an important member of the crew. Losing him meant a lot. Perry again moved her lips. Then what should we do about that man who saved us? Another member of the crew, Daniel, released a stiff laugh. Ha. Huh. We are grateful, but we need to wait for Ace to wake up. Even if we are like this, he is still out, Captain. Perry again questioned, and what about the other guy? Friend from the underworld? Deuce had told them about that man many times, so they were pretty familiar with who he was, how he looks, how he talks, even what his favorite food was. Obviously, everything was what Amon wanted him to know. To Amon, Deuce was a valuable man. When Ace would have joined the Whitebeard Pirates, the Spade Pirates would have done the same. He would have then brainwashed Deuce to be his informant, the person who would have kept him up to date about Blackbeard the biggest unstable variable of this world. So he spent quite some time teaching him things, but now that he was dead, all that was basically a waste. Still, it didn't matter. He will just choose another person from the Spade Pirates as the next pawn. The members of the Whitebeard Pirates are too strong to brainwash, and the few weak ones are too familiar with other crew members to not notice the changes even if they are small. So an outsider would be the best idea. Tack, tack, tack. It was then, they heard the sounds of footsteps. They slowly turned their head as their eyes gained a look of surprise. It was a man with shoulder-length blue hair, so they almost mistook him as Deuce. Hello, the man talked in an old and gruff voice. I am Mr. Fool, 
You can consider me Deuce's friend. Yes, it was Amon who was streaming lighting to his hair to make it seem blue. After reaching as far as 700 million volts, Amon can use his lightning to form different colors by heating it to different degrees. He was also hiding his wings by fusing them with his Logia body. All of them sighed. Of course, this wasn't Deuce. But it was still a relief that it wasn't an enemy either. They weren't in a mood for fighting. After a while, Ace regained his consciousness. The first thing he did was look around. Looking at Deuce's body laying down with a handkerchief over his face, he was too shocked to notice the blue-haired man sitting beside the body. With a dead look in his eyes, Ace fell on his back again. Tears started to swell in his eyes. It's my fault. Ace covered his face with his forearm. He didn't remember much of the fight with Jack since he went unconscious, but he knew he got some kind of power-up. If I was strong from the beginning, then this wouldn't have happened. Ace recalled how Sabo died. He lost one of his brothers and promised Luffy to become the Pirate King. But how will I manage without our ship's doctor, Deuce? Ace broke out crying as he covered his face. Perry just stared at him with sad eyes. Perry's hourglass body was bleeding and her brown hair was messed up. She just sat there silently while hugging her legs. She sometimes looked at Amon who was silently sitting beside Deuce's body. After a while, Perry got up and walked towards Amon. The crew members let him get close to Deuce's body since they were sure of his identity. Perry stopped beside him and looked. Mr. Mr. Fool. Yes, Mr. Fool. Perry sat beside him, her eyes sad. Thanks for sending that other dragon fruit user, or we would have all died. Mr. Fool, Amon, ignored the corpse and looked at Perry. H.M. His eyes shined for a moment. Interest. That's what his eyes were shining with. Perry wasn't able to notice it since she was too busy mourning. New Pawn discovered. Amon felt a little bad that Deuce died. He spent quite some time with him after all. But that bad feeling wasn't sadness. It was just a little bitterness in his mouth. Sadness, huh? In this world, only a few handful of people's death would make him genuinely sad. He has come far from the kid who didn't care about a single person. Mr. Fool then opened his mouth under the black and white anonymous mask. You do not need to thank me. I was merely helping this child's friends after his death. He went silent. If I wasn't late, maybe I could have saved him too. M.M. Perry nodded lightly. It was when Ace also noticed Mr. Fool. But unlike the others, he couldn't recognize him. He was simply too emotional. He made a grim face as he walked towards him and touched his shoulder. Who are you? Amon turned his head. Ace was surprised for a brief moment looking at the similarities between him and Deuce, but it was short-lived. Amon then stood up and placed his hand on his shoulder. Port Asti, Ace. I'm a friend of Deuce. Ace made a serious face. Which friend? Ace's question was answered by Perry. Ace, he is Mr. Fool. The guy Deuce always used to talk about. Ace finally understood what was going on here. His eyes grew as he made a sorry face and averted his hand from his shoulder. He only spent around six months with Deuce. Meanwhile, this man knew him for years, so it was obvious that he must be feeling much greater sadness than him. Ace bit his lips. He felt Amon's gaze on him. He was assuming Amon must be blaming him. However, I thank you for looking after him. He must have been happy to give his life for you, Ace. That's what Amon said. Ace's eyes grew. His face soon crumbled as tears again started to fall. I am so sorry. Just like that, a few hours passed. Amon treated the injured and cooked some food from the ship. Finally, the crew members calmed down. It was time for Amon to start his main wordplay. He looked at Ace while beside him. Deuce's body was wrapped up in a large white cloth. All right, now I need to leave. I need to bury Deuce. Ace was shocked hearing this. Huh, where will you bury him? We will go too. In my place, he once said he wanted to be buried there if he ever died. Amon continued. And, no, I can't take you there. I need to finish this fast, because dash. Amon made serious eyes. After this, I will invade Wano. I won't let go of Jack this easily. He needs to die. A blue lighting aura appeared around Amon, making the others flinch. How dare Amir All-Star do this to him? I will destroy the beast pirates. It was true that Amon plans to kill Jack. He will then grant the fruit to a motor gang member. They have a unique transformation that can make them around emperor level. Ace was shocked and intimidated. He suddenly looked at Amon with admiration. He heard Fool was strong, but he didn't know he was this strong to refer to an all-star as Mir. However, Mr. Calm down. Although your skin looks quite young from your voice, you seem like an old man. 
you shouldn't pick a fight with the rumored strongest creature. Dot. After a while, the aura around Amon slowly dissipated. Young man, I am strong. But you were right. Amon was showing the image of a wise man. Still, I have to kill Jack. I have enough power to stay away from Kaido and finish the job. Ace tried to say something but Perry stopped him. Amon turned around, looking down at the corpse. I will now leave. I am sorry that you can't witness Deuce's grave, but I promise I will return after this and show you. He picked up Deuce's corpse from the ground. Nobody stopped him, they simply didn't have the face to. After all, it was them who was responsible to kill him, in a sense. In truth, Amon was taking Deuce to make him a shadow soldier. Maybe, Deuce can turn into a dragon even after death? It is true the devil fruit leaves the body after Deuce dies. But just because the devil fruit the body, doesn't mean their previous power also fully left the body. Zoan fruits cause a genetic change, it can't just revert back to a completely normal body, at least not to Amon's medical and biological knowledge. As Amon was able to fly off with Deuce, Ace stopped him by grabbing him by the hands. Wait, I want to go to Wayno as well. I can't let my crewmate's killer go away so easily. Not in this life, he said with a determined voice. Amon stared at him for a second before grinning under his mask. Perfect. Oh, Ace, you have no idea how bad I will fuck you up. Meanwhile, in Gran Tazaro, Robin and Riki were present. Robin was here to observe things and obtain the report of what was happening. This was her first time here. However, Riki was different. She was here on a vacation. She was in a massive room, dripping inside a pool made of gold. Ha ha. Finally. Finally. She had her arms spread while two beautiful women were resting on them. One was a blonde woman. One was green-haired. They would have easily been called models in Amon's world. But now they were Riki's pets. They were both naked just like Riki. She had her hands on their bosoms while laughing like a madman. She looked at the blonde-haired and raised her chin. Men are unattractive, except for Big Bro. So, I have to be satisfied with you girls until I manage to get under brother's skin. He. While Amon was seriously plotting, Riki was fucking around. Literally. She has suffered enough on the moon, not anymore. She will train while living like a boss in her break time. Days later, in the borders of Wano Kuni, a ship was spotted. It was flying a spade Jolly Roger. Chapter 130 Wano. In Onigashima, Wano, Ryo had reached Kaido along with Jack. Currently, in a dark room, he was standing in front of Kaido who was currently busy drinking booze. Beside him, All-Star King was eyeing him, but there was no hostility shown by them. Kaido started to pour sake in his mouth like water, then released a breath. Gah. After wiping his lips, he looked at Ryo, who didn't seem intimidated by his presence, a rare sight to withhold for someone meeting him for the first time. In truth, he wasn't scared of death. There are only a few people who Ryo was scared of. Kaido made a serious face and looked at Jack. Jack, so this is the kid you were talking about? Jack nodded. Yes, Kaido-sama. I tested his strength. He is strong enough to be a headliner. Kaido stared at Jack's face and his bandaged hand, before moving his head to silently observe Ryo. A Skippian just like that new kid, Kaido mumbled which Ryo couldn't hear. You have a dragon fruit. To begin with, Kaido sent Jack to bring the unknown dragon fruit so that someone from the crew could eat it. So even though some inconveniences happened, it was worth it considering Ryo joined. Ryo nodded. Wurro wurro. Kaido grinned seeing his unshakable nod. King, go test him. I can sense it. He has the potential to become one of the Flying Three. Dot. Unlike four years from now, there were only three members on the Flying Six of the Beast Pirates, so they were using this name. Jack's face darkened hearing Kaido's command. This meant he didn't have enough trust in his word. He felt dejected. Saying this, Kaido went back to drinking while King stepped forward. I will do as you wish, Kaido-sama. King is an alien, with the mixed ancestry of the winged race and another one. He has a lifespan longer than normal humans, and he is the last living person of his race that was exterminated nearly a century ago. With his black wings, one can already guess he had a connection with the winged race, and they aren't wrong. King stopped in front of Ryo. Ryo was currently 7 inch 7 foot. King was more than 25 so it was a funny sight how Ryo was looking up to meet his eyes. He looked at Ryo briefly before walking past him. Follow me, I will finish this soon. Kaido-sama and I will leave a few days later, we need to prepare. Fah. King turned into his dragon form and flew off. Ryo did the same five seconds later and followed behind him, going towards the sky. Needless to say, this was an aerial battle. In a few days, 
Kaido and King will leave. They might or might not bring Jack with them. Meanwhile, Queen will guard the prison in Wano. Amon thought. In canon, Kaido was supposed to be out when Ace came to Wano, where he met Yamato. But things changed a lot. Kaido wasn't supposed to leave in this timeline. Amon changed a lot so big and small changes were inevitable. However, luckily with Amon's connections, he was able to cause an emergency, so Kaido and King will be gone for now. If Jack stays behind, he will go for his head this time. For sure. Ja. Amon's thoughts were cut by the sounds of sea waves. Let's focus on reaching Wano first. We are already close. I can sense Kaido's presence from here. Amon thought as he looked at the reverse fountain in front of him. Not so long after, the spade pirates reached Wano. It was all thanks to an eternal log pose brought by Amon. Their ship didn't crash like cannon since Amon was acting as a navigator. With his 300 kilometers radius sensing powers along with his thunder powers, it was needless to say he was around the level of the best navigator. After climbing the reverse mountain with the help of some fish, they reached Kuni, or more accurately, Amon led them there. He needed to meet Tenguyama Haitetsu, who was in Kuni, and take the Katetsu too, Nidai Katetsu from him. G get out of here, pirates. The first thing the spade pirates encountered after reaching the land safely was a bunch of people armed with sticks, cooking utensils, farming equipment, etc. In front of the crowd, a man wielding a sword stood with a little girl hiding behind him. The man was wearing a dark Tengu mask over his face that had an extremely long nose. More importantly, his most distinguishing feature was the pair of wings behind his back. The wings looked like those of Birkins. We surrender. Put your weapons down. This was what Ace said while having his hands in the air. He didn't want to fight them. They looked very pitiful. He might be in a heat of revenge, but he won't change his personality all of a sudden. His crew members did the same along with Amon. Let's let this play out smoothly. I don't want trouble before Kaido leaves. Amon thought while the nervous villagers started to tie him up. Food. They have food. Oh look, there are fresh vegetables too. The inhabitants of Curry were chattering among themselves inside the ship of Ace, robbing and stealing the food supply of the ship. They hadn't eaten proper food for years. So the sudden supply of food from this pirate ship made them strangely happy and emotional. Shamelessly, they started to loot the ship of spade pirates. They took out all the food there was, some even tried to grab each other's food and a small commotion started. The captured spade pirates were silently observing all this. Ace had a small smile on his face, but that soon disappeared as he made a serious face. That Kaido, he dared to do wrong with these pitiful people. From Amon, he heard about Wano already. Although it is supposed to be the country of samurais, people are forbidden to even wield swords now. All that was because of Kaido and his beast pirates. They're even monopolizing the food supply. Ace sighed. He noticed some of his crew members were already trying to free themselves. Guys, they turned their heads towards him. Don't. Ace told the others to wait until their eating is done. He didn't want to bother them now. Amon, who had his arms tied behind his back, accepted and closed his eyes. His observation hockey's range widened and went to the sky above Onigashima. In the sky, Ryo and King were fighting. Amon opened his eyes and sighed. Fudu. It was a one-sided battle with King winning. All-Star King sure is strong, but his fire ability is weaker than the pure-blooded ones. Still, Nergigant was pretty much resistant to fire. The biggest weakness of Nergigant is lightning. Amon can probably kill Ryo in his dragon form with 700 million volts, or at least make him half dead. That's how weak he was against lightning. So other than me, his natural enemies are Big Mom and Kaido. He also recalled the minks with electricity powers. But their output is too weak to hurt him. Amon decided to not think any longer and looked at Ace who was sitting beside him. You seem calmer than I thought? Amon talked in his natural voice. It took them around three weeks to reach here from Risky Red Island, so they were pretty close now. Mostly because Amon used his charisma to get closer to them. He also let them know about his voice, saying he was making it sound like that to be cautious. Ace, still looking at the happily eating people with a smile, nodded. Kind of. Amon nodded lightly with a, hmm. Beside Amon, Perry asked a question. Hey mister, how old are you? Amon looked at her and stayed silent for a while before saying, you have already asked 48 times. I have answered 48 times. The answer is the same now. I won't reveal it. Stinky. She said while showing her tongue. Amon ignored her as she giggled. She wasn't important at the moment. Her importance would start after Spade pirates join Whitebeard pirates. She will be the brainwashed spy. Amon had mixed feelings about talking to this already dead girl like her. Anyway, 
Amon cracked his neck. They look like they are about to be finished. Let me free myself first. I need to talk with that red-masked guy. Z Z Z. Saying this, Mr. Fool's body disappeared with a bolt of lightning. People, at least Ace, won't suspect him as Sky Emperor, the famed user of Garo Garo Nomi since countless devil fruits produce electricity upon activation, such as Tazaro's Gold Gold Fruit and Toki's Time Time Fruit. Imam. After teleporting himself away from the ropes that were binding him, Amon walked towards the busy crowd who were still busy cleaning their plates. Imam, give me a little more. I haven't eaten for five days. You are only eight. You don't need to eat that much. A mom and her young son were quarreling because of food. This is the face of this world under the mask of battle shown in manga, huh? Amon thought as he walked closer. Even when he was just standing beside them, they didn't notice him. They were busy eating. However, one person did notice him. Wait, Amon suddenly found a sword on his neck. Don't make a move. How did you free yourself? It was Tinguyama Haitetsu, a man with Birkin ancestry. But more importantly, the creator of Katetsu Sandai and the current holder of Katetsu 2, Nidai Katetsu. Amon looked at Haitetsu, their eyes met from under the masks. If I get that, I will have a full collection of Katetsu blades. Along with Sandai Katetsu, Riki was using Shusui, one of the 21 great grade Mido and a powerful black blade. Famously wielded by the legendary samurai Ryuma. Amon got it from Ryuma's zombie from Thriller Bark. Currently, he is searching for a suitable shadow for Ryuma and also a way to heal his dead body back to normal. With him, I will have my own Odin. Ignoring the thoughts, Amon raised his hands while people finally noticed him and backed away. I am sorry, I was just thinking that I might as well cook some food since you all are eating them raw. It's kind of disgusting, to be honest. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 6.